Welcome to the June 23rd, 2020 City Council meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Fantastic. We're going to go into current business. Uh, any clarification of items on the consent calendar? Mr. Herdman? No. Ms. Dixon? No. Mr. Duffield? No. Mr. Muldoon? No. Uh, Ms. Brenner? No. Mr. Avery? No. I've got two um, real quick, hopefully. One of them is on item number nine. Um, so that hopefully it doesn't need to get pulled. The uh, uh, why don't you come on up, Mr. Holland? So I think the only question I, I I've got two. One of them is um, CEQA exemption issue, and then the other is uh, the, is the uh, question of um, you know does this automatically essentially widen Mariner's Mile? Uh, I know that I know a lot of residents are paying attention to this one. I just want to get those two clarifications on the record. Yeah. So the CEQA um, had been completed back in 2017 and it is certified so it will not be reopened the project is moving forward through the design phase and working with Caltrans on that so the v VMT issue is not, not an issue on this project okay and then in terms of uh, the turnout the turnoff um, trying to modify it does that result in any widening uh, you know when we're talking about the widening issues along uh, Mariner's Mile, does that does this affect that in really any way? So what we have today is um, a three-lane road headed westbound. There's three lanes before you get to Old Newport. The right lane, the, the furthest right lane dies into Old Newport. On the other side of, uh, before you get to Newport Boulevard crossing the bridge, there's three lanes. So what it does is we're getting rid of this little pork chop in the middle or moving it back so that's a continuous third lane. Okay. So there's third three lanes on either side of it okay. today. So it doesn't it doesn't automatically create a third lane through Miracle Mile at this time. Got it. There are a couple of other clarification questions. Ms. Brenner. Sure. Um, as I understand it, we're taking some of the property that belongs to A restaurant in order to do this. So Have we've yes, we've been working with A's um, on a property swap. Um, we're working with Caltrans as well because some of the property at Old Newport is Caltrans property. So there would, with the design, there would be residual lo land on the realigned Old Newport, which would then be um, negotiated with A's for their use. Okay. Um, and why does this need to be done right now? I mean, that always seemed like it worked perfectly to me. Why does this need to be done right now? So this project started in roughly 2013. It's been on our books. So we've been doing it for a long time. Um, what this, what we're coming for today with is an amendment to the contract with our designer to complete the final design. Um, there's been a few design iterations. Caltrans has put us through the ringer a bit, um, but right now we have a clear direction and we're moving, we want to move forward. So that's where we are today and why we're coming forward today with the amendment. But the project has been on the books for a long time. One of the big issues, and Caltrans has been pushing for it, is a, the bike lane continuous through there. It's not a, uh, the, the ideal condition. Um, they have to get out into the, that lane to the bikes, that any bikes that want to go through that area, not just the bikers, that, the road bikers. It's anybody who wants to go through there. So it's, it's something that we need to improve. And that's one of the considerations that, that will be improved with this design. And this can't wait until the general plan traffic circulation plan is approved or studied? Um, I, I will say it could be. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna change anything. That the general plan will not change the con what's happening in this location. It's, it's an isolated issue, specific. It's not tied really to the, Mar the whole Mariner's Mile issue. So that's, uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Dixon. Hi, thank you over here. Mm -hmm. uh, just to follow up on the bike question as I did, I'm glad we stopped to ask a few questions because looking at the map, it's not really clear what you're going to do to improve that bike. I mean, I drive this particular route times a day yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I'm very familiar with the 
merging of the bicyclists and traffic and getting off on Old Newport and then going on to go over right. on the curly queue. So you, there isn't the plan here, I'm not necessarily asking for it, but you're gonna create a new lane that's going to continue on across Newport Boulevard and under the bridge? So what will happen is the, the current configuration, the, the right, the furthest, the number three lane, yes. dies in and turns right, right, correct? That lane would continue through. Okay. okay. And, and on the other side, Old Newport comes on and there's weaving. Yes. So th this would come through and that would be a yield to this traffic as you come on Old Newport to go underneath the bridge. The bike, and then we'd create a new right turn pocket and that's part of the negotiations with A's. So Don't we'd we have, have an encroachment there? Isn't there a right of way that we've already had? Currently? Yes. Um, or got years ago? I don't believe, we might have in the past, but we're looking to, for another uh, a purchase as well, or a swap really of, of land, and we've been working with A's on that. Okay, then a second question, just that adjacent Caltrans property, there was a discussion several years ago that the city might be interested in acquiring that property at a, for purposes of this project, whatever happened to that idea? So as I was mentioning, what happens is the alignment of Old Newport goes toward Newport Boulevard, and then the new residual land ends up on the A side. Okay. So that's the whole idea. That's really why we're going back to design. Oh. Because the design had it up against A's, now we're moving it over toward the, the wall. The oh, road they, which moves is Caltrans that way. property, right? Which is Caltrans. All this is Caltrans property. So we're able to do that. That's great. That's okay, the plan. Caltrans it. is on board with that. I get it. Okay, good. So that's where we are today. Thank All right, you. One more question, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Just want to be so there's no talks of eminent domain. No. This is all voluntary for me. That's right. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, I had one follow up question on 10, which is our as school resource officer um, one. So the uh, the only question I had on this one was um, it says that uh, the proposed agreement includes additional language which allows a decrease in funding provided by Newport Mesa in the event of an extended school closure over 30 days due to an unforeseen event. I, I understand that you know we're in a different world right now. Yeah. I guess the only comment I would make, and I'm, this, I'm I'm wondering what the thought process is here, but my only comment is that we had um, you know we wouldn't have three school resource officers but for having the agreement with. Um, Newport Mesa so if there's an unforeseen event it sounds like the costs are now shifting over to us 100% instead of or 80. I guess I'm sorry 80% instead of um, 50 yes so um, I'm just kind of curious what the thought process was on you know on, on shifting that because we wouldn't have taken those costs on but for this agreement so I'm just curious what the thought the thought process is there. Yes, oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, and that is uh, true, that this was a request that came from the school district um, to include this, and I particularly, and probably um, makes sense that it, the, they're bringing this up in light of the COVID responses, and you know, if there's a potential, which we think is not um, likely, but an extended school closure um, that could potentially happen. Um, and we do want to see how this goes and what kind of um, you know adjustment it, if one needs to occur. And in the fact that if uh, there was an extended school closure, we wouldn't have the school resources officers on campus, so they would be able to be de deployed um, into other areas of the city, um, at least partially. Um, but and there's also a good relationship in that even if we didn't have the school resource officers with the 50% funding We do support the schools with with police services when they occur So there is a productive relationship to having it together um, In this partnership, so I think in in light of that um, we agree to it I think it's something we can evaluate and see if we um, Really need it. Um, this is an annual agreement that we renew each year So we can yeah. take a look at the provision for next year as well fair enough miss Brenner um, I'm concerned about, since they're not on campus right now, could these officers be used perhaps at our beaches and other places where our teens are congregating? Because we used to have DARE officers on the campuses, which were the drug awareness officers, and I'm pretty sure that the information I'm getting is true, that there's quite a bit of drug activity going on among even younger kids these days when they are not doing, they're not in school all the time. Could we utilize those officers to be out in the field and 
helping to see what our kids are doing? They are utilized um, out as well, not just um, on site um, on the schools. And in particular right now with um, a lot of the protests that had occurred, mm -hmm. these were the ones who were directly um, deployed to work together um, with the schools and with managing because they knew a lot of, there, there were a lot of young protesters from the schools, so they um, um, were well known. And so that assisted in helping with those um, protests um, events um, as well there. But um, we, we already do deploy them, not just in, in the school. So we would continue that. And um, I can certainly have the chief speak a little bit further to that as well. Um, Perhaps they could mm -hmm. work a little bit with our lifeguard department and because I believe the beaches are where I'm hearing some of this activity is going on. If they could perhaps coordinate with them, that would be yeah. helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that back with the, the bridge. Chief. Maybe the, they could work on the bridges too where the bri kids are bridge jumping. Okay. Um, Ms. Dixon. Well, actually, just to follow up on that, uh, I, I guess in pro you know, every year there's a summer vacation, so what happens to that school resource officer? Are, are they, uh, they get redeployed and integrated back into the police force on day-to-day -day operations? I think generally, the, yeah, yes, they do get deployed into uh, various events um, and, and activities. We do have some, for example, I do know sometimes we have the officers as they rotate through who help um, provide coverage here for city council meetings. So some of them will go into that rotation as well. So we do f fully utilize the, the staff. And again, it's 50-50 uh, cost share. Um, well, with the schools. Okay, so then if the schools are closed, then that's the issue is that we are still paying only 50% or the city pays? Currently, we're under the uh, current agreement where there's a 50-50 uh, uh, cost share. Even if there's no school in sight? Right, yes. Okay, well, just to follow up on Ms. Brenner's comment, I think there's one additional resource. Uh, let I hope that that person is fully being utilized and deployed. Even though schools are closed, they could certainly go to a bridge. <laughs> or go to or assist the lifeguards, I think that's a gift to be able to redeploy that person. Yes, absolutely. There are two, aren't there two? There's three, there's three, three in total. Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah. One for each bridge. Okay. And one for each bridge, <laughs> that's great, thank you. All right, so speaking of schools, um, I was able to give a proclamation on Friday uh, to retiring Corona Del Mar uh, High School principal, Kathy Scott, uh, who will be retiring and going back to her home state of Texas. Um, and do we have a picture of that? So um, I'd like to read the proclamation, uh, even if we don't have uh, Principal Scott here, I was able to provide this. So I'm gonna start. Um, Whereas Kathy Scott took over the helm at Corona Del Mar High School as its principal in 2013, and whereas Principal Scott has previ had previously spent seven years as principal of Oxford Academy in the Anaheim Union High School District as an administrator and teacher before that position and as a proud Texas Tech Red Raider, whereas Principal Scott's steady leadership was indeed a calm port in sometimes stormy waters and greatly appreciated by city leadership given the significant overlap of families served by the city of Newport Beach and Corona Del Mar High School, and whereas generations of Corona Del Mar High School families will be forever changed by decisions made by Principal Scott for which she should be rightfully proud, and whereas the city of Newport Beach wishes Principal Scott all the best as she has reached her retirement. Now, therefore, I, Will O'Neill, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, do hereby recognize Kathy Scott for her long and productive career dedicated to the education of our nation's youth. So she will be heading back very shortly to uh, the, uh, the great state of Texas, where it is a bit warmer than here in Newport Beach, but um, she gets to spend a lot more time with grandchildren, and I'm, I know that she's genuinely excited about that. So I just wanna say to Principal Scott and her family, thank you very much for all of the service that uh, you have given to our community. So with that, we're going to move into item number three, which is the review of the junior lifeguard program. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, staff. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of city council, Jeff Boyles, your fire chief. After a couple of months of discussion, I'm proud to announce that our junior lifeguard program did kick off today with the A's division. We had about a hundred and a little less than 140 kids today up at the Newport Pier in the Blackies area. And I brought with me tonight Chief Lifeguard Mike Halfide to do a brief overview of how the program will work for the, this summer. 
Mayor O'Neill, council members, uh, good afternoon. Mike Halfied, your chief lifeguard. Uh, we have a brief presentation regarding the junior lifeguard program and some of the issues that we'll be resolving with it. So um, <clears throat> this is a different presentation. So the, uh, this is a different presentation, but we'll just continue. So the, the key elements uh, we spoke of last time, we're having several modifications, would include uh, physical distancing uh, with the groups. We'll be at uh, lifeguard headquarters for our oldest, Marina Park for our uh, B level, our 12 and 13 year olds, and then at lifeguard, junior lifeguard headquarters for our youngest two groups. Uh, we're reducing our group size and we're not intermingling. No, normally all the C groups would be together as uh, Mayor O'Neill and Council Member Muldoon saw. Did a good job of keeping the kids separate. We were together over probably a 100 square foot area this morning and we'll follow that protocol. Uh, we'll have increased uh, disinfecting and cleaning practices and uh, we're just looking forward to being able to do the program which was in doubt previously. The number of participants, we just finished our enrollment um, on Sunday evening and we have 1,301 junior lifeguards. So I was surprised, I was expecting we would have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,100 or 1,200. But uh, to put it in context, last year uh, we had 1,345. So it speaks to the uh, popularity of the program that that many would still be here with all the concerns. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we had 133 with our oldest group, 446 for our Bs, 516 for our Cs, uh, 10 and 11 year olds, it's our largest group. And then we have 188 uh, nine year olds that are Ds. Um, the key things that I wanted to speak with you tonight, uh, normally our part-time lifeguards uh, who provide the staffing uh, for most of the program, um, their costs are $320,000 uh, for the seven weeks of the program. This year with the increased staffing, uh, the cost will actually be $430, so it's a $110,000 increase uh, over our cost for last year. Um, will be some additional cost for equipment, including uh, masks, uh, bringing in portable restrooms, uh, extra equipment because we'll be at three locations. Uh, we've got a couple uh, different plans to help bridge that differential. Uh, normally our program is supported 82% by the uh, user fees and 18% by the city. Uh, we hope to continue that ratio through, uh, we had donations available for the parents as they registered their children. Uh, we raised uh, about $5,500 through that. Uh, we're looking uh, to secure additional funding through the CARES Act. Uh, the Corona Aid Relief and Economic Security. And then uh, we're open to donations uh, from the public. We have uh, have several people who've indicated they're interested in supporting the program. And if anyone is interested, uh, they can go to nbjg.net and you can link to the donation page for that. Um, we appreciate all the support that we've gotten from the council and from our uh, citizens and we look forward to coming and bringing you a junior lifeguard of the year in the fall. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, Mayor. It was very exciting for the community and for parents especially. I think they're more thrilled than their kids to get them out of the house. I do have to throw someone under the bus uh, after I did the A1 agenda item. Um, I think the chief was like, oh, you know, this is gonna be interesting, but Councilman Brenner told the chief according to the chief after the meeting, please make this happen for my grandkids too. Um, so hopefully you get out of some hot water there, Joy, and you're the granny of the year. Um, so go back to the dollar amounts. 5,500 roughly was raised online from parents registering their children at the time of payment. That, that's correct. As they were registering, you can buy an extra hat, an extra t-shirt. One of the items was a 25, uh, donation in $25 increments, and we had approximately 200 and some uh, donations through that. That's great, and I know from uh, Dan M told me that it looks like someone's going to do twenty thousand um, dollars, and I think we're going to do uh, at least five thousand, maybe ten at the um, at the event at Helmsman on Thursday. So all of that combined, 
it's, it's pretty significant, 30, 35,000. Um, what can we uh, expect from CARES Act as far as funds available to this program, or do we have an idea of how much can be allocated? Yeah, and I, I can speak to that, actually. So we did receive through the um, CARES Act, through the county, um, an allocation about seven hundred and about seven hundred seventy thousand dollars. That's supposed to be for um, COVID direct COVID related expenditures. Now we have many expenditures uh, un under that, of course, but th this would certainly qualify under that as well. So we're certainly planning on utilizing um, um, that pot of funds as well. So the one hundred ten thousand, roughly, uh, with let's say it's safe to say thirty thousand, but it'll be more, leaves about eighty thousand and. It's, it's foreseeable that part of the CARES Act can cover all of that or some of that, and then we have other funds available in the fire department fund chief, I'm, you know, I think that's what indicated to me. Um, and um, I personally, I mean, Mayor O'Neill and I were there this morning and the excitement on these kids' faces, you can even feel it through the mask, uh, 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 tells you this is a very worthwhile project, and uh, thank you for fire and lifeguards for all your help and staff making it work. And I, I personally think that this is the kind of use that... Um, that it has a tremendous public benefit, just like our school systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Um, we're so excited about this program. I've got two junior guards, and I think it's important for the public to understand how, how much the fees are for each of these junior guards. So, like, we're asking people to contribute to this, but the parents are paying a significant amount. Is it the same at all levels? The yes, all, all the... the Fees for it are set uh, by the council as part of the fees study and the fees set by council. So they're paying how much per junior guard? Like it, 700. It's 727, but I don't have the exact figure. I can get that for you. But as we're asking people to contribute to this, it's nice to know that you know the parents are paying a lot as well. And um, um, I, do you have something that they could send out to grandparents because if you could give the parents something that uh, something for the Facebook or whatever that they could send to all of the grandparents, I'm sure a lot of grandparents would be interested in supporting that. So maybe John Pope could come up with a little okay. something that we we, we have campaigns where we let our families know uh, different things, and uh, I'll work with the fire chief to get wording to put that out with them. Good. I used to, uh, just one quick story, when my daughter was doing junior guards a long, long time ago, I used to put her on the ferry over on Balboa Island, and she would ride across, and I would see all these junior guards riding across on the ferry together, and I remember thinking, if every child in America could do this program, it would be, it's like the most patriotic, the most respectful, the most really uh, character-building program that... I, I wish every child in America got to this program because it's really amazing what you guys do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Duffield. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So I'm gonna, this is half question, half demand. But um, so my donation, my annual donation of 6,000 that I'm allowed to, uh, the, the council, grant. council grant fund, I'd like to donate to the junior lifeguards if that's, legal and okay <laughs> please take my that gift thank you all right um miss dixon yes thank you mayor uh and thank you chief halfight and it, this is just one more example not only of course is it an outstanding program but what recreation and senior services has done what lifeguards have done to uh literally cr create innovation <laughs> on the fly and make a program work that is for serving the local children in our community and elsewhere, uh, just like the other programs that Recreation Senior Services is doing to, to try to accommodate summer camps on a limited basis given all the restrictions. I just want to commend staff overall for their creativity, their innovativeness, and making something work that is truly appreciated by the community and shows that we can all pull together and staff does an amazing job doing that, so thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, there's quite a few people I get to stand up here and represent the lifeguards, but there's many people who worked very hard and were very creative and tenacious to make this happen. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank okay, you. and just we'd like to thank you and welcome you to come down on July 6th, Ben Carlson Day, to celebrate the opening for the C's, D's, and B's.
Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move into our next item, uh, which is uh, dealing with our residential refuse contract. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's stop for a moment. We'll go to public comment on that item. Do we have any public comment on the lifeguard item? No. All right. Okay. Let's go into the uh, residential refuse contract, please. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'd like to present to you tonight this item on the city's refuse collection program. Um, presenting this item to you here tonight to get some input from you and also uh, update you as to where we've been on our uh, council working group items. Sorry, I figured this out here. Okay. So currently right now through the city's refuse collection program and our solid waste management, we have uh, three franchises or multiple franchises that we use to, to collect our waste. And one of them is through commercial businesses. That's the uh, open franchise that we have where uh, all the businesses have an open market as to who they could select from our tier one haulers that have been approved. Um, we also have construction projects as commonly known as construction and demolition waste. And then we have our city facilities um, like the civic center here, a lot of our community centers, our city yards, um, that's tra trash we generate as a city. And then of course we have our residential households that we have to serve. So currently under our uh, current residential refuse collection program, we have two main contracts. One of them is the Newport City contract, um, which also incorporates part of the uh, Costa Mesa Sand District over in the Santa Ana, Santa Ana Heights area. And then we also have our Newport Coast contract, which came on board as a result of the annexation. So that's how we resulted in two separate contracts there, collecting our residential waste um, independent from each other. Um, both of these franchises are serviced with CRNR currently. And um, these existing contracts must be amended due to changes required by state law. So how our solid waste system works, just, just kind of refresh you here really quick. So we have a bin service program which handles recycling and food waste through the commercial program. And then our residential program is a, a cart system where we have a two can cart system where trash and recyclables um, get collected and, and brought to a material recovery facility. There it is, okay. So just more on the material recovery facility, what that does, why we have those. So we have what's called a clean MRF, material recovery facility or dirty MRF. Um, clean MRF is, you know, material that's been source separated for the intent of recycling. So usually the stuff that goes in like a blue can would go to a clean MRF and that's where all the plastic bottles, cans, things like that get separated and um, put out to market. The dirty MRF, that's where everything's mixed together with the trash and everything else. There's a lot more sorting that needs to be done there. Um, the percentage of recovery is much less because of contamination, contamination from all the other trash that it's mixed with. Um, what's left from that process either goes to a landfill or goes to what's called anaerobic digestion or composting. And typically green waste or food waste goes to anaerobic digestion or composting. Um, currently right now, all of our green waste and food waste is recovered from the dirty MRF processing and there's not a lot to recover from that. So we're seeing a lot of uh, lower numbers there. Hang on just a second, Mr. Muldoon. I know you might not be the right person to answer this, but are they tearing um, different products from the bags? Yeah, so the, the MRF actually handles a lot of the material as, the, as it goes through the system, it tears the bags open, it separates the trash out and then we have, there's people that work the line that pick the material out and put it into the right areas. And then on the clean MRF side, there's a lot more automation where um, machines and equipment can identify whether it's ferrous metal or aluminum metal or plastic, things like that, that gets separated out and diverted that way. So just like to say that MRF sounds like a guy from Boston. It's been yeah. on my mind for a while. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so um, currently this is what we have here in Newport Beach. We have a two-cart residential collection system. Um, it's collected under the two contracts like we mentioned before. The total number of households that we're currently serving is over 27,000. Um, we have a, a black lid trash cart, which goes to the, the dirty MRF like we talked about before, and then the blue lid recycling cart goes to the clean MRF. So the total, total number of carts in, in both contracts combined is just over 81,000. Um, so relative to that, average number of cans per household is about 3.3. And then our, our residential diversion rate that we're averaging is about 43% with this current program. So some of the service issues that we're facing with this program, um, right now our contract allows unlimited trash collection. So we run into these challenges here where we have a house that has a dozen cans or multiple cans for, for one house. That's a lot of trash to collect um, and it's all included in the contract. Um, the, so we're, we're fronting that expense. Um, so a question we have to ask ourselves is how much how much trash really should be included in, in the service that we provide? Ms. Dixon. So just to clarify, uh, in a residential neighborhood, this is a single family residence, so they have a dozen trash cans. Could, by any chance, could that be a commercial entity operating out of a single family residence? I mean, do we know that kind of information? Uh, we don't know that 100% for sure, but that, that does raise a suspicion. So. Um, yeah, that's a lot of waste to generate for one single family household. Uh, so that does raise questions with that. It's, it's hard to verify, but um, it's definitely something we want to make sure we have better control over. So with this process that you're describing, we were, are going to identify commercial and uh, all commercial entities in the city are need to follow it here to certain procedures as well as residents. Right. So, you know, residential waste should be what goes in the residential collection system. Anything outside of that, if it's a, a business that they're running, there should be a, a commercial account that's servicing them. Yeah, okay, and that would be under commercial rates versus residential rates. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mr. Muldoon. Uh, we don't have seasons, so you can't really tell, but is this Christmas or uh, this row of cans? <laughs> the, those cans are there year-round. Okay, so these, yeah. the picture on the left, by the way, as a neighbor, you've got to be frustrated by that too. Um, I mean... Have we thought before about putting a, um, a limit on how many cans until an extra fee is in incurred? Interesting, you should ask that. Yeah. So yeah, okay. it, we're, that's one of the things we need to decide today, actually. Okay, great, so that's on the agenda for today. And then, not the, again, I'm sorry, you're, I know you're not in the trash business, you're more of a finance and municipal guy, but operations, are those full, you think? Um, I mean, d have you heard, oh, yeah. Yeah. Th there's times where cans are, are half full, and you know, just for convenience sake, instead of trying to pile stuff into one can, they just throw stuff in multiple cans. That that does happen. That that is a, a common occurrence. Those lids aren't sticking up, so uh. you know, it would lead me to believe that they're not all each 100% full. But like some of the pic the picture on the right there, you can see a lot of trash bulging out of the top of those. So. Yeah, it looks like a beach community. Maybe someone's living in the back house and they have parties. The one on the left looks like just a collection. Right. <laughs> or, okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brenner. Um, I don't remember us talking about this, but if you did have a commercial establishment in a residential neighborhood, we weren't talking about having them have a commercial hauler, were we? Because I wouldn't want to see them having to have a different truck. Is there a way that they could just pay more or something if they've got a commercial business in our residential neighborhood? So right now, we don't really have a way to address that. That's something we need to explore and, and, and take a look at. So part of this review that we're doing of these contracts is to find a way to better identify that and, and, and service that appropriately. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. So further service issues here. Um, the, the picture on the left, it's multiple bags you know, without the cans. So here you kind of have the opposite is they, they have their couple, two, three cans that they have and anything in excess of that just gets put in a bag and set out there with the trash. So it still gets collected, but now this um, reduces our efficiency with automation. So now the truck can't just drive up next to it, load the can, the driver actually has to get out now and hand load this stuff into the truck. And that really increases a lot of extra time on the route. And that material isn't being source separated. We have no idea what's in those bags. So chances are it's just gonna go 
to the dirty MRF. Hopefully we recover what we can, but it's not optimized for a, a source separation program. And then the picture on the right there, there's a lot of green waste. You can see leafy green waste sticking out of those cans. Um, that's getting mixed in with the trash. It's getting contaminated. It's, it's making it harder to recover that material. And that's just for our lack of a, a green waste recycling program. So. so service issues under the current system, again, here's some more. Um, there's lots of loose trash outside of a lot of the cans. Um, you can see the, the, the picture there on the top, top right. That's just loose trash placed out by the cans. Again, cuts down on the automation, the efficiency that, that comes with that. Um, the bottom right picture, that's a lot of, could be considered construction debris, maybe a house remodel project, something like that. That's not intended to go into the residential waste stream. Um, you would expect that to be collected through a CND type of program. Um, and then the picture there at the end of the alley, that's just a lot of loose trash piled in front of some cans. So, you know, some questions we have to ask ourselves: would it be better to have all this trash placed in, in a bin? Uh, we would think yes, but right now our contract allows anything goes out on the curb, so. All right, hang on just a second, Ms. Dixon. So, uh, thank you, Mary. So, Micah, could you uh, clarify, the reason we're discussing this and you're showing these visuals is that because of new state man state mandates, we can no longer, after a certain date, uh, we can no longer uh, allow this to happen in terms of trash just loosely on our streets and expect when residents have been uh, yeah. enjoying the privilege of having their trash picked up in any form or shape, but those days are going to be over when? Um, now, this year. <laughs> <laughs> so. And it's because of the performance standards we have to meet, you know, we would like to be able to just service the residents any way we can with whatever trash they've got, you know, um, but from a performance standpoint, this really reduces our ability to perform and meet those requirements of those state mandates. So yes, this current system is prohibiting us from meeting the, meeting the performance level we need to meet. So for the folks listening or uh, watching this, this is, and we've been, you've been updating the public for the last 18 months on the changes that are coming and now we're getting close to implementing those requirements and so these um, practices will be implemented under uh, new procedures uh, yes. this year. We have no choice. This is the state mandate. That's correct. Yeah, and, and we'll talk more about that, but um, in order to modify our program to meet those mandates, we're going to need to change our contract. Right. So, so it's just, this is part of communicating with the public uh, is to know what's coming and uh, these are new requirements imposed by the state. That's right. All right, thank you. So just a second, Mr. Avery. I didn't realize that, you, so you can just set a bag out or anything and they'll pick it up. As it currently stands right now, that's correct. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, in my neighborhood, I don't see that, but um, you know, these are pretty exceptional photos. And the other side of this, there's, you know, by allowing people to have as many cans as they want, you're basically encouraging sort of waste, you know, and there's no real thought going into trying to limit waste, which we all need to do. And, uh, that's know. exactly right. Yeah. You know, with it, by limiting the number of cans, not only does it help us control the amount of waste that's being processed, but it it um, puts the resident in a position of being mindful of what they're throwing away, right. what's going in the can, which can it's mm -hmm. going in. Yeah, absolutely. It's similar analogous to our, in a way, to our metering with the water, where residents will be much more involved with how much water they're using. Right. Just be able to pull it up on their smartphone and see that kind of stuff. And you know, we need all that. But um, yeah, this is. So I know we'll get into this, but um, it just seems to me that people should. At the very least, if they want excess f a number of cans, like you saw in that other, they should be paying for them. Right. Yes. Yeah, you're right. We, you. will, we will be getting into that. Ms. Brenner. But in this case, you can call for special pickup from your trash carrier, and they, and they will come out, and isn't it two times a year, or maybe it's more than that, that they will come out and take if you have an, a construction project or something going on where you have extra waste. Right. So, you know, the way the contract, the, the service it provides, we do have what's called a bulky item collection service. 
So typically the resident could call in and say, hey, I've got these bulk bulky items I need collected and it requires a different type of truck. So that's a, again, to put more emphasis on this, a can truck is going out to service these households here. Um, it's a side loader that picks up cans and dumps them in the truck. When you get bulky items like this, they can't fit that in the truck. So now they've got to call a second truck with a front loader bin on it to be able to handle this material. So if the program is working properly, the resident would call ahead of time and say, hey, I've got bulky items here that need to be collected. Now the route supervisor knows that and he'll send that truck out in advance to collect that material. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Well, you know, the other thing that we need to be aware of is that in the past when we had our own haulers, well, and people still, we get letters even this week about how much people loved our haulers when we did this, the city did this ourselves. But when we went to the, um, the service, one of the things we didn't want to incur as an un unintended consequence was having people leave debris around their houses or fill their garages up with debris or pile their debris into our city trash cans. So we have to make sure that we still make it convenient for people to get rid of as much waste as possible because it can create other problems if we, if we don't. So we want to encourage that. Correct. And, and even with the current contract and, and with the new contract, hopefully we could get more creative with that and allow plenty of options for the resident on how to get rid of the waste and just provide a means of uh, eliminating the waste in the correct manner as opposed to the anything goes model that we're currently facing. Right. All right. Um, let's keep going. So talking about the state mandates, um, th this is just kind of a snapshot of, you know, where we're at on this timeline. Um, so, you know, there's changing laws and regarding solid waste collection and recycling disposal. Right now we're in 2020, so AB 341, 1826, and 1594 are all hitting us right now, this year. And the most concerning of that is 1594 with regards to alternative daily cover. And if you recall from maybe our last study session, we talked about that. Typically, prior to 2020, green waste was allowed to go to the landfill and used to cover the trash at the end of the day every day. Um, that's no longer acceptable as of this year. So now that green waste needs to be processed. It needs to be recycled and, and reused and repurposed in a different way. So we're, we're contending with that right now. Right now our contracts don't have a green waste component to it other than what's recovered out of the dirty MRF. And then SB 1383, um, that brings in the organic waste recycling, talking about food scraps and food material and stuff like that. So we've gotta be able to set ourselves up for that to be able to achieve that goal in 2022 when it becomes mandated. So just talking about diversion, you know, this is just kind of a, a snapshot of where we currently are with our diversion rates. So we talked a little bit about commercial diversion. Um, right now, you know, we've been fixing things up, but we still have 64 businesses and 93 restaurants that are still not compliant with these programs. We're working on getting them into compliance. Um, that'll improve that diversion rate. With residential, we need to expand our program to meet the uh, requirements of SB 1383. That's the green waste component. And then construction and demolition, there's some work to do there with regards to attaining that 65% diversion rate. We're currently under that rate. The good thing is overall, our combined total, we're, we're above the 50%. So we're still in compliance, but as you can see, there's still work to do. And there's concerns about that, that uh, diversion rate dropping as we move forward. So some of the changes needed to accommodate these state mandates we've been talking about. Um, mentioned earlier with the uh, um, ADC, alternative daily cover. So just as a result of this year with 2020, as it's becoming effective in, in January, we've already seen our diversion rate go from 57% to 56% just within the first half of this year. And our concern is that we'll continue that trend and potentially even drop below the required amount. Um, so that's part of our need for, for addressing this. Also, we need to modify and adjust our program for better source separation in order to maintain the required minimum diversion. So we talked about that green leafy vegetation, separating that at the source so that it reduces that contamination. Um, the current residential co-mingled green waste is too contaminated for recycling, is now sent to the landfill. So what's causing that contamination, it, it gets contaminated at the source, but then also at the dirty MRF as it's being processed broken glass and other debris gets mixed in with it. 
and it can't even go to the anaerobic digester. It's so contaminated. So um, that's a challenge there. And then we need to we need to add separate organic collection for yard trimmings and food scraps. And again, these changes require a different collection cart system than what we have now. So there's some financial impacts to these, these program changes. Um, these program changes will, to meet state law, will significantly increase our costs because we're, at, we're talking about adding carts, changing carts, more trucks, more processing to be done. Um, we need to look at ways to improve efficiency to reduce that cost. Um, a lot of that is like what we talked about earlier, requiring everything to go in the can, minimizing the amount of cans that, that creates that efficiency. Um, and then we need to review and update our recycling fee to possibly help offset some of the cost of this, of this program. So as a working group, we're exploring these, these options. And then so a possible change we could be looking at with our card system, this is an option. Um, a two cart system, but with the wet dry option. So you'd have the green lid cart, which would be your uh, green waste and your food waste, and then all the other trash going into the black cart. So um, this would help keep that processing cleaner. Uh, we have a potential diversion rate of up to 45%, so it's a slight improvement from what we have now, but it's not ideal. And there's only a couple cities in the county that operate this program, like Stanton and Costa Mesa. And the reasons for that are it's not optimal for the diversion, but it is, it is something that we could look at. Another option would be a three cart program going from the two cart to the three cart. So you'd have the blue can where the clean recyclables will go into your bottles, cans, glass, cardboard, stuff like that. Your green waste cart for, for food and, and yard, yard trimmings, and then the black cart for um, trash. That would just go directly to the landfill, so we wouldn't have to handle that one as much. Um, so our potential diversion rate would range more from 45 to 55 percent. So that's more of an optimum rate that we would need to target. Um, and there's, a, there's an example of some of the cities doing that, uh, similar to ours. But, but knowing city of Newport Beach and what makes us unique, we've got a lot of space constraints. Um, a lot of the areas on the peninsula, Babo Island, the tight alleys, the zero lot lines, having a three card system isn't gonna be ideal. Um, so knowing that and recognizing that, we're probably looking at doing what's called a blended program. Parts of the city being two cart, other parts of the city being three cart. The diversion would probably hover more around the 40 to 55%, but that's still better than what we have now. And this is kind of an example of what that type of program could look like. So in the green, you would have the, the two cart program, I'm sorry, the three cart program and the pink areas you'd have the two cart program. But this mm -hmm. is just the first crack at that. This could always be modified or optimized more. So um, just so everyone knows, I'm, I'm gonna let him keep going just a little bit longer because um, I need, I wanna do a quick summary and then we, I'm gonna come back to this slide because I'm gonna use actually the summary. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick summary of what we need to be dealing with and what the subcommittee needs us to, um, we, we need direction from council I'm going to use this slide as my, as kind of my summary slide. So I'll, I'll come back it, unless it's a really, it, is it a quick question? Just a quick oh, yeah, question. When you uh, back a couple of slides, when you're talking about other cities, so number one, they've been implementing this new program under the new laws, like Laguna Niguel and some other cities, you, San Clemente. That's correct. Yeah, they're, they're using a three cart program. And then do you know what their diversion rates are? Um, I think Tre I've got Trevor here with economics. He probably, he works with those cities. Yeah, they, um, cities in uh, 50. So, well, okay. So we should be expected to hit those same numbers. With extensive public outreach. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Any more questions on that? No, go ahead. Okay. So some of the goals for this amended, um, solid waste contract would be to, again, to combine both contracts into one, um, implement a revised collection process, potentially blended to three car program there, and then look to reduce our capital operating costs by um, making route adjustments. So currently these two contracts have different route schedules. If we could combine them both, we could make some adjustments to our route and optimize that program. Um, and then we could also have a use of existing capital, including trucks and carts wherever practical Maybe you know having an average age of the fleet, maybe reuse or repurposing some of the carts. These are just some of the options we could explore. 
Again, some more of the goals we're looking at um, move to a fully automated collection and require all material to be separated and placed in carts. We talked on that. Um, consider incorporating an effective bulky item pickup system in lieu of a current Anything Goes program. Also look to possibly determine the number of free trash receptacles for a household um, and try to accommodate what's typical as opposed to everything. Secure a new contract that is current with all state mandates. That's really important and then require extensive public outreach for curbside organics and recycling programs to ensure compliance. So it's one thing to implement the program, it's another thing to get everyone to uh, comply with that. So, And then finally, maximize the use of the city's transfer station to reduce collection costs. We feel it's underutilized right now and there's a lot more to be gained from that, so. All so, right, so let's go, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll hit this slide, but what, let's go back to that map slide. So I'd like to summarize where the um, sub subcommittee is on this because it, it's been fairly complicated. There you go. It's fairly it's been fairly complicated as you can see dealing with a lot of the state mandates and trying to figure out where we are. So this is generally now that we've seen this this whole presentation. This is generally where we are right now and why we need direction. Um, quick reminder: CRNR has the residential contract for both the the city and also up in Newport Coast. There are two contracts. They actually have different terms. They um, Newport Coast, for example, would not actually allow the, our, that contract up there. Doesn't allow for um, all of the uh, uh, the loose um, garbage to be put out on the streets like that. It's and so and they're also on different time schedules they the Newport Coast contract um, expires after the regular city contract and so in order to get to a point where the city as a whole is re meeting our diversion requirements um, the subcommittee's general opinion is that we ought to be uh, negotiating for a citywide contract uh, because it's going to be a citywide uh, diversion requirement and as you can tell right here it's going to be important actually to to find a way to meet the diversion requirements using probably a blended cart system. So here's the thing. We need to meet two different diversion requirements. We need to meet a recycling diversion requirement and we need to meet a organic waste diversion requirement. In order to meet the organic waste diversion requirement, there's no question after look, discussing with our consultant, discussing with CNR, CRNR, discussing with staff, there's no question we need to have a green top um, cart. We do not currently have one of those. And so because we don't currently have one of those, it will require um, uh, a, it, it will no question require a new trash truck to be on the road for a green top um, uh, cart. What we would very much like to do is avoid having another uh, truck on the road in certain areas of the city that are particularly tight for a couple of reasons. One, it, we'd like to avoid that. and. Uh, for space constraints and two, most people in some of these areas don't have the room for three carts anyway. Um, and so we need to be uh, aware of that. So if you can kind of see what the, the challenge with going to a two cart system as we were talking earlier is that you're gonna have a green top, no question about it, which will be the organic waste and organic waste just for everybody in the audience out there. It's your green waste that comes off of landscape. It also is your um, household food, uh, the leftover food. So that's organic waste. So. We, need to, we would need to have a green top. Um, and then uh, in order to hit the requirements, it would be difficult to hit the requirements, not impossible certainly, but difficult to hit the requirements if we only had a two cart system. Uh, meaning that because you'd be throwing all of your trash in with, with your recyclables and sending it to the dirty MRF, um, your diversion rates are just not going to be anywhere near what they would be if you went to a clean MRF because you're, you're uh, breaking them out. And so in order to find that blended rate, um, the, so you don't need a three cart system for the organics. You need a three cart system with a blended two cart system in order to reach the uh, recycling organic, uh, recycling um, diversion rate. So the idea there is if we're going to have about half the city, as you can see in the pink, if we were, if we were going to have half the city in um, a two cart system, we would need a, you know, the other half of the city to be a three cart system in order to have a low diversion um, uh, rate in the pink areas and a high diversion rate in the green and then be above the state mandated diversion requirements for recycling. Okay, that is that has taken us months to understand that what I just said. So I just want to oh. yeah, I just want to yeah, I just want to highlight that. Um, the, uh, the the this is where we are though and this is where we need direction at, at the 
at the subcommittee level. Um, because CRNR's contracts, both of them, uh, go on for years to come. And what was it 22 and 23? So the uh, city contract is 2021 and Newport Coast is 2023. 2023, okay. So we're looking at, we have two contracts, one ends in 21 and we have a, an option to extend. Um, the other is 23. But given that we know that we need to amend um, essentially both contracts to get to the diversion requirements that we need to, that we would need to get to, uh, the subcommittee is asking for uh, op, uh, the opinion of the council to, on where we, what, how to move forward on this. Um, I'll speak for myself and say, I'd like to see us enter into negotiations with CRNR for a combined contract um, and see if we can get to a point where we have, we, we can take care of all of the issues, the bullet points that were listed on the next two slides. Um, because with where we are with, um, if we can reach a deal that makes sense, we've, we've done extensive analysis of, you know, who's being, who's offering the organic waste diversion programs and, you know, where they, um, where we can go from there. Um, CRNR is there. They've been ahead of the curve on that one. Um, doesn't mean that they're the only ones out there, but it does mean that, you know, they've got, they still have years of contract, but if we combine the contract, there's pretty strong incentive for them to want to combine the contract, extend the years out on this and, um, and reach a deal that makes sense for, for both parties. Mo in part because if we can't reach that contract a deal with CRNR, we always have the and we have a lot of time we have time as you've kind of heard not a, not a ton but enough time where if you gave us the ability to um, or or at least the responsibility to go out and negotiate for a whole a whole contract a whole city contract um, if we weren't able to do it then we need to go out for RFP um, if we were able to do it we could bring it back and make a decision do we want to move forward with the proposed terms that have come up or do we want to go into an rfp um, process um, so we have time it makes sense there are a lot of that there are um you know we've had this conversation a couple of times uh at study sessions mostly focused on commercial but we've always been talking about this residential coming up um, so as we move forward this blended, this blended rate, um, this blended cart system uh, is, it'll be a little complicated to negotiate out. If you could go a slide so we can go look at the terms a little bit. Um, so this is, we would, it, no matter who it is, um, we should really be combining it into one city because one city contract because we really do need to get to a point where that, um, we're hitting that diversion requirement across the board. Uh, and then, you know, because of the amortization of needing to, to go through some of the collection cart or trucks, um, you'd have to extend out the contract for whomever is going through it. And then the next one, please. And then this one, um, this is also, this comes back to one of the questions, those, those pictures you saw. Um, we'd need to have a sense of, do we, wanna, do we want to basically set a cap for the number of trash cans you can have of a certain color uh, so, for example, if you if you limited it to two of each color, um, then you wouldn't be having that 10 to 12. And but if people wanted it, they could pay more. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that um, that's one of the reasons our contract now actually is fairly expensive is because we allow for all of that. We're not gonna, as Councilmember Dixon pointed out, we're not going to be able to allow for that anyway. The you know the loose bags, the the um, the overflowing. Uh, black tops that have green waste in them. We can't allow for that because of the diversion requirements anyway. So that that's done um, as we move forward. Uh, but it, we, you know, I, I, I think we, I think Councilmember Dixon and Brenner and I are all on the same page when it comes to we should probably be putting a cap on the number of, of, uh, of these. So we're treating everyone equally, but how, give them the ability to do that. So anyway, with that, um, I want I appreciate the background on this. Um, I, I want to put it out to council for comments on this, but. Uh, yeah, this has taken a while to get to. Um, and just as a quick side note, last thing, we will, because of CalRecycle, um, uh, looking, at the, looking at this, CalRecycle will be requiring the city of Newport Beach and, and all other cities to, to adopt a new, an ordinance dealing with residential organic waste, which will put a requirement that um, people you know, uh, divert their, uh, their food waste. Um, so no more throwing it straight into the trash. Anyway. 
that will be coming. It's not, it's not teed up for us yet, but that will be coming down the road. All right, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Thanks for your hard work on this to you, the subcommittee. Um, if we let, I think some of these people have too many trash cans. I can't believe we're having this conversation, by the way. I never, this is why I never wanted to be on a city council. Here I am <laughs> talking about curb issues in the trash can. Um, if we, uh, if we let some of these people have these too many trash cans, it's a horrible inefficiency in the system and we're now in a, not in a bad place when it comes to negotiating and not dealing with real costs. I would love to see us figure this out before we do our financial assessment and go into negotiations, because if we can limit, uh, the number of trash cans during this period, we can find out what the actual costs are for your typical resident or even someone a, a, a little bit above typical as far as refuse demand. And then we can charge, you know, proportional amounts for extra cans. So it's not punitive, but it's also, um, more in line with, uh, the service that everyone's paying for. So I would support, I understand your, your plan. It makes sense on the three cans. I don't see how we don't do that. Um, and I would just, I would be interested in having a cap at homes. I guess, it, I guess you might as well make the cap based on lid, lid color now. Um, even though it, in real life, people only have two to choose from. And, uh, perhaps there's a schedule for how much it will cost based on the overhead or the cost associated with having each additional can. So I would support that. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, could you talk about the when you talk about extensive public outreach? What uh, is your idea for what you're going to be doing and how we're going to be informing the community? When do you expect to begin? Depending on what happens, just tonight at a study session, we're not taking any action, but to move forward. So, uh, what have other communities done? What's their experience? Kind of share what you know about outreach. Well, I'll share what I know, and I may have Trevor chime in here as well, but um, our outreach has really been focused on commercial at this point. Residential, once we get an idea of what we want our residential program to look like, then we'll, we'll definitely start more outreach with the public on what the expectations are moving forward, what the timelines, time frames look like, what you know, a, a rollout of a new program is going to require. Gonna, going to ask for their input. Is there any discretion in terms of opinions by residents? Are we saying it's going to be one or the other, three or two, and this is how it looks, just so they understand that. Yeah, again, it's, once we identify what our program needs to be, then, you know, we can maybe, you know, solicit some input from the public on um, implementation of the program, but the requirements of the program are gonna be pretty set, especially with the state mandates. It's gonna be hard to, to be flexible with that. So what's the timing? What do people expect? Now let me, you refer to Trevor on that. Um, SB 1383 would require it by January 1st, 2022, that every resident have access to organics recycling. Um, so you would need at least six months probably to, to roll out the, you know, the requisite um, outreach programs to make it an effective program that complies with the requirements of SB 1383. Um, so what that looks like in communities that we, we've worked with is, in some cases, the hauler goes door to door to households, um, gives them a kitchen pail, that has a brochure that says, put all your food scraps in here. Um, that's, that's led to really effective recycling outcomes that, that can help those cities comply with what the state's requiring. Um, sometimes it's you, you put a brochure in the mailer and send it out and hope everyone you know, participates. So uh, oftentimes requiring the hauler in the negotiations to implement these outreach requirements is, is gonna be your best bet unless the city wants to dedicate staff to that process. So when you ha showed other cities that have already started and they implemented the, their new program. So that was well before the deadline, correct? So we don't need to wait till January. We could, depending on what council decides, we could start embarking on the community, uh, defining the program and then the outreach and then getting uh, the implementation of it. Yeah, we'd recommend that as soon as we get our program identified and, and know what it is we wanna roll out, that we would start that outreach right away. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I don't see any uh, more speakers. Let me, uh, before we go out to public comment and item, let me tell you what I'd like to, uh, this, is, this, was, this would be, I think, our plan, um, barring any strong objection from our fellow council members. Uh, the, uh, the subcommittee on this would uh, negotiate with CRNR on the terms that uh, we've, the, basically the bullet pointed terms of what we've laid out here requiring, um, it, it's entirely driven by the state mandates on this. And uh, one of the 
points that uh, Mike had made in this presentation was that it was fairly expensive. It is going to be very expensive. I'm just going to prepare you for that. No matter how this plays out, the organic waste diversion program is is almost certainly going to be around a um, million dollars a year in extra. Um, that is that is what that it doesn't matter which hauler it is. That's what we're seeing. Um, it may be that we can find cost savings uh, just through a variety of different ways. I don't know what it looks like. Uh, we haven't talked to CRNR about financial terms um, at the subcommittee level, so I don't know what where, where we're going to negotiate. But I do want to tell you when we're looking at other cities and what they've seen in terms of that. That's that's the additional cost the state regulations are going to impose. Um, there's no there's nothing coming from the state to help offset these costs. Uh, but I'm but I'm. I want to make sure we're, I'm preparing our, our council for that. Keep in mind a lot of other cities uh, charge their residents for, for refuse collection. Uh, we do not. So that's, that's one of the comments that was made about the recycling fee there. We, the charter prohibits us from doing, from charging for trash collection. It, it allows for recycling fee. That's, there is a recycling fee in our city. Um, and so there, there's going to be, we would have to look at that and have a discussion on that as well. But I'm just pointing this out. It's, this is not an insignificant sum that we are talking about here, uh, but it's a mandate and we'll be moving forward with it and, ex and explaining that. Um, so the, the, um, my expectation would be that the next actions coming out of the subcommittee, the next time you hear from the subcommittee on this would be bringing to you um, a uh, contract proposal from CRNR for the entire city if we're unable to reach an agreement, the next uh, w or or what we would feel is a justifiable um, contract agreement, what we would do is we would bring back to council the final terms that we had with CRNR, with a recommendation uh, that we go out to RFP on it. So, um, one way or the other, we'll be bringing this back with a uh, with a recommendation of uh, some sort uh, dealing directly with a, a full city contract uh, along the terms that we've seen here, uh, Ms. Brenner. Will, could you or Micah explain why, I, I, you covered a little bit with why CR&R and what, we know we have some time left on the contracts, but there were also some services they were able to offer that were not being offered by other carriers. So I think people need to hear why we're specifically looking at that. Yeah, so there are three major reasons for that one. Um, and if I'm missing any, let me know. But there are three major reasons. One, they're already our carrier for both the Newport Coast and the city contract with years um, left on for both contracts. Uh, and we would have to modify the Newport Coast contract anyway to deal with this organic waste diversion program because it currently would not comply with that uh, going into 2023, and so we'd have to we'd have to renegotiate that contract anyway. Um, that's that's a that's a big one. The second one is uh, they also have um, you know a contract that allows them to use our transfer station, uh, and the transfer station will play a factor in the discussion on combining that co those two contracts and also uh, perhaps so uh, one or two smaller contracts, so that there are cost savings available to us and to. Uh, CRNR that would not be available through any other hauler because of their their um, ability to use that. Uh, the other is their uh, fairly advanced use of um, organic uh, diversion out in Paris, um, yeah, which is if you go in the in Inland Empire, uh, they are they've got a they've got a uh, pretty state of the art um, facility out there that is turning the vast majority of organic waste into methane, uh, which then they use to uh, fill their trucks and then use that as their fuel um, for the trucks on the road. Uh, and then what's left over, a lot of it turns into mulch that they then will um, sell back to places like Home Depot and Lowe's, which you then go purchase and use in your yards. It's actually pretty amazing. Um, so there are, there are other abilities to, uh, there are other haulers that have organic waste diversion programs. I have, I have yet to see one that has is quite that state of the art. So there, there, are, there are, those are the three ones I, that I, that's why, that's why we're making that recommendation. I appreciate that. I, I should have said that. Miss anything on that one, Micah? No, that's, that's really the key point. Okay. Yes. So like I said, though, if we come to the conclusion, if that it doesn't make sense, we'll come back with a recommendation. It doesn't make sense. We can go out to RFP on this, but if we think we can, if we think we have terms that, to bring back to council, we will. And uh, it's a lot, as council member Dixon just pointed out, it's going to be a long process. It's not overnight by any stretch of the imagination, even if we come back with terms that make sense. 
All right, uh, we're gonna go out to public comments on this item. Do we have any public comments on this item? Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, <clears throat> this is Jim Mosier. Uh, first of all, if it took the subcommittee months to understand all of this, it would have been really helpful for the public if <clears throat> there was something in the way of an advanced staff report so we would know what questions it was you were wanting answers to. Uh, the mayor mentioned that in addition to state mandates, we do have voter mandates here in Newport Beach. And that is not actually in the charter. It is a uh, voter enacted provision in our municipal code, <clears throat> most recently uh, modified in 1996, which holds that uh, for all dwellings that were in the city in 1996, the trash collection cost for residential dwellings is to be covered by the property tax, and it rather prohibits tacking on additional fees or charges unless you want to ask the voters to change that provision. As to trucks and the need for an extra truck, I believe if we looked into it, there are trash trucks that are made that have multiple compartments in them, so the various categories of trash can be picked up by a single truck. Uh, CRNR may not have them, but I believe they are available. As to the diversion rate, I would first comment that having a low or having a high diversion rate actually doesn't accomplish a whole lot if the overall volume of trash increases to overweigh that. And I thought the state, in addition to the diversion requirements, has a per capita trash goal that it's trying to reach to lower the amount of trash produced per capita, which requires source reduction, which I believe is the real goal. As to the claim of the 43% diversion <clears throat> from landfills, I am wondering how we actually know that number. I do not believe that either it's clean or dirty MRF that CRNR separates the trash from Newport Beach from the other many cities that they collect from. So I don't know how we know how much of the Newport Beach trash is specifically is being diverted. And also I'm not sure where that supposedly diverted trash is going to. Uh, I have heard from CRNR themselves, from many of what we call recyclables, there actually is no market for them. So I'm wondering where that so-called recyclables for which there is no market is going and whether the 43% is really meaningful and finally, I don't think that CRNR actually sends its trucks out to Paris to refill at their um, methane tanks. I think the gas actually goes into the grid of gas uh, from the Southern California Gas Company. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments in the uh, community room? Good evening, Council. I'm Hua Yan Ye. So this is wonderful that you're still working on this during the pandemic. Um, a quick reminder to everyone that organic recycling is, seems to be more important than the regular recycling. In March, we learned here that the regular recycling centers were closed because of the pandemic. But so I followed up with um, actually city of San Clemente to see if their organic waste recycling was still going. And I was told yes, and Paris was still open in operation. So if this ever happens again, if we have this system down, then we would do our part to, for landfill diversion, have some of this organic waste recycled. Um, on the tangent, it's interesting to go from city council to city council to hear the problems in different cities. Here, residents don't pay trash. In Dana Point, residents don't pay parking. So there's always some problem there. And um, the consultant to Dana Point, they keep saying, telling the city that you don't have a parking problem, you have a parking management problem. So thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, community room comments on this item? All right, uh, we've got a few on the phone. Hi, if you're on the phone, go ahead. My name is Leonard Simon. Go ahead. Okay, just an idea on the uh, two cart system where residences might be supplied with, say, blue vinyl bags for them to put their recycled um, 
things in, like plastics and bottles, et cetera, and put them in the black can. This might help the sorting facility separate the garbage, so to speak, from the recyclable things. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll go to the Thank next you. speaker. Hi, if you're on the phone, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Charles Cole, and I can hear myself on the phone. A um, couple of things. First, the uh, slide that shows the take rate or absorption in commercial and uh, restaurants looks just the same as the one I saw a year ago. I'm surprised that we haven't had more success at getting them to comply. I wonder what's happening with that. Secondly, regarding the quantity of trash cans residential homes, in our neighborhood, the homes that have tons of trash cans are group homes. They would be classified as a business, in my mind, and should be paying for trash. Additionally, tonight you're going to hear a short-term lodging ordinance, and it strikes me that short-term lodging could be great users of trash service. They might be considered a business. The hotels have to pay for a trash service. Maybe the SPL should as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, if you're on the phone, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Scarborough, and I have a thought. Um, if our transfer station is currently underutilized, why don't we offer to let or negotiate with the city of Costa Mesa to um, take their waste from their two-cart system to our transfer station? And that might save us some money. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other? Do we have one more? Okay. All right, next speak, uh, if you're on the phone, go ahead. Hi, my name is Carmen Rosa. Regarding the number of trash cans per property, we also need to consider that we have different sizes for the trash cans. For example, a, a property, I may have a smaller trash cans because they are coming on the side property away from you. However, I'm going to be charged with a number of trash cans. I may replace them with larger trash cans that I will have in the alley all the way. All the way. So how is it to be considered? Uh, it also, the trash cans at the beach for the public, we have, yes, one type of trash can. So is that something to consider? We have recycling trash cans where people are given the opportunity to put recycle a different can in public areas. Uh, gardeners, I have seen many gardeners in private properties where they take the greens with them. They don't use for the own of the property to deal with. Is that something that is advantageous or disadvantageous? And that the city has an opinion of that, how that should be handled. Uh, public trash also, we have a lot of theft of recycling in the peninsula area. People that are removing the recycling, so that doesn't help. Uh, how is that being handling and enforcement so that we minimize that? Regarding the short-term rentals, we have a Saturday pickup that is supposed to be only for the short-term rentals because they to this, but that, however, they are not, they pick up the trash cans, uh, I mean the trash, or all the places. So should we teach the short-term lodgings for the Saturday pickup to minimize the cost of Saturday's pickup? 
that they only serve the short-term rentals. All right. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. You're, you're probably going to call in later, so just find a better place to call in. You were breaking up a little bit there. All right. Anyway. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I appreciate it. All right. Any other, any other calls? Okay. We'll bring it back. All right. Um, Seeing no further uh, discussion, um, we'll uh, we'll be back later with with this. Um, so, Mr. City Attorney, our next item, since we don't have closed session, our next item is technically public comments on non-agenda items. We're going to be going right into our next meeting. Can we do public comments during regular meeting, or do I need to do this twice? No, there's an item for it during the regular meeting, so I think you can just uh, push that off. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do right now for members of the audience, um, we've been going at it for a little while and at the city council level. Um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break, um, stretch our legs so we can get, uh, get fresh and come right back into our regular city council meeting. So it's currently 621. We'll start up uh, somewhere between 630 and 635 uh, with the regular meeting. So with that, we'll stand in recess. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much for indulging us. Uh, we tend to make better decisions with a little sugar in our system. So uh, we're gonna uh, reconvene our regular meeting. Madam Clerk, roll call please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Great, tonight we'll have the invocation led by council member Muldoon and the Pledge of Allegiance led by uh, council member Brenner. If you would please stand with us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please uh, bow your head and join me in prayer if you so choose. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the protection you've given our city. <clears throat> we thank you for our great staff. We pray for our first responders, our law enforcement during this time, and continued peace locally. Uh, we pray for our nation and all of our neighbors. And as we come up on the 4th of July, we thank you for our independence and the revolution of 1776 that was just, just the beginning of a freedom and equality. And we ask that you continue to give us divine protection and safe celebrations over the 4th. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our great nation. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk. The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. All right. Uh, now is the time for City Council announcements and oral reports from City Council on committee activities. And if you would like to place an item on a future agenda, this is the time as well. Uh, Mr. Herdman. Yeah, I have a few things to report, thank you. I have a picture, first of all. I wanna show you uh, a project that was completed <clears throat> just last week, the end of last week, by our Public Works Department and specifically Chris Miller, the uh, swim dock <clears throat> that I asked, uh, requested a couple of years ago now has been installed and uh, it was in heavy use this last weekend with kids and families having a lot of fun on it. So I wanna thank Chris and I wanna thank Dave for a job well done and for following through on this. <clears throat> the annual uh, sand replenishment program on the island uh, was also supervised by Chris and that's been completed as well. Um, <clears throat> just this uh, last week, I represented the council again at the monthly chamber government affairs meeting and just gave a quick uh, report on the business of the city and what we've been doing as a council. Uh, also two vector control trustee meetings have been held throughout this quarantine. Um, they're Zoom meetings. Uh, I just want you to know we continue to meet and uh, <clears throat> do the business of our district. Um, aviation committee meetings have been on hold uh, throughout the quarantine, we do plan on resuming our meeting schedule beginning in July. Uh, the same is true for the Tidelands Water Quality uh, Committee meetings. And uh, the short-term rental ad hoc committee has continued to meet with staff as well as constituents and stakeholders throughout the quarantine uh, culmination of 
The first phase of our work will be presented this evening in agenda item number 19. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. So there have been very few public events to attend to, but I was delighted to attend. And Mr. Herbman, uh, Council Member Herbman was there also, and I was there on your behalf, Mayor, at the Balboa Yacht Club for the one and only opening day celebration. It was delayed a month. They had good planning to hope that they could accomplish it, so with proper distancing and masks. It was a beautiful day and a presentation of their uh, new Commodore, and it was uh, a great day. I'm sorry that all the other yacht clubs had uh, to cancel, postpone their events, but that was the one only, and it was a lovely day. Happy to represent you, Mayor. Thank you, and Thank that's all. You. Thank you for being there. Um, Mr. Uh, Duffield. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, really go and give a shout out to our Parks and Recreation Department and Laura Detweiler and all of the, her staff. My <clears throat> grandchildren, well, a couple of them, their one is four and seven, they uh, attended the city sports camp this week and they just absolutely love it. And they haven't gone to school for three months, they haven't gone anywhere, for, they haven't played with their friends, they haven't gone outside. It's just been the way it is. And this city sports camp, um, you know, when they told me about it last night, they just couldn't, It was. It was just fabulous, so, and, the, and my <coughs> my daughter, their mother, is a school teacher, and she was so appreciative. She begged me to say something, to really say thank you to for having this um, camp. So there you go. And I also attended the Balboa Yacht Club opening day, although they didn't mention me, but I was there. <laughs> it's a great time, and that was a lot of fun, and and I'm so uh, happy that they were able to do that. So. Thank you, Mayor. Fantastic, Mr. Muldoon. All right, Ms. Brenner. Um, I continue to work with the CDM bid and their subcommittee on the um, COVID response and how they're going to spend their money um, that the city gave them. I also attend the Corona de Mar Residents Association board meeting and their historical subcommittee as well as I met with Ed Olin and Shirley Peppis at the Balboa Island Museum, and I met with a group of the CDMRA Historical Subcommittee um, members to talk about how we can capture all the resources that we have in the city and make sure that we uh, utilize them and do some historical um, films so that we capture what's happened in the past. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'd like to put on a future agenda we keep getting emails constantly from people asking for residential parking programs. And I think it's important for them to understand what our limitations are there. Um, I'm getting a lot of people in my neighborhood talking about the environmental impacts of the huge number of visitors we're having and how there's a different type of visitor that is coming these days and there's a lot more trash, there's a lot more um, there's graffiti on the rocks. There's there's things that are happening in our community that we're not accustomed to. And so I'd like for us to, at some point in the future, put on the agenda that item so we can talk about whether we can or can't get parking permits and what else we can do to protect the environment of our community. All right. Thank you. Mr. Avery? I have none. Um, I have a few. So uh, as you know, I'm vice chair of the San Joaquin Board for the TCA. Uh, at the last meeting, the both boards adopted a new debt policy. Uh, they had never had one before December, and now they have one that is in part modeled off of the Newport Beach debt policy. I'd like to say thank you to Dan M for uh, helping in, in that process. Uh, it's a big deal that agency has existed for this long without a debt policy, but no longer. So it, uh, I mean, it's it's good. It prioritizes debt pay down, so that's helpful. Uh, just a quick thank you to the Newport Beach Foundation who fed the Newport Beach Police Department and Fire Department last week. I'm hearing from a lot of residents that uh, they've reached out and are doing similar things for our police department. Just want to say to each and every one of you, thank you. Um, the uh, uh, the only year where people might actually come to my office hours, I st I've got to continue to cancel them. Um, so <laughs> this, uh, this next week, unfortunately, I'll have to be canceling the office hours again. We will find a time somehow, some way. Uh, the... Uh, and this is for our members of the public. 
Last week, I called a special meeting for this coming Thursday, January 25th at 3 p.m. The special meeting will be addressing the appeal that uh, Councilman Avery has, um, uh, well, appealed um, of the decision for an encroachment permit at uh, Ensign Intermediate School. Uh, and then, so again, that's Thursday, uh, the 25th at 3 p.m. And then our, our housing subcommittee, the subcommittee de designed to try to find the housing units for Rena will actually be meeting for the first time July 1st at 6 p.m. So uh, if you're interested in that, please tune in. All right, uh, with that, we'll go into the uh, consent calendar, Madam Clerk. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items one through 16. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports of each item recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right, I'm going to invoke my uh, mayoral privilege of uh, being able to move some items around. I'm going to be removing 11 and 12, which are the... Um, uh, the merchants associations. I'm going to be removing those off the consent calendar, but in order to make it work from a flow standpoint and not put it in front of the short term lodging, which we have a lot of public comments for, I'm going to be moving those right before the public hearings, uh, which would be right before the bids. So 11 and 12 are going to get pulled and moved down into uh, right after item 20. All right. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Herdman. Any items for a poll off the consent calendar? Okay. Ms. Dixon? I have none. Mr. Uh, Duffield? I have none. Mr. Muldoon? I'd like to lodge a no vote on item three and item 14. Okay. Um, Ms. Brenner? Um, I just have a clarification on the minutes from our special meeting. Um, should I do that now or do we need to? You can add, if it's, if it's fairly minor, yeah, go ahead. The only thing that I'd like to add is um, there was a question that I asked at the beginning of that meeting, and in the minutes it just says, in response to my question, that, and then it gave the mayor's response, but I, the question was important because the question was, um, what is the county doing with the other $325 million um, that they were given to help with COVID relief? And I think in, in light of the fact that we had so m an extraordinary number of applicants for the money that we were given, I, I would like for us um, to consider at some point requesting additional funds from the county for that because we had 900 applicants and as I understand it, other cities had many fewer. So um, I just want that question to be in there and um, and then for us to talk about that at some time in the future. Got it. So uh, what we'll do is um, as part of the motion, Mr. Avery, we'll, uh, we'll amend the minutes to reflect uh, Ms. Brenner's question. And what I'll ask uh, Ms. Brown to do is go back and um, listen to the question and insert it in. All right. So that'll be that'll be part of the motion. Okay. Mr. Avery. I have none. And I have none as well. So um, do we have a motion, Mr. Avery? Sorry, hang on one second, I need your mic on. One through, uh, one through 16, with, uh, with the exception of items 11 and 12 pulled by the mayor and moved. And uh, no votes from uh, Council Member Muldoon on items three and 14. And uh, we have the amendments on item one, the minutes. And uh, Mrs. Brenner, her question. Got it. All right. Do we have a second? Seconded by Mr. Herdman. All right. We'll go out to public comment on the consent calendar. Do we have any public comments? Council, my name is Jim Mosher, and I wanted to comment on consent calendar item number 15, which is the Planning Commission agenda report for June 18th. There was a time in the past, you may not recall this, when the City Council actually heard at each meeting and a full-fledged oral report from the planning director 
about the planning activities that had happened in the city since the last council meeting with questions and answers. That's now reduced to this very cryptic written report that gives you nothing more than the vote. Within this report, I wanted to call your attention to item number four at last week's planning commission meeting, which was their approval of the fire station that you're planning to build on the Lido Peninsula. Their approval of that was predicated on the idea that a fire station is an allowed use on a parcel which is zoned for visitors serving commercial uses. A fire station is clearly not a visitor serving commercial use. Yet apparently our director has made some kind of a finding that it is. Fire stations are supposed to go in parcels that are zoned as public facilities. And there is a public process for changing the zoning, yet the city has avoided doing that. I think this need, item needs to be called up to review to ask why we have not changed the zoning of the parcel, because if we don't do that, our so-called planning land use maps that we have really mean nothing at all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments on consent calendar in the community room? I see none. Uh, we have calls. Okay, we'll go to the first caller. All right, go ahead. Hello? Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, hi there. I, yep, I, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. You go ahead first. Is there some? I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting echo on this line. I'm not sure if that's me or you. Should I call back? No, it's okay. Why don't you just go ahead and um, if, if you're getting echo, you can just speak through it. Okay, very good. Am I up soon? Yes, please go. Yes, hi. My name is Larry Robinson. I'm a homeowner on Newport Island. I was actually there present at the previous meeting where the Newport Island lodging issue was discussed. And I want to reiterate my push for the problems uh, that have, we have incurred as a result of the short-term lodging. I, I'm sorry, I'm Mr. Certainly a fan. I, I'm sorry, hang on just one second. So if you're, if you're gonna be talking to the short-term lodging issue, that's actually item number 19, uh, which is not, okay. it's not part of the consent calendar. So when that item comes back, you're more than welcome to call in. So call back when that comes up. Yes, please. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next caller. Okay, so. Hi, so if you're on the phone. Oh. Just a second, folks. Hi, if you can hear me, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The audio problem, by the way, is still not fixed. Um, I'm sorry that item nine was not pulled for further discussion. In spite of what the staff told you at the five o'clock meeting, the staff report said the proposed improvements involve adding a third lane, a right turn pocket at Old Bol Newport Boulevard, and a bike lane. There's no pictures of that approved proposed improvement in the staff report, while it may have been approved by Caltrans in 2017, it seems inappropriate to expect the residents to remember that and have not have access to see it. 
Um, I still suggest that you pull this and kick it back for further review. I don't know why it has to be now if it was approved by Caltrans in 2017. And I maintain that the residents have strong feelings about the widening of PCH through Mariner's Mile. This will increase widening from Huston on of PCH. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next speaker. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. Yes, I, I hope uh, I'm interpreting your agenda correctly. I wanted to comment on item 16, yes, you grants can. and donations report. Yes, thank you, you can go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Moores. I'm a member of the Newport Beach community residing in District 2, and today I'm representing the Newport Ocean Sailing and uh, uh, Associ Association, or the organizers of the annual Newport and Tanata Race. The Newport Tits and Otter Race is oh, I'm sorry. tradition. I'm sorry. Hang on one second. I, I know which one. You're, you're, you're actually calling in on item 17. So grants and donation report are simply what we've received. Um, I'm assuming that you're calling in to talk about uh, a request for a grant? You're correct. Okay. So that, that item is item 17, which we'll be taking up uh, right after the uh, public comments on non-agenda items. So if you could call back on item 17, uh, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I apologize. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. Any other callers? Okay. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. If, uh, if you can hear me on the phone, go ahead. Yes, I'm a, a resident of Newport Island and I'm calling to voice my opposition to the growth of the short-term runoff. Okay, so if you're, if you're doing that, then if you wouldn't mind calling back on item number 19, um, which we'll be getting to in a few items, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, any other callers? All right, if you're on the phone, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. My name is Nancy Scarborough. I'm very surprised that this item is tucked into the consent calendar as a seemingly harmless increase in the consultant's contract. contract. Um, because we're beginning a general plan update, which will include a comprehensive study of the traffic element, why would we waste uh, an additional $139,000 to study this at this time. The city's experiencing budget cuts and reduction of services. This additional expense seems like a waste of taxpayer money considering our current budget challenge challenges. More to the point, the issue of widening PCH is a controversial subject with many residents. This study and the discussion with Caltrans about what is planned for this intersection its implications for traffic, additional development, approvals, and the circulation element of the general plan needs to involve the residents and the businesses. It should not be a staff-driven project. Further, the state is moving away from increased traffic lanes with a shift to VMT and other new state codes. The need to increase lanes on PCH seems inappropriate at this time. I'm very skeptical about comment that whatever would be planned now would not be changed based on public input on the general plan or with new state mandates and proposed le legislation in the near future. The optics of this are not good for the staff or the council. This should be delayed and incorporated into the circulation element of the general plan citizen element. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, any other calls? No. All right, so we're going to bring it back, um, and uh, uh, Councilman Brenner has let me know that she'd like to pull item nine. So um, we'll uh, need to incorporate that in. Is that incorporated into your motion, Mr. Avery, and in, into your second, Mr. Herdman? Okay. All right, seeing no further discussion, let's vote on the uh, consent calendar.
prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for item three, ordinance number 2020-10, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach amending Exhibit A to Newport Beach Municipal Code Section 3.36.030 related to cost recovery. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, we'll move into item number nine, pulled by Councilmember Brenner. Um, Councilmember Brenner, since you pulled it, would you like a short staff report? Yes, I would. Okay. Uh, Mr. Muldoon, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just to confirm, City Attorney, there's no um, telecommunication component to this. Is there? It says utility planning, which often does not include telecom, but I want to be sure before we proceed. We didn't show any telecom uh, when we looked at this project, but let me just confirm with Mr. Uh, Houlihan that there's no telecom component to this or undergrounding. Thank you. Okay. I might just, could I just say something about this while, um, while you're getting ready? Um, I, hope, I hope the public recognizes that we do hear you when you make public comments, and sometimes you raise issues that perhaps we have not thought about, or there's an aspect of it that we haven't thought about, and so I don't want you to feel like that we just shine you on when you're speaking for public comments that this I, this is an item that I really am interested in. And I know the people in um, along Mariner's Mile and above Mariner's Mile and Newport Heights are very, very concerned about anything that appears to be widening. So that's what I'd like to be able to assure them about. Is the mic on? As I mentioned before, the, the project began in 2013. That's when the project was initiated. Um, in 2017, ultimately, we got to the environmental document was completed and certified at that time. And that pr getting to that point gave all the residents an opportunity to comment through that process. Since then, we've been in design. 
and, and we're at this point, and when you see this design, it's, it's a second alternative, it's an alternative that was addressed in the environmental document. Um, the reason why we're coming forth with this amendment is the original prove, the original preferred design um, was processed through and the funds were expended for that. And then Caltrans has since decided that they wanted to go with alternative one. They didn't, we couldn't work out the design which left the existing parking lot as it is, the, the Caltrans parking lot, and the road was pretty much where it is today up against A's. What they wanted now, the direction they've sent us is to now realign the road toward the Caltrans parking lot and have a residual property next to A's. Here's the property, or here's the exhibit. So, uh, I, and, and the, the main concern, as you've mentioned, is Coast Highway. And what we see here is three through lanes, ultimately with a bike lane and a turn pocket created. Today, that third lane is a dedicated, it just dies into a right turn. So what's happening is that right turn is now continuing through and we've created a new right turn pocket. Um, in this design, there's a lot of concessions that A's has to make and they've, we've been working with them for a long time and it has to do with the on-site circulation. We won't just let, right now they have free curb access all around their property. They're gonna have an ingress and an egress. So it's gonna be controlled and they've, we've worked with them very closely, the owners, and uh, we're, we're at a point where we need to now work with Caltrans on the right-of-way negotiations as well as A's to fin complete that. So the design is now, as you can see, it's shifted over toward um, Newport Boulevard. And um, you can see how it bows around, goes through that residual parking lot that exists today. And the new residual parking lot gets, oh, ends up next to A's where it should belong. So further. So um, it, the public comments on this were back in 2013, is that what you said? When no, the, when no, that's when the project began okay. and, and we started the preliminary studies and such, but in 2017, maybe 16, 17, is when the comments would have occurred. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, and we don't know for sure that Caltrans is going to approve this version either, we're still in negotiations with them? I'll, I'll let, Mike is managing this project right now. I'll let Mike speak. Okay. Mer Merrowdale council members, thank you for, for bringing this up. It's actually good that the public gets a chance to see this. Um, we did have a lot of comments during the uh, environmental document that has been certified by Caltrans. Um, Mariner's Mile was in great discussion at that time. So people thought at the time that this was somehow connected to Mariner's, Mariner's Mile and we were we we're pushing this through ahead of the Mariner's Mile, whatever we do there. Um, it, it's clearly not the case. Um, I, I'll add, this was the number one bike safety improvement recommended in our bike master plan. Um, I don't remember what year that was um, actually you know, adopted by council. And just last week or week before, we had another vehicle that plowed through that pork shop that we call it right at the uh, intersection there, tear out their oil pan, take out the sign again, and it's, it's just happens time and time again. And the bikers going through that intersection are, it's just, it's scary at times. So um, the improvement that was approved during the environmental process in 17, which again, the public did comment. We received many, many comments and had many, many conversations about this. Um, had the road basically stay up against A's where the blue is on your exhibit there. Um, after discussions with Sacramento and the director here uh, locally at District 12 Caltrans, they really, light going over the old parking lot and they've just asked us to really reconsider our design. It's a little more extensive in what we have to deal with and utilities and such, a, you know, lots of things. Um, but it's essentially the same design that was approved as the uh, um, recommended improvement in the environmental document. This is just an alternative. It's not something we're trying to sneak behind the public's back. It's, it's just this intersection. It has nothing to do with Mariner's Mile. 
Um, the other thing I might add is the nine parking stalls that back out on the Coast Highway from A Market, that again causes me to cringe sometimes. Um, that's going to be fixed with this project, and we're going to be able to uh, accommodate the A Market with more parking on their parcel, and, and this is actually their preferred alternative as well. They wanted this since day one in 2013. So, um, Mike, does this does this make it any easier for the rest of PCH along Mariner's Mile to become three lanes each way? Because that's I think that's what people are primarily concerned about with this improvement. Absolutely not. Um, from Riverside to this bridge, right, right, we see in front of you, is three lanes in that direction. Um, a, a minimalized project, if Caltrans would ever approve it, we could simply just take that pork chop out of the way and make it a third lane through and a right turn pocket. That would be a fallback position at some point if we can't get this project approved. This is a better alternative for the community. It straightens out the alignment of the intersection, makes Old Newport a stop. You see a lot of people stopping anyway. Uh, coming off there. Um, the overall area here is considered an interchange by Caltrans. The hook ramps that are up the street um, coming back down here. It, if we could make it a local road, we wouldn't even be having Caltrans involved. But since it's got some ramp connections, I mean, these conversations have gone on for seven years. And, and uh, this, unfortunately, is where they want us to go. We've got from Sacramento down saying, let's get it done. And it's just a switch from the design that we were almost 100% done with trying to get permits, and they said, well, let's switch to this. And unfortunately, it's another $139,000. We believe it's a better alternative. We would have gone here first. Um, now they're actually telling us to go here. So. Okay. Mr. Avery. Yeah, um, Mike, I had a... <clears throat> tour of this I think a couple of times over the last five years and anybody that's almost piled into the back of um, the cars before making that turn on the old Newport Boulevard um, and then if you're on a bike it's it's just a place not to be <coughs> so I think everybody agrees this is great and I also think that the residents concerns about the wide name coast highway are well-founded um, based on history and so I think our only issue here is just you know it needed a little more um reveal to uh certainly the folks in the heights that are impacted potentially impacted by any kind of widening of the highway um so I, um uh, thanks joy for kind of bringing it up so people get a clearer look at it because uh it is going to be a significant improvement so i think the only question is i think you've answered it clearly that it does not in any way um, further the idea of widening the highway Councilman Ray, you reminded me of a, a walk you and I had there, I don't know how many years ago. Um, the folks on Santa Ana Avenue, yep. actually, I've been waiting for this improvement as well, and there is a sidewalk that will be moving up the hill, and yep. we're even talking about some other alternatives for Santa Ana Avenue that is also included in this design package. On the south side there. Um, going up the hill, we are in this yeah. change. We're going to consider some uh, Santa Ana Avenue sidewalk improvements that, that would... Uh, Right. Yeah, I spoke with them last week, and, and they're excited that this is um, hopefully moving forward. So it'll, the whole thing will become much more bikeable, more, much safer. And, and also the A market, you know, the back property line and the side, pro all the property lines get sort of straightened out here right, right. Um, as part of the project. Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Herdman. Mike, <clears throat> uh, Councilman Avery just said this is a significant improvement. How so? Why is it a significant improvement? Uh, you know, I, as you know, I live on the west side of town, and, and if you're driving um, through this area, especially at sunset, and you have a, a, a biker who commutes to uh, you know, the west, you know, Huntington Beach or wherever and beyond, uh, they're in the far number three lane up against the curb in front of Sterling BMW. As they approach the intersection with the sun setting down underneath the bridge and it's sort of blinding, you see that biker come to the number between the number two and lane, there's a single stripe that he has to navigate between moving traffic that is turning right and going through. And sometimes that car that doesn't know that there's a pork chop there and jogs in and tries to go around it, Diane's probably witnessed this countless times, or the car that literally just runs over the pork chop. With a biker in the mix at, at sunset, it makes me cringe every time I drive through there. Are you widening Pacific Coast Highway? 
Um, if you look at the yellow on the exhibit, it's winding into where the A's market or A's restaurant parks. So if you want to deem that a widening, I guess you could, but it's really just to... Because we just heard the comment on the phone that this project is widening Coast Highway from Tustin up to the bridge. Uh, I, is that I, an accurate statement? It's not from Tustin to the bridge. The yellow area right there on that exhibit is, is the only widening to, to correct the backing out on the Coast Highway from the A market okay. and to create a uh, the right turn pocket separating the three lane that's, that'll be that third lane through. And what about my, the, my mind, this is just a great safety project. I wouldn't be standing in front of That was of my next I, question. I hate to How use the How does it address safety. the safety issue and does it in fact address it? Uh, we believe it does. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, we got a couple more. Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, I think the bicycle master plan was adopted by the prior council in 2014 or something, I believe. That was, anyway, the point is, this is, I can remember conversations about this because this, this area is a targeted improvement safety area lane for the bikes. So just to clarify, my understanding, as I say, I drive this every day, the lane is already there. It, it just feeds into the pork chop. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the, the controls back here, Ms. Jacobs, to zoom in just on that. And that's a good idea. Uh, you can actually see it if oh, you zoom in. It's even better. So the, th the so-called third lane is already there. It's, just be it's an exit lane going on to Newport Boulevard. If you, if you look closely, you can see the pork chop. I don't know if she can zoom in just a little bit more. And it's a safe, in my opinion, it's a safety hazard for the reason you just described. I, I see an accident there at least a couple of times a week because people don't know it's a parking lot and they're exiting into a parking lot and it's really a right turn lane. So anyway, I think this is a good plan. It's not an expansion of Coast Highway from Tustin. It's, the lane is already there. Well, if, if you look closely, uh, what Mr. Julian was saying earlier, um, there's three lanes just right at the bridge. There's three lanes right before the bridge. And he, those arrows are the lanes. If you see the black arrows, the, la the lane's already there. We, like I said, we could just decide to remove the pork chop, and the third arrow, the number three lane, could be a right turn pocket and a through lane anyway. And we, we could do that. It doesn't improve the bike safety still makes it so people are slamming on their brakes, turning right, which we wouldn't, um, we, we, this is a better alternative. Okay, so this. I have another question related to the blue parking area. So if I understood uh, correctly earlier that it, it's obviously going into the Caltrans, the lane, the new lane is going in, expanding into the west of the Caltrans, it's into the Caltrans lot, correct? Right, so, so right uh, there, hey, that's right now, this is I, all. This is all parking here in the council. Right, but no one can park there. It's Caltrans lot. I mean, Co correct. Typically, it, but I mean, people may. But usually, there it's a staging area or something like that, and so it's it's prohibited. So the blue, the new blue, so that is for a parking, or is so, that so other the public parking? Right away of Old Newport is right here where I'm drawing the line, and there's yeah. actual people parking on the side of the restaurant right there. And what about to the left of that? So this area is what we're going to be dealing with Caltrans in terms of deeming that surplus land to the city, and then we'll hopefully be coming so to a deal. That's public parking. Uh, no, that will be actually um, then in turn uh, used to negotiate the take in the front and the rearrangement of all the property. Lines. Oh, so it may not be parking. Uh, it will be parking, but it will be probably for it'll be private parking for the A's. Okay. It's well, anyway, so okay, good. All right, but anyway, this is made possible by utilizing the Caltrans property that's been unutilized by the city and it, or by a market. So that's a good thing as well. So we have bicycle safety, uh, better safety at that right turn, and then enhanced parking. Okay, yes, good. All right, thank you. Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is just a fabulous solution to a really big problem. I turn there every day, and uh, I wasn't privy to this uh, design, but I... I think you've done a fabulous job, and I just hope that, that it gets approved by all the agencies, and I can't wait for it to be done. It's <laughs> unbelievably good, and it's going to save countless accidents. Okay. All right, you can take a seat. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to public comment on this item. Do we have any public comment from the uh, community room? 
All right, seeing none, do we have, but okay, we'll go to the phone. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Firstly, uh, thank you to Council Member Brenner for pulling this. Um, secondly, I have tremendous respect for the work that Mike Sinecori and Jim Bullihan are doing. I think in the future, what could have helped it was if this project alternate was made available as part of the staff report, because when something is on the calendar to approve a design that has three lanes plus the turnout plus bike lanes, it gets our attention. And that's what got us going today. And I agree with them that it seems like a reasonable alternative. Um, it is involved trading private property and for city property and involvement with Caltran. But again, that should have all been made available. The residents don't remember what was commented on in 817, unfortunately. Thank you for your service. Any others? No, okay. All right, we'll bring this back. Do I have a motion? Move the item by Mr. Muldoon. I'll second. I'll, second. I'll go Mr. Herdman. All right, second by Mr. Herdman. And uh, any further discussion? All right, let's vote. The, the motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay. All right, at this time we'll go to public comment on non-agenda item. Um, real quick, uh, let me just explain this item real quickly for uh, folks who this is their first time coming to a meeting. Uh, this, is for, this is a public comment on items that are not on the agenda. So if you're here to speak to a specific agenda item, uh, I'll make sure to call that agenda item, but this is on non-agenda items. All right, uh, go ahead, Mr. Baker. Yeah, my name is Dennis Baker. Uh, I wanted to comment on a non-agenda item, but it does affect the city. On last week at Spawn's Wednesday board meeting, Spawn moved to hire an attorney to uh, pause, not cancel, pause the Ensign project being done by the Newport Mesa uh, Unified School District and the city is named as a real party of interest. Uh, I struggled with emotions, even what I was gonna say tonight as to, I didn't know whether I was angry, incredulous or whatever, and I really kind of landed on really sad, and I'm sad on two fronts. I'm sad for the obvious thing, the loss of the trees, <clears throat> because uh, we, uh, when we hired our attorney, our attorney is a courtesy, and I guess it's a very common thing, on Friday notified the Unified School District that we were planning on seeking relief in court and that we would be doing that on Tuesday. So at six o'clock on Monday morning, uh, the trucks and chainsaws showed up and started whacking down the trees. Uh, so that in itself is very sad. Uh, the attitude that uh, the contractors had that they couldn't quite finish the job on Monday, so they, they basically semi-destroyed the remaining trees so they would not be recoverable so when they could come back on Tuesday in case it was stopped, they'd still have to take them out. So the other sad, I'm sad for obviously for that happening, but the other real sad I had is that this was done by an agency, the Newport Mesa Unified School District, that is actually the agency in charge of setting standards and I think should be an example for students and our citizens. And I, I'm not sure which troubles me more. I actually think that their behavior uh, basically to do this in a reaction so they could chop them down before we could get into court uh, is actually more saddening than the loss of the trees. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Nancy Barfield. I'm talking about the Ensign project that went down yesterday. I was up over the um, dramatic teardown of these trees for around nine hours. Uh, I no more got home and I get a phone call that there's rumors and innuendo going around that there was people inside the campus, that they were having ladders to climb in. And I wanna just make real clear, I was there the whole time. There was never anyone inside the school that wasn't allowed inside the school. One staff member got locked out. She couldn't get back in and the crew let her back in. I totally agree with what went on. We had Tim Holcomb that was standing there basically smirking when it first started. We also have videos of uh, different gentlemen saying, we've got to get these trees down. 
before this injunction gets um, put in front of us. And then somebody said, please don't take down that tree. And he says, I'm gonna take it down faster. So he picked up a chainsaw and just tore into it as fast as he could. And then I happened to mention there's a nest in that other tree. And he says, well, I'll take that one down even faster. So not only they destroyed trees and did exactly what the other gentleman said, they were on a mission. And then afterwards they started saying these rumors, I did write to uh, Principal Shaka today, I straightened him out, and he wrote a comment back to me that was very nice, but he said, there was so much bad information floating around yesterday, I re received some pretty outrageous reports and was uncertain what was true and what was not. This is very helpful. I had sent him an email explaining the entire day. I didn't give him the entire timeline that I gave you all. I gave him what really happened. And the people, we had four officers there. They were very nice. And you know, they kept saying there's freedom of speech. Um, they just didn't want anyone to get hurt. And then they were saying the school board or the uh, the workers, they were saying, you know, we were too close to the trees. Well, it's public right away to the fence, to the sidewalk. I then called Jim Houlihan just so everyone could hear me say the same thing. So it was pretty bad yesterday. It's devastating. I've had more emails, phone calls, texts. Everyone's crying. Everyone's distraught. And we did get the injunction today. Um, we do have our special meeting or meeting here on Thursday, I hope we have a very large turnout and they need to work with the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council. <clears throat> this is Jim Mosher again. I, I have another, a, a non-agenda comment on a completely different topic. As you undoubtedly recall at your last meeting, you adopted a budget for the coming fiscal year. Two days after you adopted that budget, the California Coastal Commission held a statewide virtual meeting at which one of the most prominent items on their agenda, which apparently was well known and well anticipated by our city staff, had to do with the cleanup of the private encroachments on the public beach at Peninsula Point, for which the city is obligated to pay at least $500,000. I have two categories of question about that. Number one, was that $500,000 in the budget that you approved at your last meeting? If it's not in the budget, how and where is it going to be added to the budget? And the second question I have is, does the city have a plan to recover that $500,000 from the homeowners who caused the problem? It seems to me very much like somebody had spilled toxic chemicals in a street if you know who the party was that does that, normally the city would try to recover the cost. So is the city trying to recover this money? Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, public comments from the community room? Do we have any calls? All right, we have one call. Can I have All right, go ahead. Hi, so if you're calling in, make sure you mute what you're listening to and then and then go ahead and speak. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Brooklyn Schumann and I live in Newport Beach as well as um, I have a, I'm a white female living in a city with an 80.3% majority white population. I would like to create how they're still able Sorry, to you're, hang on one second. You're breaking up, so if you could find a better reception location. Okay. Um, is that better for you? It is. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to reiterate how we're able to continue um, to help them. No. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, we're still having a hard time. It's still breaking up. Is that okay? Um, our town, as well as Costa Mesa Harbor, is a great influx of traveling and tourism. We have a very diverse range of non-residential visitors and a residential population that has wealth and weight in our political choices. 
We as a city and as a people are not just affecting those who take residence within our limits, but creating an environment that feels safe for all demographics. Furthermore, I would be interested in not only hearing further how our police force is implementing training and training last but I would like to revisit budget removal. Well, um, pulling numbers directly from the city website, $67,202,345 being the proposed budget for the 2021, while 2018 budget was $59,693,214. Out of that 2018 budget, only two of the six followed the reach you with training and traveling, while the 20 revised for training and traveling only went up by $67,359. That kind of has a dance to always measure the investment in the training of our police force as there is in the continuity. I would like to see that money redirected and overall budget redistributed into other areas of benefit and our community. The 2020 police speech police training budget comes up $57,288 short of the new police department uniform expense budget for 2020. So <laughs> I'm just saying that our police force looks great, but I would do the best in the humanitarian time to be a fight for a few in the area with the I think. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other speakers? No. All right. We'll bring it back. Um, to Mr. Mosher's question, that's actually, that's, it's, it's worth, um, it's worth just a quick response because that's, that's a fair question to ask for uh, some clarification. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, yes, the Coastal Commission approved some consent orders for the city and the city agreed to those consent orders. Uh, it does obligate the city to remove the encroachments um, that are out there in, 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 in coordination with the property owners who have to remove some patios. Um, we did not budget for that in the current budget. Um, we don't know the precise cost of that. We haven't put it out to bid yet. Early estimates are roughly half a million dollars. We think we can do it for less than that, but we'll have to put it out to bid to, to find out the precise cost, and then we'll deal with the budget at that point. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into current business, which is item number 17, Community Programs and Special Event Grant Recommendations. I'll, I'll note just up front, this was an excellent staff report. Um, so I'm not anticipating. I, does anyone need a staff report on this? The, the written comments were quite good. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, or comments? Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Is um, a staff member, who, uh, who is city manager or Carol, are you going to respond? I just have a couple of questions on a couple items. Um, under community and charitable events. Now, all of those items are having their permits waived or is there direct cash gifts given? On the community, <coughs> excuse me, on the community events, those are fee waivers only. And so staff, staff determines what the fee waiver, waiver would be based on what their event is, if they need police or those kinds of activities. And then staff calculates that and then puts in the request to have those city fees waived. Okay. On one of the items that was denied by staff, uh, Orange County Coast Keeper. Yes, ma'am. Could you give me a little bit of background? This was expansion of Bolsa, Bolsa Chica and Calafia State Beach. Cleanup Correct. program in Newport Beach. Correct. They they've asked to expand their cleanup program to Newport Beach. Oh. Um, the the application did not say if they would do one event or five events, so we don't know what that is. And we also have a, we already have a number of uh, organizations that do cleanups for free, so we didn't think um, staff didn't believe we needed another organization to um, to assist with that. But that was just our okay. Thought uh, process. Well, I appreciate that. I get, I would like to add for consideration that we reinstate their application grant of $5,000. Perhaps uh, maybe there's another program. I know they do Coast Beach cleanup, but maybe there's another program there. They're a good partner with Newport Beach in our coastal related activities. I'd like us to, and we have room, if I understand, you, there's a little bit of extra. There's, there's $6,000 extra that we did not, uh, staff did not allocate. So, um, when we have a motion, I'd like to add that to the motion to include. Which, which group was that? This is in community programs, Coast not keepers. recommended for Coast Keepers. Coast Keepers. Can, can Co Yeah, and it's the? on um, page 17-11 on that table. 
Okay, give me just a moment. And the so the thought process. I just I want to make sure I'm understanding the thought process from the city on why the recommendation was uh, zero is because um, we've the city does a lot of overlap. Is that from the notes I'm reading here? Yes. Yeah, so so you know, surf riders out here once a month. We've got two other organizations that are out here on a kind of regular basis, and those are free to us. So we didn't feel like we needed to add one more one more group. Or at least pay for one at more At least group. pay for one more group, yeah. Okay. But would it be possible, though, to, because they are a good partner with Newport Beach for a lot of related programs, if maybe there's another or an aspect of our free beach cleanup that's not covered or some aspect that would bring merit to this proposal? We can, we can, cert we can this is certainly council's decision. That was just our staff's, at the staff level, that was our thought process. Okay. Um, Mr. Herdman. So if that's uh, included with the motion and approved, that leaves you a thousand bucks in that category, correct? That's correct. And then you have five. Th I understand you have five thousand left over, uh, or that you didn't allocate in the community and charitable events category. That's correct. Uh, just talk a little bit about what uh, might happen to those funds. If the, if the council chooses not to allocate those funds, they just go back to the general fund. Okay, but at a later date, might we be able to allocate those funds? Historically, historically, this has been the opportunity for council to, to make that decision tonight. tonight so that we can give that to them so that they have that for their events throughout the fiscal year. I, I'm going to come back around to that point. Okay. Yeah, because right. I'm going to address exactly that and, point. And it just seems uh, in, this, in this, these times of recovery we, and everything that, that if this money is available to people, it should be allocated. Uh, why why are we holding on to it? We're, we're probably going to bring it back, that, but okay. I'll, I'll come back around to that. All right, thank okay. you. Ms. Brenner. Um, the only problem I have with that is that we have these other organizations doing it for free, and I feel like it's sort of a slap in the face to them if we pay another organization to do basically the same thing or another aspect of the same thing. So I... I don't want to offend the other organizations by saying we appreciate your free efforts, but we're going to pay somebody else. So that's my concern. Okay. Um, so yeah. So to Mr. Herdman's point, this was something that um, I had talked to uh, Ms. Leung about. There are some of these that might not happen, um, and so part of part of the process here is if you look at some of these, some of these. I mean, so for example, um, Coleman is in September right now. That might not happen. Um, it may be get moved. I, I don't know. I mean, we've, that, we've been, this, this year has seen a lot of shifting and canceling. Um, so I, I do think that what we ought to be doing is we, if we, whatever we approve, we should bring back in six months because some of these, pro, some of these might not happen and there's might be more that we can add into one that wasn't approved or one that we, you know, that we, um, uh, you know, or one that, um, that was approved and would like to receive more. So I, I do think we'll be bringing this one back. Okay. It's just, it's impossible to see the crystal ball on this one. So I know anyway. I talked to Terry Jansen today, who's the new president of the Babel Island Improvement Association, and the uh, board is meeting tomorrow night, and they're, they're uh, going to recommend that they not have a carnival this year. And that's the uh, third, fourth item down. So you're right, Will. Yeah, some of these may not happen. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we've already seen it. We've seen a lot of it uh, roll into the next fiscal year anyway because things like Field of Honor and the Balboa Island Parade and other things got canceled this year, so that's part of the equation. Ms. Dixon. Is there a larger question whether we should do this or should just, we just defer it for a couple months? No, I think the larger... My, my point in saying this is that I think it's appropriate for us to show the value here, and um, if some of these projects do go forward, they should be able to... Re request and receive the money. Um, if they don't go forward, then what we ought to be doing is bringing it back as a council and uh, either reallocating or just saying, because I mean, the point, one thing to remember, this is all general fund. So every dollar we're bringing out of this is a dollar that uh, we're bringing out of reserves at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's worth remembering that when we're trying to allocate some of this money, um, because it's, it, if we don't spend it, then it's, you know, it's a dollar that we don't have to replenish in reserves. So 
we, we may reallocate it, we may not, um, but it's, that's the kind of year we're living through. So that's, that's what I wanted to point out when we're kind of working through some of this. Right, and then I just want to address the Coast Keeper. Uh, maybe it should be held in abeyance for them to come back and clarify um, for another program that doesn't duplicate something that we get for free. It's if, just I want to keep them on the list. That's the bottom line. Yeah, and that might be, that might be the point of trying to bring this back in about five or six months because um, we'll, we'll know a lot more at that point yeah. for a lot of th different things. Anyway, um, I'll just real quickly also point out uh, Newport Mesa Spirit Run, first time in a signature event. I love it. I love seeing this one. It's great that they're they're growing in uh, both stature and prominence. It's a health related uh, event that's geared toward um, geared toward kids. So, kudos to the Spirit Run for reaching to the point where they can apply and actually reach that level. So, anyway, with that said, um, any other comments up here? Okay, we'll go out to public comment on this item. Do we have any public comment on this item? Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, Jim Mosier again. The uh, agenda indicates in addition to the listed items, you're gonna be asked to consider providing a fee waiver to speak up Newport for the use of this very community room. And the staff report describes that as a unique new application this year. I thought the city had more involvement with Speak Up Newport since I believe it films their meetings and posts them on the city website. So I, I'm wondering if somebody could verify that this truly is new and that they have not been enjoying some kind of subsidy in the past. And in addition, if other community groups that might want to put on a community program in this room will in the future be entitled to the same consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor O'Neill and City Council members. My name is Diane DeRudy. I'm here on behalf of Spirit Run. I had a PowerPoint that I had submitted. I'm not sure if you can see that. I would request that that be put up if possible. All right. Just a moment. We'll give you your time back. Let's, we'll, we'll figure out how to put it up. There we go. All right, uh, your time started, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are respectfully requesting two things. One, that you approve city staff's recommendation for $21,000 as a signature event our first year. And this one is a little bit more controversial now that I'm sitting here, but we wanted to see respectfully if you might consider Spirit Run uh, to receive the $5,200 remaining in the community and charitable events budget. But of course, in light of all your comments, I trust you to figure out what's best on that. There are many reasons to support Spirit Run. Let me just briefly go through a few. Next slide, please. Celebrating its 38th annual year, Spirit Run is a true Newport Beach tradition. Kids who raced Spirit Run when they were young now attend with their children. Pictured here is Karen Yelsey, school board member, with her son Josh and her daughter Annie. This was in the 90s when she was a Spirit Run cheer. This year, she was here with Josh and her grandson. Next slide, please. Perhaps the biggest fan of Spirit Run is Steve Scott, who is an Olympian and world record holder for the most sub four minute miles. He is a true Spirit Run enthusiast. He believes that kids need to be active and need aerobic challenge, and he th thinks Spirit Run not only provides that, but does that in a fun environment. Next slide, please. In addition to all the fitness, Spirit Run's net proceeds benefit youth fitness and education. In the last 10 years, almost $400,000 has been donated to those causes. Next slide. I wanted to let you see a few examples of how that money has been used. Each year, Spirit Run asked the principals to let them know how it was used, and these are some examples of how that was done. Next slide. Also wanted to point out that Spirit Run benefits the city, both financially and in other ways. Camp, the city rec department hosts its Camp Newport at Spirit Run, which saves city staff time and rental expenses, and also potentially increases the amount of revenue generated from 
camp fees because Spirit Run attracts so many kids and families. Also, in 2021, Spirit Run is planning to collaborate with the Junior Guards program and the foundation to raise money for the Junior Guard headquarters. Spirit Run also provides sponsor benefits to the city and from the participants that are coming from out of town results in uh, hotel stays and dining and shopping in the city. Next slide. I want to draw particular attention right now in this current conditions that we all know that we need to exercise adults, everyone, to build our immune systems. Spirit Run provides the incentive to train and also provides a fun day for people of all ages to run or walk from a mile to a 10K and enjoy the day. You can do that alone with your family or even with your dog. Finally, I'm, I just wanted to point out that Spirit Run's board of directors uh, has a proven track record. We are a group of attorneys, CPAs, and actuaries whose kids have attended the event. Not only do we love the fitness, but we believe in it and financially support it collectively. We have donated over $126,000 to support the event over the last few years. And finally, in conclusion, I just thought you might enjoy these fun photos from the recent events with city council members enjoying Spirit Run. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other speakers in the uh, in community room? Yep, go ahead. Good evening, I'm Hoi Yan Yip again. I just happened to be here to hear about this item and Diane, thanks for your words for Coast Keeper. I don't know if they, you two get money from the city. So as a cleanup volunteer, I have some idea which organization does clean up where and how often and what do they do after that? I need to be PC. So Coast Keeper is the real deal in Orange County. Very few environmental organizations work so hard, so broadly, creatively like Coast Keeper. They have done a lot for the city, also for the Newport Bay. So I totally support, um, I don't know what number amount will be appropriate, but I think we should reward the real deal organizations. Some organizations, they say they do clean up. They probably only do it once a year on Coastal Cleanup Day. And that, uh, that event is also organized by Coast Keeper locally. Then there are, there's another zero trash. I actually volunteer with zero trash too, but there is no zero trash in Newport Beach. And there's also some other um, pick, uh, cleanup organizations. They do this thing actually to get um, corporate to pay them to do this. For instance, Starbucks would pay someone to um, host their cleanup event. So there's different motivations behind different organizations. I'm not saying anybody's bad. I mean, any cleanup is good, but Coast Keeper is a real deal. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers in? All right. Okay, let's go to the phone. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. Yes, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Moores. I'm a member of the Newport Beach community residing in District 2, and today I'm representing the Newport Ocean Sailing Association, the organizers of the annual Newport Dance and Auto Race. The Newport Dance and Auto Race has been a spring tradition kicking off the sailing season for the past 73 years, with 2020 being the first and only cancellation of the event due to COVID-19. The Newport Tenth and Auto Race has been a longtime signature event of the city. For the past seven events, the city has approved grants in the amount of $10,000 per year to help offset the expense of running the race. This has consistently been one of the lowest annual amounts awarded for a signature event of this stature. Last week, we received a grant recommendation from staff indicating the new four tenths and auto race was not being recommended for grant support in 2020-2021. 
stating that the funds received last year should be carried over to next year's event. Though we appreciate the logic, it does not reflect reality. We were less than 60 days from the start of the event, which requires a full year of planning, promotion, and coordination when it was canceled. This was also a year we produced a new website, which features the city as the event's key supporter and increased pre-race publicity and social media efforts well in advance of the event. While NOSA did save some expense, it will have considerable losses due to the refunds to competitors for the canceled events, fixed overhead, dated apparel, and marketing materials which cannot be recouped. This is in addition to lost sponsor revenue. The net result of this is a projected 2020 end of year deficit of $18,164, which includes the previous grant support from the city. To go into the 2021 event without the support of the city's signature event grant will place a serious burden on the organization. We would like to request the city council reconsider the 2020-2021 signature events recommended by staff to include the Newport Dance and Auto Race at the requested $10,000 amount. This will go a long way in helping to maintain the quality of the event in the best interest of the city. NOSA is committed to the return of this historic event in 2021, along with continuous promotion of Newport Beach and its sailing community and heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other callers? All right, we'll bring it back up here. Um, I'm inclined to uh, go with staff's recommendation across the board on this, uh, and I'd like to uh, bring this back in about six months to, uh, uh, to review, basically figure out who's used what and if we need to reallocate or uh, allocate additional funding uh, for a variety of uh, organizations. But Ms. Dixon. Um, well, I support what you've just said, but I would like to put some priority attention to Coast Keepers and to NOSA so that's, that we give them. That's fair. I'll tell you what, we're, we're in June right now. Why don't we bring this back in um, the second meeting in November? So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a staff. I'm going to move staff recommendation um, with uh, the caveat that I'd expect to review this uh, again in the second meeting in November for uh, either a reallocation or um, addition or even potentially subtraction, depending on how the economic looks like. But probably not. I think that's. I think what we're looking at is um, the second meeting in November for a uh, just a review of where we are and perhaps a reallocation. Sounds good. I'll second that. All right, seconded by Mr. Herdman. Any discussion? Can I make a friendly amendment to it, specifically include Coast Keepers and NOSA? And yeah, and I'll tell you what, I think it, I think um, what we'd also like to do is see Coast Keepers uh, submit a little bit more detailed information for that particular yes. meeting, and just, just Coast Keepers, I think. You know what, I'm sorry. Let's invite NOSA to, to uh, give us an update on that as well. So those two organizations only, so I don't want a reapplication process. Uh, but just those two organizations specifically, if they would like to uh, submit additional information to us, that'd be great. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay, this should be a fairly quick one. Um, item number 18, um, resolution number 2020-63. Mr. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to excuse myself for a conflict on this one related to undergrounding and my prior employment telecommunications. All right, thank you very much. Just a moment. Okay, um, I don't think we need a staff report. Any discussion or questions? All right, any public comments on this particular item? Okay, do we have any calls? Nope. All right, we'll bring it back. I'm going to make a motion that we approve staff recommendation. Second. Seconded by Ms. Dixon. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. The motion carries 6-0 with Councilmember Muldoon recusing himself. Okay, let's go for the uh, main item of the night, short-term lodging. Um, I'd like a uh, brief staff report to just go over the high points and then... Uh, We'll have uh, any questions or discussion up here and we'll go out to public comment. So, Mr. Georges. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and city council members. We, we do have a PowerPoint presentation. We'll just put up here real quick. You know, actually, 
just a second. We should wait for Mr. Muldoon to come back. Go ahead, Mr. Georges. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We can have. All right. Let's see. We're going to go ahead and just remind the council that uh, these are recommendations from the ad hoc committee, which was made up of council members Joy Brenner, Diane Dixon, and council member Jeff Herdman. We've, the, the committee's had a lot of public meetings, and you can see about seven are listed up there. That's, those are the public meetings that they've been working on for over a year and a half now. And this doesn't include the 15 to 20 conference calls they had with staff um, and the number of um, conference calls and meetings they've had with some members of the public. You know, the, the purpose of the, the ACOD committee was to, to look at the short-term rental regulations and find that right balance to improve the quality of life for the residents. There are two ordinances on your agenda this evening. There is the emergency ordinance, and we have the short-term lodging ordinance. And I just want to focus really briefly on the emergency ordinance that's on your agenda. This is emergency ordinance number six, and it repeals emergency ordinance number three. Emergency ordinance number three actually banned short-term lodging activity on Newport Island. This, if adopted by the city council, will allow Newport Island to continue with the short-term lodging activity. And there's about 16 active short-term lodging units. One caveat on this ordinance is that it imposes a four-night minimum for any short-term lodging bookings. The rest of the city is under an, a current emergency order, which is three nights. Newport Island, this is the, the ad hoc committee's recommendation, is for four nights. So that's just that ordinance, and I'll just move on to the, the, the ordinance for the evening. One thing that the um, committee wanted the council to understand and for the community too is to look at the number of short-term lodging permits from all other coastal cities. And I've shared this with the council before and you can see Newport Beach has about 1,500 active short-term lodging permit and the next highest um, to Newport is the city of Carlsbad with about 690 active short-term lodging permits. And so why are we here this evening? This is a really important table that our revenue division staff put together. This shows the number of parcels, number of properties that have an active short-term lodging permit. It is not the number of units, but the number of properties. And you can see back in 2011, we had a low point of about 660 properties had a permit. And since that time, it's grown to over 1,000 properties in Newport Beach that have actual, actual active short-term lodging permits. And that's a 60% increase. And the, the committee wants to share that with the council because that, that is why the committee was formed. This is exactly why they um, are making recommendations just for that 60% of increase of activity. Can I, can I just make a quick quick comment? Oh, yeah. Mr. Georges, you just made a comment about it's the number of permits but not the number of units, correct? Correct. This, is, this table is the number of properties. Properties, which means... We, it's, we haven't inventoried how many units are actually short-term rental units. That's correct. You could actually have maybe two or three units on one parcel, one property. Oh, so there could be significantly more than 1,500 re short-term rental units. The, no, but the, we have 1,500 that have been permitted, so we know that. This is the actual parcels. Okay, so, but there could be more permits uh, there's a potential. There's a potential for potential. Correct. Yes. There's a, a large potential for more, up yes. to ten thousand units. Yes, up to ten thousand. That's correct. Yes. The the committee wanted to take the ordinance, the recommendations, and parse it out into three different ordinances. So tonight is the phase one ordinance, and it has your emergency ordinance and uh, or the proposed recommended ordinance. The other phases, we're going to come back to the city council at a later time. Those are much more complicated. They require coastal commission approval. They require planning commission approval. So this evening, that's, this is the easiest ordinance that we've come together uh, and, and the, the uh, committee has recommended. We'll be back later with more recommendations, and I'll get to that at the end of the presentation here. What's in the presentation? Um, we've imposed some uh, recommend, recommended changes. One is that a permit number is required, a short-term lodging permit uh, number is required on all advertisements. 
Um, we do have an occupant load requirement, which is out of the building and fire codes. And the reason why we're making this recommendation, it's really to inform the property owner, the inform the applicant that's obtaining that short-term lodging permit, that there is an occup occupant load max for all units. Um, the agents in the hosting platforms, your Airbnb and VRBO, we're, we have been communicating th with them uh, all along, and there's going to be a, there's a requirement now that they cannot complete a booking for a non-compliant property. And a non-compliant property is, some, is a property that maybe they didn't, haven't paid their business tax, they haven't obtained a short-term lodging permit, or they're properly in the wrong zone. Um, there are new requirements for the property owner to post rules inside the unit, the contact information, 24 hours notice, no amplified sound, what's the sweet, uh, street sweeping schedule, which the trash schedules, where can the um, individual park, the tenant park, uh, and a, a, a good neighbor policy just to ensure tenants are respectful of their neighbors. Um, owners are to create a, a owner's response um, plan, so in a sense, that, I'm sorry, a nuisance response plan, in case they have bad tenants, what do they do next? We've had some issues with subletting. Um, we've had some corporations buy, uh, obtain a short-term lodging. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. We've had corporations enter into a long-term lease for properties, then they turn around and sublet that space or that dwelling unit to, for short-term lodging. We're, we're going to cut that out. A property owner can only directly let or rent to a tenant directly. There's no middle person. Uh, the committee wants to recommend a 21-year age limit. And for our finance department, they, they would like to see that we've closed any short-term lodging permits if they're not reporting any TOT for two consecutive years. The property owner can always come back and apply for a new short-term lodging permit. The, the TOT is going to be required to be remitted by the property owner for, um, for our hosting platforms. The finance director may request, may require that the platforms remit TOT in the future. Right now, that's not the request. That's not what staff is looking for. It's, we've been talking to other cities. It's much more complicated, but we just have that option in this proposed ordinance. Um, also, we are requesting that we want to be able to have access to the units with just a seven-day notice to the property owner. We've had complaints from a code enforcement standpoint where they're using a walk-in closet as a bedroom. You know, we need to get access into the units just to verify from a, from a code compliance standpoint that that's occurring. And so we've, we've put that in this um, proposed ordinance. With enforcement, um, we've changed the enforcement. Now it is, you, you may get suspended for um, two violations. In the past, it used to be four violations. They, the committee wanted to recommend kind of tighter um, requirements. So if you, have, if you violate the ordinance two times in a 12-month period, you can be suspended. If you violate the ordinance three times in a 12-month month period, you can be revoked. Um, and that goes through a hearing process. Um, we've changed the admin citation, the, the dollar amount for violations. If you receive a citation, it used to be starting at $250. The committee wanted to recommend to start $1,000. They wanted stronger teeth. People seem to be ignoring the $250. They wanted some teeth in the enforcement. Um, and the finance director is going to have authority. If someone's violating state or federal law, like for example, we've had um, an actual person be arrested for selling drugs out of a short-term lodging unit. So if they're ever convicted of, of violating that state law, the finance director is going to have a, some authority to suspend or revoke that permit. Um, resources, we've talked about resources in the past. So right now, staff is working on a 24-hour um, answering service. And this answering service is going to take those complaints that are occurring at any time of the day, especially in the evening hours. Our code enforcement staff is only working till 5.30 in the evening. We don't have nighttime code enforcement. We do have some code enforcement on the weekends. But this is really to address that immediate need, that immediate concern a neighbor has for a short-term lodging permit. Let's use an answering service. Staffing, we're not proposing any additional staffing at this time. Uh, what we'd like to see is just if the council wants to adopt this ordinance this evening, let's implement the ordinance, let's reassess our staffing needs, and we work with our city manager to see what is the staffing requirements for code enforcement. Um, all of this can be paid through permit fees, and once we implement the answering service, once we look at our staffing needs, we can go back and study our permit fees and make adjustments, maybe increase those permit fees so the short-term lodging can pay for any additional resources we need. 
Now, I'm almost wrapped up here. We did talk about breaking up the ordinance into phases. So this is just a preview of what we are working on um, that'll be coming to council later on. We are looking at to cap short-term lodging permit numbers. Um, we have that number about 1,500, we're looking to cap that. We are looking to require additional parking requirements, one parking space per unit. We're studying minimum night stays. Do we want to implement a three night minimum stay or even longer? Um, if you demolish a single family home that's grandfathered with short-term lodging permit, do you lose that permit, that right to rent out? Um, we're also studying, do we want a minimum distance between short-term lodging properties? And that's something that we're, we're looking, looking into. And finally, we're looking also that we have about 212 short-term lodging permits issued to single family homes in an R1 zone. Do we want to implement an abatement program? So this, this list in front of you is not on the agenda for tonight for consideration, but we just want to make sure that the council was aware of what we are working on and that we're, we'll, we'll come back in the future. For our staff's recommendations is to go ahead and find the, this item exempt from CEQA, adopt the emergency ordinance, and introduce uh, Ordinance 15. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, Mr. Avery. Uh, more of a statement than anything. Um, there's some really good operators of short-term rentals, and there are no problems when you have a good operator, especially they live on site. Um, and failing that, if they're just real clear with their tenants, and do the work that's involved with managing a, a good short-term rental. But on the other hand, the, we've heard the stories, there an awful lot of people in our city suffer through short-term rentals and it's not fair. And so if we're not gonna have a requirement to have the owners and operators actually live on the properties um, and then we need a robust system to, um, to basically identify and um, bring the bad operators to heel and to uh, go out there and find out, find the violations and, and cite people. So, um, and I know Simone, you mentioned that. So I just hope in the future, uh, given the, the, the revenue that's generated and that we can pass on these fees, um, I, I think failing, we've got so many of these operations and it's, it's great, uh, but we, if we're gonna have that many um, and we're generating that kind of money uh, and we could generate more if we have to. I just think we should really support our residents and at the very least have, a, you know, when someone calls at night because of some party, a, couple, a guy rolls, uh, you know, and um, they go out and they cite them and they, and, uh, and we just, and then we hammer them on, on again until they feel the pain until they realize they cannot disrupt neighbors. This is, you know, we can't have it. So um, I'll be looking for that, you know, and I hope we, we can get there to do whatever we need to have some kind of response team that can go out there, you know, obviously in the peak times and um, help us out. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? I'll just say thank you to the to the uh, sub subcommittee on this. This is um, there's a lot of work and this is a good, I guess we'll call it first phase, first phase. Um, so I, I don't have any comments at all about it. Ms. Dixon. Uh, just a couple of overall comments and then obviously we'll go out to public comments. Uh, is the number of meetings that you saw that the ad hoc committee held shows, uh, we rest, and with staff support, it's like, oh, we're gonna have another meeting. <laughs> uh, because we really wanted to dig deeply to protect our residents first and foremost, and to respect the businesses, the pro professionally managed companies that are in the business, longstanding companies in our community that are good operators. Uh, and so much of what we are looking at in terms of tonight's efforts as well as going forward the, uh, has the input of not only the residents but the professionally managed firms who are supportive of these changes because they're already implementing them on their own. Uh, when, when we had this item before us a few months ago and then Mayor Pro Tem asked how many violations there were, the fact, and this wasn't said at the time, the fact we don't have anything in our code to issue violations for, this will be the first time we have modified our municipal code to incorporate violations, uh, quality of life type violations. 
So isn't that right, Mr. Georges? There's never been anything to cite. So it's been very frustrating for residents who live adjacent to these uh, incidents in the middle of the night. Whom do they call? And why isn't anybody issuing a code violation? Well, there's no code violation. We really don't have any regulations with regards to short-term lodging, just maybe um, just noise, limited noise. And so this is why it's been very frustrating for the residents, because when they want the police, they want they want the police department to come out and do something, and there's really nothing, because there's been no code violation. But there have been complaints. Have you been able to tabulate the number of complaints? So to date, with, with for 20, uh, 2020, we have up to 130 complaints that we received just on the code enforcement side. This is not even counting how many complaints that the police department have received in the evening hours. So, and by the volume of letters we've all received in the last few weeks on this subject, uh, clearly there are issues related to quality of life. I just want to read some um, provisions in other cities, other coastal cities in California that have recently enacted new ordinances, uh, new uh, quality of life controls, because what has happened with the phenomena, this is, let me just back up. Newport Beach has a reputation to be a welcoming community, and the rental, uh, apartment rental, beach home uh, process has been longstanding. And it's only really been in the, ad with the advent, according to the volume of uh, the number of permits with the online platforms. That's when the problems really started to happen in our community because then it's just, it's proliferated. So here's some comments just to keep in mind as we consider what we're embarking on tonight and in the subsequent phases. Vacation rentals can have a detrimental impact on the character of residential neighborhoods by turning homes into de facto hostels or hotels by leading to excessive noise and safety concerns, and by monopolizing available parking. The city has a responsibility, responsibility to mitigate these impacts. Short-term rentals are effectively unsafe hotels, upsetting quiet residential neighborhoods with more traffic and persons who don't care about the neighborhood. They alter neighborhood character while introducing new safety risks and force neighborhoods and cities to bear the costs of the, their businesses. Hosts get the money and residents get the noise, traffic, and degradation of the neighborhood. And most important, importantly, it, finding to have negative, that out of control, short-term rentals have a negative impact on property values and that is something that is of major concern to all residents of Newport Beach. And we have found in our fact-finding and staff's fact-finding of other cities, that there are far more onerous regulations being imposed by other cities. For example, uh, limiting the total number of rental days per year that a short-term rental may uh, be permitted to rent. We're not going that far. Uh, also, the resident owner or the owner should be on premises. That's something that is intriguing to us. We may be looking at that, but that's very common in other cities. Uh, and also additional fees. We are not adding additional fees at this time. Uh, the city of Seal Beach uh, imposes additionally to the permit and to the business license a bond fee for, to cover the cost of code enforcement and police uh, responding to the incident reports. So there's, there's clearly a lot more we could do, but we're not, it's not on the table. I'm not, we're not recommending it, but uh, it's just, to let the community, let our residents know that we value their quality of life and, the, and we're here to protect our neighborhoods. We want the good operators to continue to be good operators. Uh, and we want everybody to be a good operator, but there are clearly some that who are not. So those are my comments for now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Mr. Herdman. Yeah, can I just add one thing to that? Um, <clears throat> There have been comments from people about us wanting to ban short-term rentals completely in the city. And um, we had, a, we had a, a Zoom meeting the other day with <laughs> short-term rental operators in a particular geographical area of our city the other day, encouraging us not to do that. <clears throat> we feel that by implementing the revisions to this code, having stiffer fines, being much more 
uh, consistent about enforcement, uh, that these units that are having such a negative impact on quality of life are basically going to eliminate themselves through the fine process, through the fine and, and, and enforcement process, and therefore make it not necessary for us to have to ban this industry from our city. Okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Seeing no further comments, we're going to go out to public comment now. So I suspect we've got a few folks ready. Um, so just remember, six feet of distance, and uh, you can go on ahead and line up if you'd like. And um, we'll, go, we'll start with the community room, so go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Jeff Boston from Seabreeze Vacation Rentals. Uh, we, we represent over 100 vacation rental units in the city. I uh, just want to get on record two separate things. First, that we do support three night minimums <clears throat> in all areas. So it's got to be uniform. There's no reason to carve out Newport Island and uh, have them be a four night minimum and everybody else have a three night minimum. It's not fair to Newport Island uh, properties. Parking spaces should be provided. Uh, we, we support the two person per bedroom plus two max occupancy, uh, exterior signage, and the industry standard of three violations per year suspends your permit. Uh, we do not support limits on number of permits as this would need a, this would obviously need coastal commission approval. Uh, listing the permit number on the listings is dangerous because looking up that permit number gives owners, uh, gives out owners personal information. So obviously we have privacy issues there. Um, then there's a lot of talk about the owner occupied rentals and how San Santa Monica was able to uh, get that passed and approved. Um, and, and even that city council member Dixon was talking about. Uh, but Newport Beach is not like Santa Monica. The reason Santa Monica was able to do that is they never allowed short-term rentals, unhosted short-term rentals. Uh, Newport Beach has allowed that. So it would be such a significant change. It would effectively ban 98% of the existing vacation rentals. 98% are not owner-occupied rentals. They're whole home rentals. Uh, so it'd be an effective ban on vacation rentals in Newport Beach if that were to pass later on. I know that's not in this part. Uh, so I just wanted to get two questions answered. Uh, would a cap on the number of permits constitute a change in use and require co coastal commission approval? And the same question about eliminating or banning 98% of existing rentals by enforcing a owner occupied rule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor, well, May Mayor uh, O'Neill and members of the City Council. My name is Debbie Stevens, and I'm president of the Corona Del Mar Residents Association. I do have a PowerPoint. Can I get those slides up? Yep, give us just a second. We'll uh, pause your time. Hey, Debbie, do you need five minutes instead of three? Um, probably not, but uh, I'll say yes just in case. I don't, right. I don't think I do. Th I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Yeah, but, and, sorry, um, sorry, just one second. The reason I ask, just so members of the public know why I'm asking that, um, uh, when, when an uh, organization as large as CDMRA is, it, we like to give them a little bit of extra time because they can speak on behalf of members, and then the members don't have to speak themselves to take up the additional three minutes. So I just... I want to make sure I'm pointing that out for people why I asked that specifically. So, okay. All right. Go ahead, Debbie. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your comments as well. Um, we were, after one of those um, town halls that Simone was talking about, we, we had a discussion um, with city staff as well as Councilwoman Woman Brenner, and we agreed to do a, a survey on, um, for them. And basically, the city staff put together the survey questions, and, and we ran the survey between March, about mid-March and the very first of, uh, of May, essentially the end of April. 
Um, and so that, that's the results that I have to present today. We went out to our residence, which there's about 700 members, and we got 311 responses. Most of these, and if you'll go to the first slide, please, you'll see that most of these are from Corona Del Mar. I mean, obviously, that's who we represent, and we have most of the um, emails went to that, that um, zip code. However, um, we, we did encourage others to send out the emails to other people in the, in the city. So there's more than just that. But again, 74% uh, were from Corona Del Mar. Um, this, this is a statistically significant survey because of the sample size and also because we had a very high number of, uh, very consistent on what the, what the um, answers to the questions were. So next slide, please. We asked the question, um, how many people were aware of the uh, short-term lodging um, ordinance before this survey? 66% said they were aware. 30% said they were not. Next slide, please. Should the city allow new short-term lodging permits? 76% of the respondents said no. 19% said yes. So large number there. Um, next slide. Should the city require the operator to provide at least one parking space at the property? 90% said yes. 6% said no. Next slide. Should the city cap the short-term lo lodging permits or the number of permits? 82% said yes. 14% said no. Next slide, please. Should the city allow the permit transfer to transfer to a new owner when the, pro the property is sold? 68% said no. 24% said yes. I'm just not reading the no opinion parts of this. Um, should, should the city place a cap on the occupancy of two persons per bedroom plus an extra two? 96% said yes, 2% said no. Next slide. Um, should the city require that the rental be a minimum of three consecutive days? 75% said yes, 14% said no. And then the final slide. Should the city decrease the number of short-term lodging permits whenever possible? 72% said yes, 22% said no. So we just want to present this, this information to the city. It's clear that the residents are favoring additional restrictions on short-term lodging. Some of this is not what you're considering today, but I think it's, it provides a, a good information for you to, to take action in, today and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Dennis Baker. I'm the treasurer of Spawn. And I am first just a personal comment that I compliment you on taking this in phases. I think that's a very good idea instead of trying to chunk everything into one pile and, and dealing with it that way. So compliments on that. Um, at our April board meeting of Spawn, um, it was a resolution was passed supporting the city's efforts regarding short-term rentals. I quote the resolution, Spawn supports efforts to control and mitigate the negative impacts of short-term rentals on the quality of life in Newport Beach. In support of the city's efforts, the Spawn board member Nancy Alston did extensive research on this issue uh, with the backing of Spawn and the encouragement of Spawn and she is gonna be following me up and uh, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm Nancy Alston and I'm a board member of SPAWN. Uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, through a council member, I sent uh, some research on suggestions for regulations uh, for short-term rentals. Um, before I start in on this presentation I was going to make, I do want to make one uh, explanation for the list that uh, the development uh, committee um, department, uh, where you saw the um, number of rentals in each city. Um, some of those are short-term rentals like we have, and some of them are only hosted 
the person who owns the house or the apartment or the unit has to be there. Um, for example, Los Angeles in 2019 passed a new ordinance and you can rent your place for 90 days, but it is a hosted um, situation. You can get an extension of 120 days, but there's a lot of uh, steps you have to go through to get that. Santa Monica, which has already been mentioned, really has a tough um, regulation. You, it has to be hosted. The person has to reside. And they were taken to court by uh, Airbnb and HomeAway. And in late 2019, the Ninth Court of uh, Circuit Court, um, Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit uh, reaffirmed uh, and rejected Airbnb's claim. So Santa Monica's tough regulation stands. Another correction to that list, Huntington Beach, even though they have uh, some uh, short-term rentals, all of them all of them are hosted. Um, any others are forbidden uh, and uh, fines are given if you violate that. So it used to be that someone owned a home and maybe they wanted to rent a room or part of their house or they wanted to take a trip and in Newport Beach, where we encourage visitors, and we like for visitors to come, and we have wonderful beaches and harbors, uh, it was a nice balance. And then what happened? Well, in 2007, Airbnb happened. And, for a and Airb Airbnb went from three people in... It's okay, th if you could quickly... Okay, three way. people in um, 2007 to 500 million check-ins um, this last year. Now, do I get five minutes because I'm representing an organization? I think Dennis was also saying he was representing the same organization, oh. but it's okay, okay. If, you, if you get another 30 seconds. I, I, okay, um, I wanna address one thing that no one else has addressed since, um, but I have a lot more. And that is what happens when it takes over your supply of long-term housing. And that is what happens. It happened in LA. Um, a Mr. Lee who wrote for the Harvard Law Review explored that situation um, and wrote a paper on it for the Harvard Law Review and determine that what happens is the um, person who has a long-term rental decides, well, if I rent uh, these, this unit out for one or two nights, I can make a lot more money. So in fact, the S STLs, what they do is they diminish our housing supply. And what has happened in California is Newport Beach is under a mandate to come up with 40, over 4,800 uh, units or dwellings in, I think, 10 years. And yet, we're being, our housing supply is being diminished. And then there's lots of other reasons having to do with fire and safety, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I am Rod Adams, and I'm here with my business partner, Meg, Megan Cooper, who will speak as well. But um, we own a short-term rental on Newport Island, and we actually use the management company Jeff spoke op op earlier, uh, Seabreeze. And like him, we think the restrictions that are being discussed make a lot of sense. Parking, occupancy, I, and like the council member said earlier, I think it makes a ton of sense to figure out how we address nuisances when they happen. 
Um, the one thing we do have an issue with and do appreciate the change from a Newport Island perspective from, I think it was 2020-003 um, to 2020-006, um, we appreciate that that is a, l a little bit of an improvement, but I'm still struggling immensely with how Newport Island could be singled out. I haven't heard why, any specifics on why it would be four nights there instead of three nights like the rest of Newport City. Megan. Okay, thank you, um, Mayor O'Neill and the council members for your time. Um, I'm Megan Cooper, I live in Newport Beach and I work as an HR executive in Irvine. Um, I know that you've heard a lot from Newport Island specifically, which is probably why we're being singled out, um, and a lot about the respectfulness of families, et cetera. So I just wanna tell a quick personal story. Um, after I lost my parents eight years ago, my best friends, Maggie and Rod, um, they became my family. We've been friends for 25 years. I taught their daughters, Kayla and Sienna, to surf at Blackie's. Um, I've flown to Chicago to watch their dance recitals. Uh, Maggie and Rod were among the first folks to visit me when I got moved out to Singapore for a short-term assignment. Um, and we've had some of the most memorable Thanksgivings you can ever imagine. Mm. So uh, needless to say, we're a family, even if ours might look different than those that you're hearing from on Newport Island. So last year, on one of their visits to me, um, we were sitting on the beach and we were researching the law on short-term rentals in Newport Beach and we decided after a lot of talk to buy a two and a half million dollar home on Newport Island. I live in the back unit and the front unit was meant for Maggie and Rod and their family to visit like they are right now um, and we would short-term rental it out in the off time. Um, now this is our home, this is our neighborhood, this is our family. We use Seabreeze, like Jeff just mentioned. He has strict ordinances on noise, occupancy, parking. We follow those. I don't think we've ever had a call on us, ever. Um, and that's why we pick them. We pay taxes. We're respectful neighbors. Um, and we, res uh, we support these responsible restrictions for our unit, but also for all of Newport Beach. But efforts have been made to single out our small community and thus our little family. And, and that's just, it's not right and it's not fair. It's put us in a very difficult position to cover our mortgage um, while we haven't been able to rent out our place. And in fact, we actually filed for a Newport Beach grant because we've been empty for about four months. So respectfully, just to conclude, we're not asking for any special treatment. We just want to be treated like the rest of Newport Beach and we deserve to be treated like the rest of our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, members of the council, um, my name is Larry Leifer. I live on Newport Island. I've been a 31-year resident there. And I'd like to tell you some things about uh, my experience. I feel that the presence of short-term rentals is analogous to the COVID-19 pandemic we're fighting. It's equivalent to growing, a growing infection in our neighborhoods that is foreign to the quiet enjoyment we should expect in our homes and neighborhoods. Short-term rentals introduce a commercial element that lacks acceptance by neighbor, neighbors and is equivalent to creating mini motel lodging, but without the presence of management to oversee the short-term occupants. Commercial properties are only licensed if they meet building codes, have adequate parking, and can handle the transient traffic of lodgers moving in and out. In the event of an on-site tenant problem, commercial owners have on-site management and security procedures before relying on city resources such as law enforcement. The property owners of short-term lodging, especially those owners who are absentee, have found a means of materially increasing the profitability of their property by short-term occupancy. In the event of tenant problems, there is typically no owner present, present and the burden of ameliorating disturbances is incumbent upon the neighbors and city resources and law enforcement. Newport Island is a very compact, bridge-limited access island that is completely, a completely residential neighborhood, predominantly owner-occupied. The impact of short-term lodging permitting has been a nightmare and has proven to be incompatible to what our residents should have to tolerate. In the absence of a means to totally eliminate short-term lodging on our island, there should be a requirement that an owner of such lodging should be present on the property, that the minimum rental should be one week or more, 
that any tenant occupant vehicles have on-site parking, that the property is inspected periodically to be sure it complies with city licensing, and short penalties are imposed for violations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council. Thanks for your time. We appreciate you addressing this. Um, my name is Mike Ivey. I live at uh, 3801 Marcus. I'm that little gray house as soon as you come over the bridge. My wife knows me as the uh, welcoming guy because I'm always sitting out on the patio these days and every neighbor feels uh, the freedom to say hello as they walk over the bridge. Um, I love it. It is. It's, uh, it's great. And it's a lot of fun and we enjoy the community as a whole. I am for the short-term rental. Uh, we have never rented the home, but it is our goal to do so. We purchase it as an investment to rent it to, to obviously su uh, supplement retirement as we get a little older. We don't feel that Newport Island is any different than any other island. It, to me, it's the same as Balboa Island. It has the same density. It has the same lot sizes. It has a parking issue like they all do. Uh, it's nothing special in Newport Beach. Uh, it's in Newport Beach and we love it for that reason. I jumped off that bridge when I was 10 years old. Uh, there has been rentals going on ever since I can remember. And it's part of the reason we chose to purchase there. So what we're really looking at is why is Newport Island being soloed out? Why are we being soloed out while the rest of the short-term rentals are not? We are being segregated from everybody else and we are being limited to the rental opportunity that exists. And I feel like there's an underlying motive amongst the residents who are on the island to get all of the uh, short-term rentals banned on the island. And the reason I say this is because there seems to be a lot of fabrication of stories, a lot of fabrication and lies, exaggerations um, uh, to try to build their case. A lot of it comes out in the Daily Pilot because uh, I seem to be the star of the thing. Um, and on, what was it, March 1st, it's the duplex is used as a vacation rental, the midweek sunrise rooftop revelry, the vomit in the street, the guy with the video camera filming all the women barely their apparel. Well, apparently that's me. Uh, I've never rented that home, but apparently I'm the guy that everyone's pointing at and I'm getting tired of being cussed out by the people who live on the island thinking that I'm the culprit. We're not bad people. We're not. Uh, we want to have a great rental investment property. That is our goal. We didn't buy a two and a half million dollar hostel. I represent a lot of people who are very honest, good, hardworking people who want an honest family to come in and enjoy Newport Beach as a family rental home. We don't want 20 kids. We don't want kegerators. It is not what we're looking for. I love the ordinances that you've put into place. The PowerPoint slide that you have, I think we should share. But help us just be equal renters as everyone else is in Newport Beach. We're not asking for anything special. We just want to be treated fairly. So I want to thank the council for their time. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Jim Miller. Uh, you pretty much know what you're going to hear this evening. You're going to hear short-term rental people tell you how wonderful they are, and they very well may be, and how problems are caused by everyone else. Then uh, you'll hear comments like this one by residents who live in our community. And by the way, um, on Newport Island, I know of good Christians who've been sworn at by, uh, when they were asked to quiet down by uh, people you don't wanna mess with. I've personally been woken up my wife in the middle of the night by a girl getting beat up a couple houses down from me. Uh, been woken up by people cussing and swearing. That's not the way it used to be. When we moved on Newport Island, it was a very quiet place. It's just recently when Airbnb uh, came into fruition that uh, these kinds of things started to occur. In fact, when Airbnb started, they simply wanted uh, 
people like me, and I've used Airbnb, to have the experience of staying in a home with other people. And it's a wonderful experience when that happens. It's not a wonderful experience when uh, people are rented out for uh, parties. In any event, this is one, one of the uh, comments I received. Uh, I, I did a survey with WNBA. Welcome to hell. I begrudgingly became an expert on vacation rentals six years ago is when I found myself living in th three foot away from a hotel. Not a real one, but a revolving door of yahoos, yo-yos in La La Land, using drugs and too much alcohol. Bachelor and grad parties destroyed the peace and quiet of our neighborhood, asking drunk strangers with prison tats to keep their noise levels down is too dangerous. Cities don't need to requisition any lengthy studies. Just spend a miserable, sleepless night next door to a vacation rental where there's a frat party as they barf and bark, barf into your flowers after playing drinking games, and you'll know all you need to know. It is with good reason that communities like Santa Monica, Redondo, Manhattan, Rolling Hills have banned short-term rentals. Nobody wants to live by drunks yelling, swearing, and fighting. I have rental property. I could make a lot more money renting it out to short-term rentals. I don't. And a number of uh, people on the survey feel the same way. They have rental properties, and they wouldn't do that to their neighbors. In New Orleans, almost half the neighborhood has moved out because of short-term rentals. They call it a ghost town now. I know residents speaking tonight whose wives want to sell their homes if the owner-occupied resolution is not adopted for Newport Island. City councils up and down our coast and across the U.S. are stopping their communities from being destroyed. Uh, I guess my time's up. And, uh, thank you for being so patient, and uh, I'm sure you'll hear a lot of other people who uh, ran out to uh, their homes uh, in a peaceful, and they do good uh, screening of the residents, but unfortunately not everybody does that. It's making it very life, very right. tough for people who uh, moved on because they had a quiet neighborhood when they bought into the place. Thank All you. right, thank you very much. We'll go to the next speaker, please. Uh, good evening, members of the council. Uh, my name is Lori Bowman. Uh, I'm speaking in support of lifting the ban on short-term lodging. Uh, the home I currently own on Newport Island has been in my family for over 80 years. I currently own the property with my siblings and we often use the home for family vacations and get-togethers with relatives and friends. We also occasionally rent the house on a short-term basis and we rely on the rental income to help with the cost of home maintenance, repair, and other property-related property, property related expenses. We are responsible renters and do not rent to tenants who cause dis disturbances or damage property. We understand the need to temporarily ban short-term rentals during the COVID pandemic, but feel it's extremely unfair and inequitable to lift the ban, the short-term lodging ban in Newport, in Newport Beach with the exception of Newport Island. The reasons given for keeping the ban in effect on the island, parking problems, density of homes, narrow streets, disturbances by short-term renters, are the same problems that all the other areas in Newport Beach have experienced with short-term lodging. We are amenable to the need to put additional restrictions in place, but don't see the reasoning or fairness in banning short-term lodging on Newport Island altogether. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Sandy Pearson. I would like to tell you my experience for the past 30 days of what it is like living next door to short-term leased property. While stay-at-home order was in place, next door had huge parties with no social distancing practices. This is especially scary for us because one of our family member has an existing autoimmune disease. A few days after that, home was raided by over a dozen police officers with bulletproof vests, guns drawn, search warrants at hand, and tenants were arrested that day. Week, then the next week, a weekly tenant came in and sat in their patio drinking and talking until past 1 a.m. seven nights in a row. 
Even though they did not play loud music, the later it got, the more alcohol they consumed, the noise level got higher, such that we were not able to sleep. Week after that, three families rented the home for five days. Each day, I counted over 30 teenagers at the house partying, and that is not even counting all the adults that was there as well. I could provide pictures of all these accounts. This brings me to today. Um, I'm asking the city council to adopt and implement some regulations that will help control the problem that the short-term lease home causes. First, please decrease the occupancy. I believe that more than 10 people in that home is harmful for us. Um, two, change the minimum stay to one month would definitely alleviate the most, if not all, the problems and aggravations that are caused by short-term lease. I would love to see our enforcement officers step up and actively enforce our existing regulations. It is very difficult to have any code enforcement officer actually give citation due to they must see the event happening while they are present. The problem is by the time we call in the violation, it takes a day to get hold of our officers since they are usually out on the fields. The code enforcement officer should give citations and fines by the pictures provided by the citizen that, are, that reports the problem. The fine is to be punitive. The home next to me rents for $13,000 per week. A mere 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 fine is not a deterrent for them. Um, it also, uh, fines goes to the tenants, not to the owner, as far as I, I was told. Uh, to get the attention of the homeowner, an initial fine should not be less than $5,000 or at least 25% of their weekly rent, and a repeat offense should be at least equal to one week rent or $10,000. All penalties should be assigned to the address, not just the current short-term tenants. If the fines grows with the property and they are cumulative, the owners of the property will have the incentive to rent to a more responsible tenants. Newport Beach police should be more willing to give out citation. Each time we call, the police officer do what they do well, defuse the situation and ask the tenants to go inside without giving them a written warning. Um, next day, we call again. Then a different officer comes out without knowing prior officer was out for the same reason the night before. <coughs> then, may I finish? Very, very quickly. Okay, the new officer again defuse the situation without writing them a citation. If the citations were written each time, then the homeowner would be more responsive, especially if they were fine. Please realize when we call the authority, we are desperate and it does cause a hostile situation and the renters retaliate next day and it is not a safe situation for us as a resident. All right, but, I, I need you to finish up, please. Okay. Um, Lastly, I believe the property management company needs to be fined as well. When a management company is called, their reply is, you, should, you chose to live here, therefore you must deal with it. If they are made accountable, then they will be more careful to whom they rent the property out to, especially since the property management company shields the homeowners of most issues. Um, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening, council members, and uh, thank you for all you do, especially tonight. <laughs> um, my name is Gary Cruz. I'm uh, from Newport Island, and um, I've, uh, my, have, I have a piece of property that my parents have owned since the mid-70s. They rented it out some. I've been in that property since 1986, um, and I've seen a lot of changes over that time. We rented our property out for, for a few years and we never had any problems. My neighbor next door rented out her property and we had some problems that ended the moment she moved into the property. So I'm a firm believer that people living on, the, if the owner lives on the property, that a lot of problems are, are resolved. Um, I'm also a little, uh, I don't understand that why there were no codes enforced, I think I heard earlier that there were no codes. And I was always under the impression that if there was a violation, that the police find the homeowner and the tenant. And that answer, if there was no, none of that going on, that kind of answers one of the questions that I had was, how can a piece of property be, have police there twice in a night 
in the same night and then come back again and have to come back three or four times in a week. So maybe our problems will be solved if the codes are enforced. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've, I've been in the Newport Beach area for a long time. I know we have this area called the war zone. That's nothing to be proud of. And if Newport Island is becoming a war zone, again, that's what we're trying to stop. So I've heard a few people say, well, why Newport Island? Well, from what I, my, my understanding is, is that our percentage per square feet of short-term rentals is higher than other locations. We have a very small island, and I don't know how many short-term rentals we have in there, but I think I've heard the number 18. And uh, Mark, what do we have, 85 properties on the island? So we have a high percentage of short-term rentals on the island, so we just don't want to become the war zone. Um, I think the problem lies in enforcing rules that are in place. We have a bridge that kids are jumping off of time after time after time. And I understand the police come in and they move them off and they advise them. That sort of indicates that behavior is okay if we don't catch you. And it's kind of the same thing with the rental properties. If they're partying and the police come in and say, don't party anymore, then they come back two hours later and they have to do it again, you're kind of approving bad behavior. And again, that's what I think we're trying to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, council members, hello. Thank you for having me and uh, everybody here. I, um, my name is Thomas Horton. I do live on Newport Island. Uh, I grew up in, uh, I'm from San Diego, but I grew up in uh, Newport. Uh, in college, I put myself through uh, college by working for a New, uh, Newport Pier Realty, a uh, uh, nine-month and uh, weekly rental uh, management company. Uh, I had my license, uh, managed all those short-term rentals in Newport. It's a great revenue um, generator, and I'm behind that 100%. I actually have my broker's license in California. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting how folks think that Newport Island is not different. I bought on Newport Island about three and a half years ago. Some of my neighbors are here. Um, it was a very different place, and it's worse than the peninsula now. Why? Because... Newport Island is a unique triangle with about 12 corners. And what we have for two-way streets are one-way streets on the peninsula. Um, we've got 18 out of 100 uh, licenses. I don't know where all those licenses came from in the last three and a half years since I moved there. Um, and it's not just that. The peninsula can handle that. We've got one ingress, the... Uh, the bridge that you li live next to, sir. Um, and, and you don't see what we see. I can barely get off the island most of the time, on or off, okay? When, when, when there are, uh, when people are renting short term, they come down, all their friends come. And they, even if there's not parking enough for them, they're looking for parking. And they're, they're stopped, and they're breaking the law on parking. Um, this island is, the, the way it's shaped and the way you get get around, I mean, I've seen so many emergency vehicles not, not being able to get to where they need to. Um, we've got a lot of older folks on the island as well. Um, it is, it's, it's a bad place and it's a liability uh, to have a lot of short-term rentals. And I love what the city's doing. You're kind of coming forward uh, why, with what a lot of other cities are doing to retain the quality of life. Um, and I'm glad you're doing that in a phased approach. Uh, it makes sense, uh, but uh, the Newport Island is extremely different, and it, it's it's a, it's basically an emergency liability um, for the city. Um, if you go there, it's super obvious. Okay, so thank you for uh, listening to me. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, this is Jim Mosher again. This agenda item involves two ordinances. I regard the adoption of ordinances as being a significant and weighty responsibility on you. 
that needs to be handled directly and correctly. Uh, in the director's presentation, his final slide said he was recommending that you introduce the ordinances with edits. It said in parentheses, I have not seen what those edits are. And I think I and the public need to know what ordinance you are introducing. I looked in the lobby, I could not find that. As to the second so-called emergency ordinance, as you know, ordinances normally need to be introduced at one meeting, adopted at a later meeting, and then go into effect 30 days later. An emergency ordinance is different. It lets you enact new rules by introducing, adopting, and having them go into effect immediately in a single vote. That extraordinary power is supposed to be exercised only when that enactment is necessary to protect the public peace, safety, or health. I do not believe this so-called emergency ordinance is an emergency ordinance. If you adopt it as such, you have to approve section one on page 1946, which says the city council declares that this ordinance which is an ordinance re-allowing short-term lodging on Newport Island is necessary to help limit the spread of COVID-19. And then it goes on to explain that those short-term lodgings which we'll be approving are interwoven in such a way as they will lead to the spread of COVID-19. This is not an emergency ordinance needed to prevent the spread this makes no sense at all. This is a normal ordinance. It needs to be introduced tonight. It needs to come back for a second reading, and then it becomes effective 30 days after that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, the, the edits that um, were being referenced were actually written by Mr. Mosier. So um, I'm going to have Mr. Harp reference that afterward, but he's, Mr. Harp is taking into account some of the comments that Mr. Mosier made and will be made and is recommending edits based on Mr. Mosier's comments. So we'll bring that back. All right, go ahead. Next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Craig Valley, and I'd like to make a couple of general comments regarding short-term lodging. Uh, first of all, the, but the uh, Peninsula and Balboa Island have been having, ha they've had short-term rentals for basically 100 years. And the, um, <laughs> the makeup of the Peninsula is about 65% rental, and it accommodates, and, and, and uh, short-term rentals kind of fit in that neighborhood, whereas Newport Island and Newport Shores are more residential. They don't, quite frankly, um, accommodate short-term rentals that much. And I, I refuse to, to operate a, a, a short-term rental on those places. I'm, st I'm in favor of stricter enforcement. And I think one of the, the key elements would be an understanding of uh, what a relationship is between a guest and a proprietor relationship like a hotel, which is what short-term lodging is. Uh, in a landlord-tenant relationship, there are certain restrictions, but in a proprietary guest relationship, a guest can be evicted immediately if they violate their contract. And I think one of the key to, uh, to this whole problem here is to have a contract that's required by short-term lodging permit holders that enables them to evict a guest if they do not uh, 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 follow certain rules. And if the proprietor, if the owner of that property does not abide by eviction, and when they break the rules, then uh, that needs to be dealt with, I think, in, in some sort of a, a fine type basis. Now, I've lived on the peninsula in the past for 14 years. I had vacation rentals on both sides of me. I'm very familiar with all the issues that, that take place on this. So I'm in favor of, of uh, stricter enforcement. Um, now, the typical profile of a vacation guest are families. That's why the uh, category has expanded. So so much in the last several years. It accommodates families. Singles, uh, graduate parties, brat parties, that shouldn't be a, really uh, a, a category for short-term rentals. Families, mom, dad, kids, grandpa, is perfect. Uh, we've had places in some of the things I, some of the places I read where uh, the kids that have been going to the same place for 10 years, they think their parents own their rental and the neighbors all get along. And that's really a more typical profile. 
I think the problem is not short-term lodging. The, the, uh, the, it, okay, that's not really the problem. The solution is stricter enforcement. And I think if uh, certain regulations are passed, particularly uh, wherein the owners are required to evict somebody right away if they violate the rules, that would go a long ways. So to have someone sit there and, and party all night and all that, they can be evicted uh, immediately. I think that's going to be part. Of, I need to, that needs to be part of the uh, restrictions going forward. All yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Council Mayor O'Neill, Council members. Uh, my name is Max Johnson, and I'm a 25-year resident of Newport Beach, and I currently reside uh, in the Peninsula Point community. Um, you know, living in District 1 on the Peninsula, obviously, we're the mecca for short-term lodging. Uh, as Greg said earlier, you know, we have the most short-term rentals uh, out of anywhere in the city. And I can just say, not even if I were to, if I didn't reside on the Peninsula, just the fact that in the last 10 to 15 years, the dynamic of living in the city has drastically changed. And, you know, we are considered the mecca for short-term lodging out of any other coastal city, uh, I would say, in Southern California. And I think that it has gotten out of hand. I think that it's time that these restrictions are put in place. Um, I'm also in favor of stricter enforcement. And I would also say I think that the proposed fines that the ad hoc committee uh, in conjunction with uh, Simone, uh, what they're proposing, I think that they should start even higher. I think that the first violation should be at $2,000 versus $1,000. Um, but just kind of coming back to my point, um, I'm in favor of taking this in phases. I think that's really wise. Uh, I think it allows the residents, for those who are not uh, in tune with what's going on or maybe catching up with what's being proposed, they can come back uh, and continue to be a part of this discussion. Um, I appreciate the council for taking this time as well as the ad hoc committee and Simone. I think Simone and staff have done a, a really great job in uh, doing this. And I would also say Nancy, Alston, who I serve with on the board of Spawn, uh, took quite a lot of time um, looking into this as well. So again, um, I would also say I speak for, I would say, a majority of my neighbors, Peninsula Point. We really um, have seen a drastic difference um, in the quality of life on the peninsula, especially coming past Palm Street, where you get a lot of those college grads and high school students, people that want to party kind of on that stretch. and two blocks that is just, you know, I would say it's part of the war zone or it's another war zone in itself. And the most recent story I have is just a week ago on one of my evening runs, a young man who was high on narcotics um, was throwing furniture at neighbors on either side of him who he was renting this property uh, with other young men that were also doing drugs um, and ended up being naked and uh, was out in the street when officers arrived and he was so high up on adrenaline tackled, uh, actually, I would say the first responding officer um, couldn't subdue him. After seven more units arrived, they were able to subdue him, and then paramedics and you know, the fire department were able to take him to Hope before, I'm sure, being hauled off to jail. But um, that just incident you know, is, I don't think, something that any neighborhood, yet alone you know, families with young kids, which happened, the amount of young, you know, family members that were out during the citizen just trying to have, ex you know, this, okay. what was going on, explain to them was just an interesting experience. So anyway, I thank you for your time. I'm in favor of what's being proposed and uh, would really like this um, to be taken in the phases. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker, please. Uh, my name's uh, Joe Bowerbank. I been a resident of Newport Island for about 10 years here now. Lived there with my wife and six-year-old son, Mason. I can tell you that I'm pretty much going to reiterate what a lot of people have said here tonight, and that is that things have changed on the island, at least since I moved there 10 years ago. When we moved there um, with my wife, planning to have our son, 
It was family oriented, it was safe, it was community based, it was a lot different than it is right now. And I think that when we moved there, if memory serves, I think you had to have 30 days if you were gonna rent out your place, which was of high interest to my wife and I because you don't have those short-term rentals. Well, that changed. So let's fast forward today. Um, I live on Marcus Avenue. It's one of the more well-traveled streets throughout Newport Island. I've seen it all. I got cameras throughout my house. I've seen vomit, I've seen body parts, I've seen things that I didn't see when I was there uh, and I moved there in 2010. So it has changed. Um, the people that do operate uh, short-term rentals uh, for the most part are cognizant and, and uh, respectful in terms of who they rent to. We have one a few doors down and, and those people are pretty good at vetting who, who comes in, who goes out. However, there's another handful of people that do not do that, and that is the problem. I don't want to explain to my kid, my six-year-old, why there's vomit in the street, why there's cigarette butts all over the place, why there's broken beer bottles. We had one incident two summers ago, and it was the summer of hell. It was frat party after birthday party, after this party, after that party, after that party. It became so much that we hit the pause button on buying on Newport Island, okay? So we've been kind of waiting and seeing, and I would approach my existing landlord multiple times to buy that property. Well, they asked me if I wanted to buy it a couple months ago, and I said, not at this time, pass. Why? Because the dynamic has changed. So that being said, there's got to be some sort of a balance if you are to have STRs on Newport Island, how those people that come and enjoy Newport Island are able to do so in the confines and the just be respectful guys there's a lot of people that aren't and I gotta tell you thank you for this meeting because I'm gonna wait and see in terms of whether I buy a Newport Island and raise my son there because what I'm seeing right now it ain't gonna happen that's it thank you thank you next speaker please Good evening. Uh, I am the uh, president of the Newport Island uh, Community Association, and I want to thank uh, City Council and the Mayor for this time and for addressing this situation with short-term rentals on Newport Island. We did uh, put a survey, and I sent in some slides. I don't know if you have them, but if we, if we don't, I'll just read the questions. Um, our hope is to find a solution for the situation that has become a growing concern to our Newport Island residents. Um, our association's been around since 1952 in one form or another to represent the re residents of the island as a sounding board for important issues that affect our community and help maintain the quality of life on our island. And uh, lately things have been become very heated between the residents and the short-term rental owners. Because of this, we did perform this survey to help us better understand the residents and how they feel about uh, the island and living among the STRs situated close to their homes. We got a lot of responses and it's a meaningful represent representation of the island and the community and how, and how they feel about the STR issue. So do we have those? I see it over there, but I don't see it here. Survey, that's all right. Newport Island has always been a very special place, a place of community, of families, island get-togethers, a place completely separated from the peninsula and the 100 block, a quiet place that has always been a residential community. There is some homeowners, rental, rental homeowners, that have done a wonderful job managing their properties and ensuring their tenants are vetted uh, and that their premises are dealt with when anything gets out of control. Those who live on the premises are there to see things go smoothly and they do a great job. But this is unfortunately not, not the case for majority of the island's short-term rental owners, leaving the rent residents to deal with the ongoing nightmare. At some point, there was a change in zoning, and when all this happens, the floodgates open for short-term rental permits, causing a whole new set of problems that nobody saw coming. There's been a huge spike just in the last 18 months, from four to 16, 17, or 18. We haven't even seen the re repercussions of what our island would look like if all of these short-term rentals were packed full of transient guests and their friends. 
The only reason this hasn't happened is due to the temporary ban during the COVID crisis, and we don't want to know what it looks like. We already had enough congestion and problems when, when there was only a portion of these rent rentals were being operated. Uh, and I'll talk about the survey. So our residential status is uh, mostly uh, homeowners, uh, multi-generational, been there for 10, 20 years. Uh, there are renters and they've been there a long time, even up to 30 years. So um, we definitely have a, a long-term status there. Do you have another uh, slide? How frequently do, do we use the park? The majority of our residents use the park. It's a place where they congregate. It's, it's where they, we do our Easter egg hunts, our potlucks, our 4th of July celebrations. It's where the kids play, the pic, where we have picnics and barbecues, and it's where our communities gather. Uh, our, our, we did a survey on- please, on please finish up quickly. Did I get five minutes? No. Can I get five minutes? No. No? No. So I'm you, the homeowner's you've, you've association. Had, you've, had a, you've had a number of people speaking on for the exact same issue, that there's a difference. So the answer is no. Wow, okay, that's wonderful, okay. Sir, I need some respect tonight. We've still got a number of speakers on this exact same topic, on the exact same issue that oh. you're speaking to. So I, <laughs> I'd, I'd appreciate just a little bit of respect while we're working this through, wow. so. Absolutely, all right, well, I'll just go ahead and finish up. I just, uh, Thank you. We just, we just really wanna get uh, things cleaned up on our island, so we really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, we have eight, eight callers. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, let me see if I can, is there an echo? Or? It sounds like there is, but we, we, don't, we don't hear it, so go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to say hello, uh, and my name is Lucy Wyatt. I'm a resident of Newport Island, and I wanted to speak to you today relating to short-term rentals on our island. Um, as you've heard from many residents already, um, this issue really is the safety and quality of life issue for our neighborhood. Um, the explosion of permits that have been issued in the past couple of years has resulted in, I think, 17 or more um, short-term rentals on our small island of approximately like 109 homes. Um, this influx of short-term rentals has created um, parking issues and traffic hazards. Um, cars driving on the side of street, speeding, um, running stop signs, um, which has really impacted the state. Um, community, and it's the children in our neighborhood um, that enjoy riding their bikes and skateboards, um, accessing the beautiful park. Um, our, our streets on our, in our neighborhood um, are really narrow, and they often require cars to travel um, one at a time on the get from one end of the island to the other. You know, unfamiliar weekend renters um, often speed down the street, creating a really serious safety issue. Um, watch fire engines trying to access the island, and it's really in terms of space. Um, couple with loud parties, fireworks, shopping carts in the alleys, trash thrown in the street, broken bottles on the sidewalk. Um, we really need consideration given to the impact these short-term rentals are having on our island. Um, we're just a small residential island. Um, the influx of these short-term rentals created really unsafe and balanced in our neighborhood. Um, I ask you to work on this issue and explore additional means to protect to protect the needs of our safety and our our residents. Um, capping the number of short-term rental uh, geographic areas is our island. Seems like reasonable measure to consider along with some of the other suggestions I know have been explored. Um, I want to let him speak on this today. Um, I want to thank you all for your service to our community. And I also want to thank council members Dixon, Herdman, their response to my questions via email. I really appreciate it. 
And all that's right. all. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next speaker. All right, then. thank you. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. So you, you need to mute you need to mute what we're listening to. Okay. So please mute what you're listening to and then speak. And I also want to thank council members Dixon, Ferguson, there, there we go. Like they see it. Really appreciate it. She's so hello. Hi, yeah, I need you to mute what you're listening to, then speak. Yes, can you can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Don Abrams. I'm a uh, broker and resident of Balboa Island. Uh, my company manages about 40 uh, vacation rentals. We rent to families. Uh, uh, like Craig Batley, I agree with most of the new restrictions, but not all. Uh, I guess before I started, I wanted to thank you all for your patience. You've, you've listened to many of these presentations tonight and in the past, and I appreciate all, all your effort. Uh, one thing I was wondering about tonight is why there was no notice to me or other realtors or interested, people interested in vacation rentals. I, I've worked with the ad hoc committee this year, and I only was notified by my real estate board but, but I think you would have seen many more people speaking on the subject if, if we'd been notified. I know some of the couple people notified their constituents, and obviously the people from Newport Island were notified. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to vacation rentals, and I'm wondering why we've had to have so many, why this is such a boogeyman subject for the uh, uh, so out there only thousand homes out of 75,000 or however many homes we have in Newport Beach. And the number has grown from 700 to 1,000 in seven years, not a huge increase. Uh, I think oftentimes people make complaints to the city about vacation rentals that are not true. I'll give you an example. On Memorial Night Day evening, I was called by a lady who wanted to remain anonymous complaining about my vacation rental in the North Bay. I asked her for details and couldn't give me too many, but she said there were 10 or 15 people in our vacation rental and they were making noise in the alley, running remote control cars, hearing her up. They made a mess on the beach. So this was at 10 o'clock at night. I called my rental manager, asked her to investigate. She called the, our nice tenant who was staying in the house, uh, two parents with children two and five. And of course it wasn't them. It was another regular family that lived in yours. This is the only thing I've had in here. But, I'm, but the point I'm trying to make is so often people assume that if there's someone making noise or throwing up or having gang tattoos or any of these things, they assume it's a vacation rental. And I guarantee 90% of the time it is not. And I'm just wondering why such a big deal is being allowed to take up so much of your time when this is really such a small problem in terms of things. In any event, I, I agree with limits on, on minimum day stay. Uh, there should be parking except for grandfathered properties. There should, should be fees for abusers. The, the, the few things I'm against are a limit on the total, 1,600 is completely unreasonable, uh, and people losing their permits if they don't use it after two years. I have a permit on my own house that I All right, right done. pay the city every year. Privilege. Why should I? Okay. In any event, so much for listening. And Thank you. I hope these uh, restrictions will be reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, if you can hear me, go ahead. Hi, if you can hear me on the phone, go ahead. You're going to want to mute whatever you're listening to me and then listening and then go ahead. 
Sorry, if you're not going to respond in a couple seconds, we got to go to the next speaker. All right, let's go to the next phone. Hi, if you can hear me, go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Doc, Dr. Beccaro, and I'm a vacation rental owner. And we're very fortunate. Uh, we have all the properties surrounded with security cameras, which we monitor frequently. I just want to know how we can be protected against neighbors that are trying to sabotage us calling the police on families playing board games, um, you know, in order to try to get bad reviews for us. And if, if there's two offenses can cause us high fines, how do you differentiate a sabotaging neighbor? Um, and also the other thing that would be one if the city could somehow address, we have repeatedly tried to not discriminate, but inquire about the age of renters, only to be told by Airbnb, they're going to on our list because that is discrimination. Um, because we try to vet. We know Airbnb vet. Um, so if some way the city could have dialogue, with uh, Airbnb, try to get that to um, not look at like discrimination for us to ask, what is the age of the renter? Are you a family? Uh, which is what we want, which is what the name want is. And the other thing is I have lived in for, for over 40 years and the amount of long-term renters that have vomited, defecated on the property, it, it, it wasn't vacation renters. Um, so it seems like uh, there's a lot of singling out, just like the gentleman said before, um, that it's always pointed towards the vacation renters. Uh, one of the rentals is surround, surrounded by hot smokers, but yet I get calls all during the night about somebody smoking pot at my property. No way that I could know without running over there and, you know, uh, investigating, which I, which we do if we need to. So, so basically my, my, my two points are one, how are we getting protected against neighbors or blatantly sabotaging and number two is there a dialogue with airbnb a week and better vet our guests and and have a more um peaceful uh guest which which we do go under the lines of airbnb and really do take corners to find out what the uh age of the guest is and all I right. appreciate all you got. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next speaker, please. All right. So make sure you're muting what you're listening to and then go ahead and speak. Hello, uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Stephen, and I've been with my wife um, for a few years now. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time to, to rehash it, but um, I think it's, um, it's, it's it, there's no way this is a conspiracy that 75% of the people are all against the detrimental effects of short term rentals. Um, I was out at California for years in Nashville. I lived in a few places um, uh, with the Navy and other jobs. And I can say the hand that experience happens to a, a transformation from a family neighborhood or, or even a neighborhood of 
in my people with long term with short term. Um, I happen to be the person who walked across the bridge and caught the people taking naked photos. So, uh, so it's there that it's been a lot. Um, sorry that my neighbor on the corner street, but it wasn't him. Um, but at the end of the day, there's been really good ideas here, and I think it's fair to say in my that the proposals that are forward for phase one and phase two are woefully short what's necessary to control this. There has been several um, new ideas that I haven't heard of before, but like what in people that are, are having um, just come out and tell them to quiet down for days on end. Um, I saw in, in the regulation something about having a person in 25 miles away. Every hotel I've been to, there's somebody on site, not 25 miles away. I can tell you that in my uh, years of living here, I've never seen a single management company or opera the rock out of their company. show up when they need to turn the sheet and clean up the place for the next one, and that's it. These houses are often in really huge disrepair. 98% of earlier people disappear. Um, and I don't care if you used to live here. If you moved away, it's not your, you don't have a stake in the ground the same as the rest. So I appreciate the question that's on it. There's a reason this topic's here, and we're so passionate about it. I've taken almost three hours of my night uh, to sit here and prepare for this. I know that that's, that's a huge investment, and we, we thank you guys for there. Get this thing to the community and tell you the bigger than what you're even hearing today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next speaker now. Hi, if you can hear me, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Patricia Graney. I live in Connecticut, but I own a home in the beach. And yes, it is 3 a.m. made up of home for you. The first time I participated, it would be the last door. Over the years, I experienced a lot of drunk, drugs, loud, police fouling in and around my home here in Newport. Sorry, Coming can I, in can from I, the East Coast. I, I'm sorry, can I, I ask, have, are you on a cell phone right now? No, I'm not. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll talk a little slower. So coming in from the East, I get no sleep. I come home south and park. Uh, in 2018, I only went to my house twice. Because it's not fun, there's no, it's not in trouble. My son is there now at the house, COVID, and his sleep is disrupted with the party. I pay taxes in California. I support many charities, and yet I'm asking myself, why am I being punished in my home for 20 years from responsible people? So my question is, do I stay my home for three years and let my home become somebody else's problem, or do I wait it out for a solution? That's it. All right. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next mm -hmm. speaker. We'll go to the next speaker. Hi, if you can hear me, go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Sorry for jumping the gun earlier, Larry Robinson, homeowner on Newport Island. I'll get right to the point. Newport Island is unique. It was marketed that way to me when I purchased there six years ago. Clearly, the realtor, Burr White, said this is a unique place. It's family-based. It's community. Unlike you go across the bridge and across the street where you enter the war zone, here it's nice, quiet, calm. And the best thing is they don't have short-term rentals. Fantastic. She sold us, started out that way, and obviously that was not the case. So 
the issue I have is not with the rentals, it's the short term rentals. People want to make money on their properties, fantastic. Rent it for a month, preferably, or be owner occupied. The people that say there's no problem are the ones who aren't there with them. I, I was there at the last meeting, we talked about this. Garage goes up in the morning for my neighbors who've been partying all night. And it's like, I think we counted eight people sleeping in the garage. There's nobody around to regulate that. Nobody's coming in and counting to make sure it's two per bedroom plus two. Nobody's counting that. So I just want you to write, it is an issue. And again, I have no problem with the rental. I live next door to a rental. In six years, there's been two renters. They have an annual lease. They want to make money on this rental property like some of the other folks have mentioned. Great, rent it out for a month or a year. Otherwise, seriously, I think the city council should seriously consider the owner on the premises to keep this from happening. So appreciate your time. And it is not a small problem, as was mentioned by, I think, Mr. Abrams or some others. These are the people that aren't living in that community. It is different, it's unique, and we appreciate your supporting at least four days. I prefer a month. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Bye now. All right. Next speaker, please. Hi, so make sure you mute mute whatever you're listening to and then go ahead and speak. Uh, good evening, Mayor O'Neill and uh, members of the City Council. This is Gary Sherman. I'm the uh, president of Visit Newport Beach and Newport Beach and Company. We're the tourism marketing agency for the city. As you know, tourism in Newport Beach is always and always has been a very thoughtful balance of business and protecting the quality of our life. And quality of our life is very, very important. Uh, on behalf of the city's entire tourism industry, including our hotels, we really want to applaud the work of the ad hoc task force for their excellent work. We know how difficult that process has been. I want to applaud Simone and team because it's a thorny nut. Uh, and we completely endorse this proposal in front of you tonight, which encourages responsible short-term rentals and protecting that valuable quality of life, because that's a large reason why our visitors come, is to experience that specialness that, of our quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, go ahead. All right, if you can hear me, mute your mute whatever you're listening to, and then go ahead and speak. Sorry, we got a few seconds, and then I got to get going again. If you can hear me, speak speak into the phone. All right, we'll go to the next speaker. Hi, right, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor O'Neill, City Council members. Uh, my name is David Granoff. I'm a 36-year resident of Newport Beach. I moved here for the quality of life, live a safe and one, in a safe and wonderful environment, and raise my family. I'm going to cut this relatively short because you've heard pretty much everything that people have said. But in my neighborhood, for the past 30 years, uh, it all owner-occupied and long-term rentals. In the past several years, it's now changed to I have nine short-term rentals within a block and a half in our house. Um, you started uh, earlier. I feel Mayor Pope Avery, Councilwoman Dixon, and Councilman Erdman made some very good remarks on what we need to do for this. Um, we have actually owned uh, several rental properties, but we do not do short-term rentals because the impact it would have on the neighborhood. I think at this point, enforcement is going to be the key. Uh, some of the things mentioned with uh, if one, an owner lived in one of the units or possibly even a long-term renter in one of the units, there would be less issues for a short-term uh, 
property to have issues. I think it's possible spacing one every 500 feet or one a block or something like that could be uh, given and also priority to owner occupied rentals and definitely a 24 hour line for complaints necessary. I appreciate your time and I know it's late and thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Paul Hoffman. I've lived on uh, Newport Island for 25 years. And then uh, degradation of lifestyle aside, I would say that um, parking is absolutely impossible on the island as it is as a resident. Uh, adding short rentals just compounds that to the nth degree. I want to echo something that the resident said earlier about emergency vehicles. Every single street on Newport Island is a single wing road where you have to pull over to the side and pull into somebody's driveway to allow somebody to pass. So there's absolute liability on the city for emergency vehicles, et cetera. And um, that's it. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. We'll go to the next speaker. Hi, right, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Charles Clove. Mayor O'Neill, you have no chance of having a short-term rental near your home. Mayor Pro Tem Avery, you have no chance. Mayor Council Member Duff, you have no chance. Council Member Baldoon, you have no chance. Council Member Brenner, Hurt, and Dixon do. Real estate have told us that the price of real estate is lower at the short-term rental. You all have claimed, or most of you have claimed at various times, to support property property. I know that early in your careers you had a count vote. There's 87,000 people in Newport Beach, many of them voters. There's 1,500 short-term rental permits. Some of them actually disappear. Why are we doing this tonight when the quality of life of the residents so negatively affected by a little transient occupancy tax that don't really need. I support the position of the Newport Island that we have set a precedent. We have lodged, pro provided uh, rules and ordinances that separated certain areas. This is the case where that should be. Every home put into service a short-term rental that we lose as a resident. We have 4,832 residents required under what benefit do we get for them as short term? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Did we lose that speaker? Yeah. Required All right, please mute whatever you're listening to and then go ahead. All right, I'm muted. Uh, hello, my name is Jeff, Jeff Jordan and I've been a homeowner on Newport Island for over 20 years. We had a great neighbor going to home next door to us for even longer. She moved and decided to use her Newport Island home for short-term rentals, and this turned into a nightmare. We began experiencing frequent problems, including drunken parties, they go late into the night, late in drug use, drugs being used at the back side of the table, people passed out in the backyards, there was even a pornography shoot with the actresses and actors filming in the backyard and on the gangway and dock. Many of us work hard to live here, so we don't have to deal with it. I'd like to finish by saying most of our lots on the canals are 30 feet wide, 
with a mandated three foot wall between the properties. This means there's no separation between residents and renters in the backyard. Just taking our dog out in the evening can turn into a situation. The women in my house have been harassed. The people that rent can be extremely drunk and drugged and bloody, and no more than three or four feet closer than you are sitting to your neighbor right now. I'd just like to say that I hope the city council and mayor can protect residents like myself and my family from what these short term rentals bring. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, go ahead. Hi, Mayor and City Council. This is um, Lisa Zucato. I'm a, a homeowner on Newport Island. And I just wanted to refocus the conversation on the fact that the city ordinance was passed under emergency order under COVID-19. Um, we're all honest with ourselves. Parking and traffic is about construction. Um, this is really a permitting and a zoning issue. Um, and I don't think that the short-term rental is a huge impact. I think that as a community, we're all on the same page. Um, if the culture has changed on the island, then um, we should come together and have a discussion. But it was, but unfortunately, it was brought into a public platform using the global pandemic um, to further agendas. And I would love to see the data that shows the cases of COVID-19 was decreased by singling out Newport Island. I just don't think Newport Island needs to be singled out. I think this is a peninsula issue, and we should all get together. And I think the um, city council staff uh, has a good plan in place, and we should all come together. But I don't think Newport Island should be singled out. All right. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, go ahead. Hello. <laughs> my name is Penelope Gilbert, and my property has been in my family since 1946. During that time, we have seen many changes on Newport Island. At the moment, my, my original little beach house is surrounded by short-term running. On the one side, I have a, a multi-story building that supposedly is occupied by one of the owners. However, now that they have a hot tub on the roof, uh, our party's going on day and night. Uh, during the past week, the police have been called to the 400 block on 38th Street on several occasions due to party disturbances. It appears to me that something must be done. No longer is the residential community that Newport Island originally was. 
the proliferation of short-term rentals has changed the You have another 30 seconds if you'd like it. Sorry, ma'am. Are you, are you done? Yeah, I guess so. All right. Thank you very much. Any other calls? No. All right. We'll bring it back to the dice. I should ask, do we have any other people who feel compelled to speak in the room? Okay, we do. Sorry, hang on one second. The, the mic's not working in there. Just a moment. All right, now go ahead. Are we good? Yep. Oh, great, thank you. Once again, thank you for your patience, Mayor and Council members. Um, quite an evening. I think the first thing that we should do, and there's still some people here, is we need to be better neighbors, not just us, but you too. So we've got to work on all of us being better neighbors. First, I want to say the stories you've heard about Newport uh, and the parties and all that, yeah, maybe. Um, but I can guarantee you, you'll get those same stories if this was about another island, another district, another whatever. They just happen to be here tonight because it is about Newport Island. Um, we go back to what some of my fellow uh, landlords were saying earlier. It's about fairness. If four days is a good idea, great. Let's do four days for all of Newport. Maybe five days is a better idea, and we'd be all set to do that. What we object to is being singled out, and it puts the council in a very bad position of deciding winners and losers, because yes, it's gonna be easier for somebody who has a three-night minimum versus a four-night minimum. And in fact, there may be one or two people on the city council who indeed would benefit from that. Not that I don't think there's anything sinister about what's going on, but it's just fairness. And then another thing about life on the island. You know, my fellow residents are putting it all on us short-term rentals. Um, the life on the island has gotten different with these mega mansions going up three stories, six bedrooms. Now there's cars from teenagers and everything else. It's not just short-term rentals that has changed that island. My house is built in 1952, I think. It's the same footprint, the same everything. But these bigger and bigger and bigger houses is affecting parking and everything else. And on the parking issue, my unit is rented less than 50% of the time. That means less than half the time there's no car associated with my unit. So this whole idea that parking is only a problem because of short-term rentals, it's because the houses are getting bigger and their families are getting bigger and the teenagers have cars and the, that's just the truth. So yes, there is a lifestyle change and yes, that's sort of the way life is. Things do change. Anyway, thank you again. Just be fair, treat us like everybody else. Four days are good, everybody four days. It seems so basic and simple that I'm not sure why we're having to do this, but thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, Scott McFetter is here from Newport Island. Um, I'm really glad I'm the last speaker here, hopefully tonight. Um, but listen to everybody today. I'm more, I'm happy I really made it tonight and put the time to kind of make some changes on the island. Um, the survey that went, we put out basically was close to 90%, 87% of the residents that responded did not want short-term rentals. And the reason they don't want it is because the same reason I moved on the island is it is a residential neighborhood. It is, it is a residential neighborhood. It, it was not, there was, there was, I think, two or three of them, and I was one of them. I bought one of the houses that had one of them. And I thought, I thought, oh, this is great. They're grandfathered in. Um, I've got something that's worth something. But I found out anybody can get a short-term license after that. Um, and all we've had is problems because in the last two years, I think it went from three to, depending on who says, 16, 18. And we've had everything go nuts next door. We've had, we've had big parties, we've had people passed out, we've had dogs running around the mud in my backyard. Um, there's just no, there's no responsibility taken by the owners 
and there's no responsibility taken by the, the people around us that, that actually operate them. And so it's been a big issue for our neighborhood, the whole neighborhood, not just our area, but the whole island, because you've got Ubers racing by, you've got parties going by, you've got, you do have guys with prison tattoos that are operating some business late night out of somebody's garage. So we've seen it all and we don't want it anymore. So that's why we're here. We want, it, we want to ask for an owner-occupied situation on Newport Island because the residents want it, we want to be protected, and we want to have a quality of life like, like we should. Not every place is, every place is different. Um, some places, a majority of the places are taken over by short-term rentals, and they have a huge problem, and they can't do anything about it because it's 80-20 short-term rentals to residents. But we can do something, and we will do something about it to get it to change because we're over 80%, if not more. I think there's 110 houses, and out of those, I think maybe 28 are duplexes. And out of the 28, a lot of those, I don't know if a lot, but a few of them are all still operated short-term, I mean, um, um, uh, single-family homes. So you can see the survey we did. You can talk to people on the island. It's a triangle. Parking's horrible. The short-term rentals have no problem parking in the red zones, blocking our emergency stuff, uh, uh, air access, um, blocking people's garages because they don't they want to park and, and just their friends do. We get swarms of people. It's not just like a family shows up and it's four people. It's like one family, two family, the third family shows up, the fourth family. Oh, the softball team from Arizona. They're all gonna stay at the Ramada Inn, but somebody rented a house on Newport Island, so let's do that. So we're asking for an owner-occupied situation and or a ban eventually through the Coastal Commission on short term rentals on Newport Island. Thank all right, you. thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna bring this one back. I'm just gonna tell you up front, um, I'm gonna separate out the, uh, the regular ordinance versus the emergency ordinance for uh, vote and discussion. Um, so Ms. Brenner, go ahead. Um, I had a few questions and then um, a statement, but Simone, could you answer a couple of questions for me? Um, can we require contracts that each contract contain a clause allowing the ability to evict? Can we require that? I know, and have, did we talk about that or is that somewhere in what we've projected or? Uh, let's give the city attorney that one. Okay. Yeah, we typically wouldn't get involved in the contractual affairs between the uh, tenant and the uh, business owner. But we could we no, require? I don't believe, no, I don't, you, you if could they not. put that in their contract, you could not. Okay, all right. And um, we had we talked about a clause allowing less than one week only if the owner lives on the property. Is that something we're still considering down the line? That, that, that's correct. That, that's a, a, on our next phase, you know, our phase two. Okay. And um, will the occupant load be listed on our own online listing that, so that someone who looks up a short-term rental will know what the occupant load is there? Yes, we can definitely do that. And the other question was, can you give us a, an example of, because you're talking about fire, um, fire codes, determining what the occupant load, can you give us a couple of examples of sizes and what the number would be? Certainly, so what we're recommending is just based on both the building code and fire code, which are very similar in occupant load calculation. So you take the floor area and you divide it by 200. So if you have a home and it's hypothetically it's 2000 square feet, divide that by 200, your maximum occupant load is 10. And we would require that information, that declaration on the application, and we can actually post that online too. So it'd always be 10. So if code enforcement ever gets complaints, we can look it up, code enforcement can look it up and actually do the inspection to say, do you have more than 10 in the property? Okay, and um, let's see. Could we go up to a four night minimum for all instead of making Newport Island the exception? Could we? go up and make it a four night minimum for all in order to make it consistent? That would be have to be a separate emergency ordinance, which was not on the agenda tonight. Okay, and then the only other question, and then I've got a quick statement, um, about Jim's 
concerns about what is published and what's an emergency ordinance and what we can do tonight and what we can't do tonight. Could you address that? Certainly. So the Newport Island was during the, the really that strong COVID um, stage that we're in, and we're still in that emergency order. The city is under an emergency order. So with regards to short-term lodging, when we banned it for, throughout the city, that was an emergency ordinance. And then when we opened up short-term lodging, we continued to ban it under the emergency ordinance. The city is under an emergency order. So the, the only way that we can ban these items is through an emergency process, and that's what we're doing. Now we're looking at Newport Island, and we need to release Newport Island, and we're gonna do that, continue to do that through that emergency ordinance procedure. I understand that Ms. maybe Mr. Mosier doesn't feel like we're in emergency status, but we still are in emergency status for the city. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank and you. I just had a, a couple of quick statements about this process that we've been going through. Um, one thing I did want to mention is to Dr. Vaccaro's point, it's not okay for long-term renters or owners or anyone else in our city to be behaving in the ways that we're having complaints about short-term rentals. And we need to make sure that when people complain um, about those bad behaviors, that we make sure that citations are issued and we, and we keep a lid on that because we do have a lot of complaints from people saying that um, you know citations are not being issued when people are behaving badly and sometimes they're our own residents so that's something we need to pay attention to um, on the uh, first of all I just want to say cities worldwide are dealing with this I, I was watching a show on international um, house hunters and they were talking about Barcelona, where people wanted to buy a house there in order to use it as a short-term rental, and they don't allow any more in Barcelona. So we're in, this is international, an international issue that we're dealing with, and um, it's, it's really an important one. And the other thing is, um, I wanted to say that the property rights issue is really important and we've talked we are a business friendly council we're also a resident friendly council and i think it's important to understand that the majority of the people who've bought duplexes in our city are business people too and um they have factored in the revenue from their long-term rentals as part of often their uh, retirement plans and some of those people have written to us and are concerned because they're losing long-term tenants because of the effects of short-term rentals nearby. Um, so it's, it's really important that we consider those people and their business interest. And the other thing I've heard from several realtors that the prevalence of short-term rentals is affecting our property values and that they actually have had people say that they don't want to buy in Newport Beach or they don't want to buy in certain neighborhoods and we heard that about uh, New Newport Island and I think that we really need to be very cognizant of what this issue is doing to our property values so this has been a long process and we've worked really hard on it and um, I just hope that we've reached a a point that we've come up with some really fair and equitable solutions that we can all get behind thank you Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, I just want to clarify. You started to say something about property rights. Just if you didn't maybe finish, but just to clarify, it is a privilege, not a property right, to have a short-term rental permit. The city issues permits. It's a permission. Long-term rental agreements are indeed property rights. Mr. City Attorney, am I speaking that correctly? That's right. This is an annual permit, so it's not a property right. Okay, thank you. So on the basis of the discussion we've had tonight and heard uh, from many, many residents, I'd like to make a motion to uh, adopt the municipal, uh, support the municipal code change relating to short-term lodging, uh, which are the uh, items that uh, Mr. Jurgis identified, and then specifically to Newport Island is to prohibit the rental of any unit lodging unit on Newport Island for a period of four consecutive nights or less to any other person other than a medical professional or emergency responder. So we're maintaining that language that we had 
in the previous emergency ordinance. So those two items, that's my motion. And second. I will for sure second that motion. So given the- both, We could both second that. All right. <laughs> so given, given the nature of the emergency order, or ordinance being very different um, from a voting standpoint than the first motion, it's, it's a good idea to, to split those up. Two. Yeah, so if you, if, if you would like to, uh, here's what my request, if you could just make staff recommendation A and B, so we're only dealing with the, um, the regular ordinance first and then we can go to the emergency ordinance, that'd be helpful. All right, well I guess it's B and C, so we'll do B. So it would be A and B for, um, the A and C will be the emergency oh, ordinance. Okay. Yeah, so if you just say staff, if, if you'd move staff recommendation A and, B. A and B. B. B as in boy. Okay, and Mr. Herdman seconds. I do. All right, is there any discussion on that? On that motion, all right. Seeing none, we'll just real quick. There's a couple. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right. Go ahead. So, Mr. Mosher pointed out a few Scrivener's errors. So I'll just go through those real quickly. Um, the last whereas clause it should be service and says serving fees. And there's section five point nine five zero 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 five. There's an extra apostrophe in subsection E, and in subsection I, the R should be an is. In section 595045, the reference to 1.08090 should be a reference to 1.08080 in sections 19 and 20. And in, in section 5.95050A2, the reference should be to 3.28010 instead of 3.28020. And then there were a couple of substantive um, issues he raised in 595065. There's a reference to the suspension of revocations. It says violates a short-term lodging permit condition. It should be violates any short-term lodging permit condition in A1, A5, and A6. And in B1, um, the appeal would go to the finance director. So those are the, the changes that were made. Yeah, so those were, those were all Changes made um, based on the review of Mr. Mosher's uh, comments. So incorporated into yes. your motion, yep. into your second. Yep. All right, any dis discussion? All right, let's vote on this one. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-15, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending section 3.16.060 and chapter 5.95 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code relating to short-term short lodging. Council Member Herdman. No, no, is it not showing up on your screen? The screen went to that. Are you a thumbs up? Are you, Are you a yes? Okay, yeah. Okay, the motion carries with Council Member Muldoon voting no. So it'd be 6 1. Okay. All right, and let's go into the. Um, let's go now if uh, your motion is a uh, staff recommendation for A and C. And sure. it, was there any modification you needed to make? I, sorry, I can't recall. Not for me. Okay, then that's easy then. Um, so go ahead if that's your motion. No, no, that's fine. Just as written a and C, C. as in cat. Yep. Uh, yes. C in terms of the four day minimum. Let me get a second. And then I'll do I have a second? Second for Mr. Herdman. Okay. We'll have discussion. Mr. Muldoon. Just as a point of order. Um, I'm sorry. I thought you coupled them all together. Could you just parse out the first vote versus this vote? Yeah, so this vote, the, the first vote was only A and B, so B being the um, ordinance that uh, is not the emergency, so um, exhibit C. So the, the vote we just took was only A and B. Does that change your vote? Okay, there you go. So this motion is A and C, um, and it's been seconded by Mr. Herdman. Um, any discussion? I have a couple of comments, but if you had further discussion, Mr. Muldoon. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let me just say real quick. I understand. Um, I understand what uh, the folks on uh, the island are trying to do here. I think this is the wrong avenue by doing the doing it through the emergency ordinance. I thought it was the wrong avenue the first time, which is why I voted no. I think this is the wrong avenue again. I understand Mr. Mosher's points, and it puts it puts me in a conundrum because. I'd like to see the original um, repealed because I didn't think that we should be treating Newport Island differently than any other area. Um, and that's why I'd voted no the original time. Now we're in a position of needing to <laughs> make an emergency um, 
declaration that, uh, that it, in order to roll it back and then add on the four consecutive nights issue. I, so the conundrum is how to, how to get there. And the problem is in order to make this, we still need to do a five sevenths vote. So um, it is a very odd procedural issue. Do an emergency? So the, so the question from Ms. Dixon is, does it need to be on an emergency basis? My understanding is yes, so, but go ahead, Mr. Harp. I agree, I think the emergency is still in effect. You know, in essence, what you're saying is that a complete ban isn't necessary, so you're gonna basically uh, repeal that ordinance and replace it with the four night, um, four consecutive night stay requirement. But that's still dealing with the emergency situation, um, but you would need justification for why to treat Newport Island differently than you are the rest of the city. But I think you've laid that out in the, in the ordinance of what the basis for that is. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm. Yeah, that's where I'm having the conundrum. <laughs> so I I'm ha I couldn't make the findings the first time, but now I have to make the findings to reverse the original findings. It's just the, it is the strangest situation that we're in right now. And um, I think that I think admittedly I think that's why we shouldn't have done it in the first place. But I I mean I'm curious when when we submitted to the Coastal Commission on this, what 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 did they say? No, the, the first one, the the first the ban on Newport Island when we were treating it differently. That because we had a lot of concerns that the at the council level about what Coastal would say. So w what was their response? So uh, that was handled actually at a staff level. Um, I believe Mr. Sponger just issued a condu uh, Coastal Development Permit for the action. Right, Co Co Coastal Commission didn't have, a, because it was an emergency order, they didn't have any comments on it. Did we submit it to them for comments? We did. We did, Right. and they didn't have any comments no. back? Correct. Okay. I mean, I, it's just, a, it is just the strangest thing. Um, I mean, on balance, I think I'm going to vote for this simply because I need to, I want to, I, I just don't think we should be treating it Newport Island differently. And then by doing so, we're going to be treating Newport Island differently. I don't even know how to, I, I just don't even, this is one of those weird times. I'm not even sure how to process what, what, what I'm about to vote on. Um, <laughs> So, so the emergency's over, yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing that it just should, it just shouldn't be done this way as the part of the problem. Like if we wanted to, if we want to ban them on Newport Island, then we should be going through the normal process of creating an ordinance, introducing it, um, rolling it through and then submitting to coastal. Um, I just don't think it's the right thing to be doing under the, under the cover of COVID while we're trying to work this through. I, don't, I just don't see how uh, adding a night, at, you know, going to four nights, I don't see how that does anything. And during an emergency. Um, I don't, I, it's three nights everywhere else in the city. I have no idea why adding a fourth night would somehow fix an emergency situation during a virus. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen that explained in this. I, I don't know how to make that finding. Can anyone explain how I make, how to make that finding? Because if not, why are we doing a fourth night? Well, I, th I think that the basis for it is sort of similar to why the ban was on Newport Island. It's given you know this, uh, the narrow streets, the you know density, and those type of issues. Um, so that's the the basis that's set forth for why it need a fourth night is the same basis that was set forth for why to ban it completely. Well, if you ban it completely, I understand, Mr. Hart. But if you ban it completely, it's gone. If you have three nights versus four, they're still there. I, I'm not, I just don't see the, I'm not sure I understand how to make a finding to justify the emergency ordinance for a fourth night. If it's three nights, okay. But I just don't, I'm not, I'm not understanding the fourth night as a justification under uh, a local emergency to create an emergency ordinance. Anyway, Mr. Avery. Well, ostensibly, I suppose it's just to dampen it. If you're not banning it, you're just sort of, you know, it's just another quashing mechanism that's not. Exactly sort of just reducing the froth if you will okay you know that's the only thing i can think of all right i'll tell you what we've had the we've had we've had enough discussion i'm at a loss all right let's go with it let's go ahead and vote let's see where we come out oh i'm sorry miss hang on one second mr muldoon this will not add any clarity <laughs> but i'll be voting no not because of any technicality related to the emergency ordinance but because i'm against the four night restriction okay thank you all right, so let's go ahead and vote then um, on Ms. Dixon's uh, motion. On the emergency ordinance 2020-006, did I hear it? Is that what it's called yet? There we go. 
an ordinance of the city council, an emergency ordinance of the city council of city of Newport Beach prohibiting the rental of any lodging unit on Newport Island for a period of four consecutive nights or less to any person other than a medical professional or emergency responder coming to the city of Newport Beach to aid with the COVID-19 outbreak. Council member Avery. Thank you. With Mayor O'Neill and Council Member Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 5-2. All right, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for sticking around to, uh, to see the vote here. Um, all right, give me just a moment. Uh, so next item is um, uh, COVID-19 update. It is. All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, We'll have a couple speakers um, here for this one. Um, so, oh, thank you. Um, and I'm just going to start it off um, by talking just real briefly of the um, some of the state actions that have happened since the last um, uh, last time we met two weeks ago, um, and then we'll go through. Um, and have um, Chief Boyles come up and talk a little bit about the statistics that we're seeing countywide um, with our numbers uh, and talk about the uh, 4th of July, upcoming 4th of July holiday and what, um, what we're doing, um, particularly um, in this time of COVID um, and, and the global pandemic. And then um, we'll have uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Tara Finnegan um, give an update on the business relief uh, grant program, which is um, uh, moving uh, um, along with the very strong uh, response. So uh, since our last meeting, um, the state has continued to move um, further into stage three. Um, at that last meeting we had talked about with county approval, we uh, expected the next uh, group of businesses to be open and that did indeed happen um, that Friday on June 12th. Uh, the state then um, issued a mandatory um, face coverings uh, for um, particular situations where you don't have social distancing. So that overrode the county um, guidance um, that had come out uh, recently. And then uh, the state also then continued with additional businesses um, this past Friday uh, that the county did approve as well. So we are now at the stage of um, several of these businesses um, that are listed here that are allowed to be open and are um, opening with the appropriate um, PPE and other um, industry guidance in place uh, for them. Um, I will note what's not on here are gatherings um, of any uh, size. Um, so we're still working and grappling through, um, waiting for those types of um, areas. And that's why we don't, and, and in particular too, libraries aren't on this list uh, right now in community centers. So we are still waiting for those types of facilities. Um, we are prepared, um, have been making plans. So when those areas do get opened up, we can move um, quickly in those areas, but um, we are still um, um, in, in, not in that um, later stages there. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Chief Boyles to uh, touch in um, on the numbers that are um, occurring right now. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Jeff Boyles, your fire chief. I'm reading the room here. Everybody looks a little tired, so I think I'll <laughs> keep it under an hour. Um, Orange County as of this afternoon has 10,737 positive COVID cases and 272 deaths. The city of Newport Beach has 204 positive cases. Um, overall, we've, we've seen a steady increase in total hospitalizations and ICUs throughout the county. As of June 22nd yesterday, the county had 349 patients which were hospitalized and 137 in the ICU. So one month ago today on May 22nd, the county had 253 hospitalized and 125 in ICU. So th those are some of the markers that the, the medical community is watching, the ICU and um, hospitalizations and ventilators. The county is reporting that 60, 60, sorry about that, uh, percent of their ventilators are currently available. So that's good news. Um, overall, the county has 44 congregate care facilities that have experienced outbreaks. And an outbreak is defined by two or more people in one facility. So it's not necessarily a skilled nursing facility, which is a term you've probably been hearing quite a bit, but a congregate care facility. So it could be a mental institution, um, 
a skilled nursing facility or, a, or some other type of care facility. Newport Beach Fire Department um, has resumed our call load again. So you may be re you may remember from the past reports that our call load had dipped with the um, the stay at home orders. People weren't going out. So in June of 2020, we have surpassed what our call load was in June of 19. So that's the first time since early February that our call loads they dipped and now they're back up again. And you can see just from the the beaches and restaurants and, and roadways that people are coming back out. We've responded to 346 enhanced precaution calls since March 1st, and we've transported a total of 20 patients in the back of our ambulances, COVID-19 positive 20 patients, I should say. 102 of our employees since March 1st have come in contact or been exposed at some point, and we keep track of that after they've been confirmed positive from the hospital. And then we put them on a 14-day medical watch where we monitor their symptoms, their temperature, um, and log it all to make sure that they come with, uh, they get out of that 14-day window where they don't exhibit any signs or symptoms to make sure our employees are healthy. We currently have 34 of those employees on that 14-day watch, but I am, still continue happy to report that none of our personnel firefighters or lifeguards have tested positive so i attribute that to a solid proper pp use good personal hygiene um, hand washing social distancing no handshaking those sort of thing and and then just general social awareness our our firefighters and lifeguards are really cognizant of how they're contacting people and and um, trying to remain in a good position to, to not be, become infected themselves. And to end on a really positive, as the junior lifeguards will say, super epic note, summer has officially kicked off. Our junior lifeguards, the A division started this morning. I report, as I reported in the um, study session, the A division started today, and the Bs, Cs, and Ds will start on July 6th. So... Um, our firefighters, our lifeguards are out there. They're in level A staffing, which means that every tower is now open. You'll see the, uh, the trucks patrolling the beach. You'll see the kids with their instructors on the beach. And all of our fire personnel are, are fully staffed and ready for 4th of July and everything that Chief Lewis is going to talk about here. So thank you for your time. Let's, um, do you have any questions? Yeah, just, to, just a moment, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. I'll be quick as well. Uh, did you see the New York Times article about patients being flown in from other regional hospitals to Orange County hospitals or Orange County and other our territories? No, I did not. Okay. Um, I can't disclose exactly my source, but I've been told it's been accurate by confirming medical source that the New York Times article is accurate and that those numbers of people who are brought to other counties from a certain area of the state actually go towards our numbers, meaning if they come from somewhere else, they're still tacked on to, to, to Newport Beach or the county numbers. Um, the, the number of cases you cited locally in the city and then in the county, that's a cumulative number over the term of the pandemic, correct? Correct. So it's foreseeably or it's, it's almost certain that those people have recovered and are no longer um, carrying COVID. And so those numbers, although um, they sound surprising, we're actually uh, falling in the, in the track of other cities in the county. Have you, have you heard that as well? Our, our ranking from three is basically oh, falling. quite a bit. Yes, yeah. I think we're in the middle now. That's great. That's great news. So great job for all the efforts in transport, record keeping, your medical staff, your firefighters. And um, um, it is good news. There's more testing, so we might continue to see these numbers climb. Testing is a good thing, though, because it's data. And um, I just want um, uh, the residents to know that um, Newport Beach is being very responsible along with uh, the county. Thank you. Right. Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, just to follow up on that, um, that in information that Mr. Muldoon just cited is um, published in a county OC health data that's archived data, and it does document that patients from other hospitals are coming to Orange County as well as others. So they're factored into your total, our totals, just as you say. Also, um, I consistently hear from Hogue, now this is maybe two or three days old, that our patient, num their patient numbers in Hogue Hospital, Newport Beach, are still in the single digits. And if they rose above single digits, it was the low double digits. 
So we've been consistent since January with that number, and that's very good. As, as well, that's what they have, what, 300 and some beds, and so they really want to fill up the hospital <laughs> beds with people who really need. You know, we've talked about this before, and they did fill up the hospital with other illnesses that people needed to seek hospitalization, and now they're back at a, a slightly lower level, so in, in hospitals all over the country, so people still have that fear. But um, hospitalization is the key factor, too, because just as you indicated, were any of the employees that you tested positive, were any of those hospitalized? No, we, we don't have any of our employees that so have tested positive. So that's the key positive. number. So it's Correct. the testing, people could be exposed, it could be right. positive, but they have not been hospitalized. Correct. And so that's what we, one of the key areas to focus on. I, I think that the takeaway is just that the bed capacity, the ICUs and the ventilators, are there's still quite a bit of capacity here in Orange yes. County. And yes, we have been bringing them in, or we were at one time from other regions as well, because we had the capacity and the surge capacity. So to your point, yes, they were coming from my understanding from other areas that needed to get some relief as well. Cool. The document's called the Medical Health Operational Area Coordination, by the way. So, yeah. yep, there you go. Yeah, I know. It's a weird acronym, too. It's All the right. MOAC. Yeah, yes. MOAC. <laughs> All right, Chief Lewis. Yes, and as Chief Lewis is coming up, I do want to set the stage for our July 4th um, uh, time period. Go ahead, take that. Um, that uh, while we will will have a few um, festivities, particularly um, the Old Glory Boat Parade by the American Legion, um, will go on, um, and there is a flyover happening. Um, this will be a, quite a different uh, Fourth of July due to the current um, where we're under right now, um, and without the ability to have mass gatherings um, and um, and to to restrain that, particularly in our city where we do have a lot of. Uh, visitors who come in and um, in addition to local residents really take up the tradition of um, for the fireworks and those festivities and wanting to not have those mass gatherings that we did not permit for firework displays. Um, and that was actually made uh, a decision a couple weeks ago because um, that was required for the large fireworks shows. They need quite a bit of lead time in terms of putting together those shows, so they needed a decision. It was actually right before the Memorial Day holiday. Um, and with all that we knew then, and which has continued um, to the current period, is that um, we're not able to um, um, have those um, displays this year, as well as with the street parades and, and festivals for that same reason on the gathering. So under that environment, um, I just wanted to have uh, Chief Lewis talk next about how we are um, going to be well prepared for this uh, 4th of July. Thank you, Ms. Leung. John Lewis, your Chief of Police. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill. Council members, I have a couple slides here, and when I mean a couple, I really mean a couple, uh, just to give you an idea about what we're talking about in terms of uh, our operations, our deployment in West Newport for the 4th of July holiday. So this is, as you know, and it has it has been for many, many years, an all-hands-on-deck uh, deployment for our police department. So that means um, everyone from every assignment that we have will be in uniform, will be working patrol, and will be assigned to our holiday deployment for, uh, for the 4th of July. Uh, again, mandatory work day, primarily staffing West Newport for the concerns that we see down there um, related to the large crowds that, that we've uh, historically seen on the 4th of July. In addition to the efforts of, of our personnel, we'll be partnering contracting with the California Highway Patrol, Irvine Police Department, Orange Police Department, with the Orange County Sheriff's Department to assist with our custody operations and also with our Orange County Regional Mounted Enforcement Unit, our horses. Our mission here, being supported by all these agencies and our resources, is to maintain order and keep the peace on the 4th of July. It's just as simple as that. And I'll talk about how we're gonna do that here going forward. With this slide here, this colored area represents what we've is been referred to as the designated safety enhancement zone of the West Newport area here, where the city has designated this area here, bordered by the ocean, to the south, 32nd Street and Newport Boulevard to the east and West Coast Highway on the north and 54th Street on the west as the safety enhancement zone where violations of the city municipal code committed within this highlighted area here on the 4th of July and for the first three hours into the 5th of July are subject to triple fines of our municipal code here as well. So that's um, what this area here on the map indicates. So anywhere within that color is the safety enhancement zone. The 
green, blue, and, and yellow there represents the different areas that we deploy our resources in terms of our area commands. So in essence, we operate three different area commands within the safety enhancement zone. All these three areas here, for those of us that are familiar to with West Newport, we know that there's a unique area specific to the Peninsula Wedge, 20th Street area that are a little bit different than the Newport Pier, a little bit different from um, 32nd of Summit. So we found that by identifying the resources we need for these specific areas and deploying them within this model that we've um, seen the most effective and, and most custom tailored response to the issues that we see in these areas here. Our street closures. We had asked for and were approved for Back Bay Drive to be part of our street closures that we have traditionally. Um, Back Bay Drive in San Joaquin Hills is gonna be open this year. This is uh, due to the fireworks shows that were scheduled in that area are, are not going to be conducted. So we will have the ability to keep these streets open. And so our street closures for the 4th of July are really very limited. We have Orange Coast, we have Orange Street and West Coast Highway, which is um, in essence the right hand turn that comes in off of Westbound West Coast Highway to Orange Street. We found that you can still access that neighborhood. You just have to do it off of off of Prospect and it relieves some of the con congestion going down seashore towards towards Summit. The closures here on Via Lido and Via Porto Malaga are for us to uh, stage our horses for the uh, mounted enforcement unit. So those are the two um, closures, or really the one closure that impacts traffic most significantly is going to be at uh, Orange Street. So our objectives here, and we ha we're looking at the 4th of July as it relates to the pandemic that we are that we're currently in and we're, we're tailoring our approach a little bit differently this year focusing on on some things that we think are going to be very important to managing this uh this holiday again maintaining order maintaining keeping the peace within uh, within west newport in particular but also we have uh, we've seen some some traffic and some congestion issues in corona Mar as well but doing it in a way that also recognizes the fact that the crowding and the and the traffic congestions concerns that we have um, and what those look like in terms of this pandemic. So we are, number one, we're taking proactive measures here to enforce our party ordinances, our, our disturbance advisements, our loud and unruly gathering ordinances. That's part of our part of our enforcement profile, always has been. Setting those enforcement standards early, setting expectations early, and that means our people getting out with these individual um, residents and setting our expectations for what is going to occur during this holiday and, and we expect that our our residents are going to comply with those um, with this ordinance we've seen some some decent compliance in, in the past over time as it relates to disturbances proactive measures to enforce our current alcohol regulations involving our abc license establishments this is going to be the first year that we will still have the this is the first year that we have abc license establishments with the ability to provide to-go alcohol service. Now, we have been working with our ABC license establishments. We've been working towards knowing that this could potentially be an issue for us on the 4th of July. Uh, we're gonna continue to do that. We're also gonna have specialized teams that are gonna be specifically dealing with our ABC license establishments on as part of our holiday deployment as well. So we expect that there's gonna be some good cooperation and collaboration with our, with our businesses. Fireworks violations, we've heard um, year after year um, and we're not unique in this, and you've seen some of the press reports too um, about the increase in fireworks violations regionally. We have um, impacted this each year, um, time after time after time, tailoring our approach a little bit differently to the issues that we've seen. And specifically the fireworks violations that we're seeing in West Newport are um, out on the beach area. We are going to address that in a number of ways here, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Traffic and municipal laws and concerning pedestrians and, bike and bicyclists, again, gonna be an issue for us. I spoke about the pandemic, maintaining normal traffic operations in West Newport, along seashore, and then also in Corona Mar is gonna be very important to our approach this year. Also is limiting the impact of pedestrian congestion and congregation throughout the areas of, of the peninsula and also Corona Mar, and that's gonna be part of our traffic management plan as well. Traffic is gonna be continuously monitored to determine whether or not we have the ability to get emergency vehicles in and out of these, of these impacted areas. If the need arises, we have officers specifically assigned to conduct emergency traffic control. If that means shutting down streets, we have the ability to do that. Assisting motorists off the peninsula, we have the ability to do that. We also have an emergency traffic plan where we have 
barricades um, staging at the city yard should we need to deploy them in any of those types of circumstances. So what we intend to do, particularly in West Newport, is um, in just about every year, about that five, six o'clock hour, we start to see the congestion of people trying to get off the peninsula. So our intent is, with the resources we have available, is to move proactively these people off. And if that means hand directing our certain different intersections, that's what we intend to do, to, to get this crush of traffic off the peninsula and do it quickly and, and safely. Our beach detail, uh, the fireworks, is this is gonna be an emphasis. We have fireworks teams that are gonna be assigned in different areas of the city. One of the main complaints that we've been receiving over the past couple of years and we've been able to impact and we're gonna to continue to be able to impact are, are, are the concerns about fireworks on the beach. So in addition to all the four wheel drive regular patrol units that we have available to, to deal with this, we also are deploying a larger side by side uh, utility terrain vehicles. They can carry more officers to be able to deal with the beach, um, specifically in the nighttime hours. Um, and then also our quads that are designed to be out there as well. So we have a number of different platforms to be able to address the, the beach specifically and target these, uh, these firework violations that we're seeing um, typically right after sunset and through um, about the 10 o'clock hour when we actually close the, the beach itself. So again, these beach closures we've been focusing on since since Memorial Day weekend and even before, and, and setting that consistent expectation that the beach is gonna be closed at 10 o'clock, we will do a hard beach closure at 10 o'clock and we're deploying significant resources specifically to deal with those issues as it uh, relates to the beach. But um, not just the fireworks violations, we're also gonna be out there dealing with um, pedestrian, bicycle, alcohol, and drug issues that we see in, in this area in a, in a firm, but fair manner. So the coordinated effort to the beach closures and the fireworks uh, complaints that we get out there, I think is going to um, be something we'll be able to continue to impact and hopefully um, make a dent in terms of those complaints as well. One thing I do want to point out is what this, um, by not having the fireworks shows on the side of town, that has allowed a number of our officers that typically are responsible. There's a major traffic control plan that goes into that. We're able to take those resources move them into um, into Corona Mar in the areas that we've seen um, specifically related to Corona Mar Beach and be able to hopefully impact that traffic there and then also take um, additional resources and move them into West Newport to deal with the traffic and congestion as well. So is, this is the same effective plan that we've used um, in, in the past, but we're um, tweaking a little bit specifically with emphasis on um, congestion and traffic. All right. Um with the caveat that we still have five items and it's 10.40 p.m., I'm going to um, open it up to council questions. Ms. Brenner? I just wanted you to assure us that when you see the map of the safety enhancement zone, that doesn't mean the rest of us are being left unprotected. I think, th thank you for bringing that up because I, we talk a lot about West Newport when we talk about what we do on the 4th of July and there is a significant presence from the from the police department here but that doesn't mean that the rest of the city is is left without watch we still have um additional additional officers all over the rest of the city because we have different um different issues in some of our neighborhoods we've heard the complaints about fireworks and things like that in newport heights we have officers that are specifically going to be dealing with that we've had some concerns like that in the port street so I'm over on the east side of town and i know the complaints that you've received over in corona mar as well so the rest of the city has those resources that are there um, and they're there to specifically deal with the concerns that we hear. So by no means are we um, taking everything and moving it over to the peninsula at the expense of anything else. In fact, we're um, enhancing our efforts in, in other areas of the city as well. Ms. Dixon. Um, thank you. Uh, while this is all happening in the context that we're still in a pandemic, so are we, just for my own edification, this is not a trick question, are we, what are we doing about social distancing on the beach? I should ask the lifeguard chief. I get. I mean, the fire chief. That, but um, we'll have a lot. We'll have. I mean, we've had a hundred thousand people on the beach for Fourth of July. What is our social distancing now? The governor has mandated masks. Not outdoor. on the beach. Not on the beach. Not on the beach. It's feasible to be six feet away. It's not on the beach. Okay, that's important. So the beach masks are not required on the beach, and social distancing. Yes, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not suggesting we are enforcing it, but are we, do we talk about it or how does it be dealt with compared to what it was a few, several weeks ago? In terms of social distancing, what we're looking for, and this is, this is social distancing, but it's also effective crowd management, okay? What we don't want to see is, is large groups of, 
of, of crowds congregating for a number of reasons, um, social distancing being one of them. So what our intent is, is, is to go, is to be there, be present, and gain cooperation from these, um, from these individual groups. And we typically have good cooperation with them once we're able to, to go out and, and make that engagement. Um, people will generally go along with what we're asking for them to do. So that's the approach that we take. Um, but that's not just as it relates to social distancing. It's also just um, good crowd management because we, what we find is we allow groups to congregate and we do see them in different areas of the peninsula. Um, sometimes problems are attracted to these center, centers of gravity. So it's important for us to, to, to get people to where they're going, um, not allow these, these big groups to congregate because we find that there are problems that are created um, in addition to social distancing when we see those groups. So um, that's what our plan is. Okay, so just to re... For Diane, what? it's 1040. All right. <laughs> Come on. Wear a mask if you have to. <laughs> okay. All right. Sit down, Chief, please. <laughs> Thank you. Before you get any more questions. All right. Come on up, Dara. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here to give you a very brief one slide update on the Small Business uh, Relief Grant Program. The program application period closed one week ago today, and we have, um, I guess, the distinction of being the, the program that has the most applications our consultant, the Small Business Development Center, has ever received for any program they've conducted. So we have, um, they've, gone, they've spent the past week going through the applications, removing duplicates, and the final tally is just over 900 applications, valid, received, and in the program for consideration. Our guidelines did put some funding priority towards certain types of businesses, and that was retail, restaurants, and certain personal services, nail salons, hairstylists, small gyms, um, and workout studios. So SPDC has then taken all of the data from the 900 applications, scrubbed it down, uh, put those um, funding tiers in place. They went through and they, they pulled out those three categories. And then we also had another layer of funding tier, and that was those who received federal assistance and what levels of that and those that didn't. So uh, what the result of that was today they were able to pull out um, the first three levels of those tiers. Um, so against restaur restaurants, retail, and certain personal services, and those that did not receive any federal funding, and those that received one type or the other type of federal funding, um, actually just went right into, they were approved today for grants. The remaining applications in that top tier will go into a, the lottery tomorrow at 11 o'clock. So um, some folks got good news today, others will be in the lottery tomorrow for consideration. After that happens, we will start, we'll get to work, SBDC consultants will work with all of the uh, grantees to get their documentation in place. We'll do a double check here at the city and then we can hopefully start getting some grant payments out to the businesses. All right, let's okay. please, make, please send an email to council tomorrow telling us how many were granted and what tiers and then we'll, uh, we should issue a press release on it too so people know. Will do. All right, thanks, all good? All right, let's move on. Um, item 11 and 12 that I pulled, I'm going to be very quick on this. This item 11 is the approval of the COVID economic relief funding support for Balboa Village Merchants Association. Let me tell you why I oppose this. It's because um, all of this money is coming out of our general fund reserve at the moment. According to the Balboa Village Merchant Association balance sheet on page 11-31, they have $48,644 currently in their checking and savings with an additional little over $10,000 in net income. Balboa Island Merchant Association Inc. balance sheet is on page 12-31. They have $76,705 in checking and savings and another $8,100 in net income. If we're dipping into our reserves, they ought to be dipping into theirs. I don't have any idea why we're giving them any money this year. So that's why I oppose it. Ms. Dixon. Um, I do support it. I do support the proposal because it's a very unique opportunity for Balboa Island merchants. What's it called? Merchants or marketing? Merchants. merchants. And Balboa Village merchants to do a combined marketing effort that they're both using the proceeds of, of that allocation. And it's the first time that's ever been done. They're both the empty storefronts in both of those villages is highly concerning. A number of businesses have gone out, out, of, out of business. We need to keep those businesses viable. They produce sales tax for our community. 
and they create jobs and uh, this is a unique situation and it is directed because of COVID, because of the severe business uh, crises these small businesses are going through. So I, I maintain it. They should not be penalized for being good fiscal stewards of their resources. Neither should we. All right, Mr. Herdman. Just a quick reminder too that had COVID-19 not hit us, uh, our recommendation to the council would probably be that these organizations not receive any funding at all this year. This is uh, the receipt of this money by them um, has uh, conditions that have never existed in the past before. So, um, and it's, it, it's a one-time expenditure. Okay. Any other comments up here? All right. Public, any public comments on this item? Any calls? All right. Bring it back. Um, I'm going to make a motion to not approve because they have both have a combined, let's see, $58,000 plus $84,000. They have $144,000 between the two of them. Um, I absolutely think that if they want to spend money to combine their resources, they should, and uh, they shouldn't be putting their hand out for city funding while we're dipping into our reserves. So my motion is to deny staff staff recommendation. Seconded by Mr. Duffield. Any discussion on the item? Mr. Muldoon. Yes, thank you. Who's who's staff assigned to this? Oh, thanks, Tara. Um, just to go over some of the numbers that the mayor mentioned, um, the balance sheets disclosed on these two items. Item number 11, well, I'll, I'll break them off. Item number 11, this is... Um, Babel Village. Babel Village. And they have a balance of how much? Go to 31, page 31. Thank you. Yeah, I see here. So this is the, I like to hear from staff. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm looking through their financial statements. Yeah, top left. Yes, their total, their total liabilities and equity is 84,335. Pablo Village. When they say assets, what do they mean? No, let's see. In that they in their assets, they include the decorations, the seasonal decorations, some of the things they've purchased over the years and they reuse. Yeah, those it's Christmas holiday decorations. And so this, their current. So their cash on hand was like forty-eight thousand six hundred and some change. And, and and just to compare to the other item. I, item 12. Item 12, their balance, 76. Yeah, I'll definitely support the mayor and council member Duffield on item 12. I think I'm likely to disagree though on item 11. But that's just, those are my thoughts. Yeah, let me clarify real quick. Item 11 and item 12 are basically the same thing because item 11 and 12 are both combining um, their efforts. So these two are, teaming up to do a program to promote the 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 um, the Balboas so between the two so so it, it would be admittedly very odd actually to vote yes on one and no on the other because they're the same program um, and using this using money from both of their both of their amounts so Balboa Village Merchant Association has fifty eight thousand dollars that they can combine with the Balboa Island merchants, so the folks that have $84,000. So between the two of them, they have more than enough to fund some uh, program like this if they want it, if that's what they actually wanted to do. So that's, that was my point of why 11 and 12 are this basically the same, because it's the same program. They just, they, that's why you can look at their balance sheets come together. Well, when we the first time I made an odd vote, Okay. But uh, I would argue that they're, they're different groups and they have different balance sheets. All right. So any other further discussion? All right. So the motion on the table is to deny staff recommendation on item 11. And uh, so we'll, we can vote on that first.
with council members Dixon, Herdman, Muldoon, and Mayor Pro Tem Avery voting no. The motion fails 2 4. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. Hang on one second. Uh, Ms. Brenner didn't, oh. her vote didn't. Was it a no vote? So it was a no vote. And Councilmember Brenner voted no, so that was 5 2. Okay. All right, go ahead, Ms. Dixon. Yes, I'd like to make a motion in support of the recommendation to authorize the city manager to allocate $40,000 for COVID-19 economic relief for Balboa Village Merchants Association. Okay. I'll second the motion. All right. Seconded by Mr. Herdman. Let's go ahead and vote. With Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Avery, and Council Member Duffield voting no, the motion carries 4 3. All right, let's move to item number 12. Um, same points, same argument. So, any, oh, Mr. Muldoon. I think I'd just like to note that this is a separate entity, although they might have a similar uh, strategy. The higher balance sheet and one that does not necessarily represent Balbo Island, I would argue, does not submit it, uh, I would submit, does not argue, uh, does not represent the best interest of Balbo Island at all. Um, so I will be against this one. Okay. Any other discussion on this one? All right. Any public comment on this one? Any calls? No? All right. Do we have a motion? I, uh, you know, I thought you were going to make a I'll second it. Go ahead. Oh, all right. I'll make a motion, uh, to support the, for, uh, are we on 13? No, we're on 12, so I if you want to support on, staff, me, that's me. okay. I was on 11 still. I authorized city manager to allocate 20,000, was it 40,000? 20,000, just 20,000 for COVID-19 economic relief to support the Balboa Island Merchants Association. Okay, so staff recommendation. Yes. And I'll second the motion. Okay. All right, uh, let's uh, go ahead and vote. With Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Avery, Council Members Muldoon and Duffield voting no, the motion fails 3-4. I move to deny staff recommendation. Seconded by Mr. Muldoon, let's vote. With council members Dixon, Brenner, and Herdman voting no, the motion carries 4-3. All right, we move into item number 21. Um, any discussion at all on this one? All right, any public comments on this one? Uh, hello, my name is Craig Batley. And uh, from my understanding, this is to extend the moratorium for how many years? So this is item number 21, and we're dealing now with confirming the uh, uh, Corona Del Mar bid. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Any calls? No. Oh, all right. I'm going to vote no for all of the reasons that I've said previously, but do we have a motion to approve? Just real quick, the sea clerk needs to confirm if there was a protest vote. Oh. Um, there were no protests received. Okay. I make the motion to approve. Staff recommendation. All right. Seconded by Ms. Dixon. I'll second. All right. Let's vote. Twenty-one. Yes. With Mayor O'Neill and Council Members Muldoon and Duffield voting no, the motion carries four-three. All right, let's go to item number 22. Any discussion? Any public comment? No protests were received. Okay. Uh, oh, we do have a public comment. Here we go. 
Good evening. I'm still here. I'm Huayan. Yep. So um, the bid started planning the summer restaurant week in April. By the way, I have PowerPoint. Wake up, Huayan. So they started planning the restaurant week in April, and they were already planning on the money that you might give them tonight. A month ago, they finally reopened, but the, it just has been complicated, right? Recently, uh, Speak Up Newport hosted a panel, Jim and Mario talked about their experiences, and it was just heavy. On the other hand, many people are just not willing to come out to restaurants to eat yet. So the publicity for this restaurant week must be very creative, otherwise it will be a waste of money. Two years ago, I went to the beach with some serve on request signs. They loved the idea and they thought this policy would help the restaurants with good publicity. And I was asked, what is Sierra Club Angeles chapter about? Well, the office is in LA. We work with other organizations on environmental issues. They were so excited. They said, this is a big ocean economy and the NGOs could help them to bring people from outside the county to here to enjoy the restaurant week and also spend a night at the local hotels. So I have not stopped asking you to come up with a serve on request policy. In May, I send in my suggested tax, which is pretty simple for this, um, the municipal code for this policy that was adjusted to the new normal. Here again, tonight, we're facing the same set of issues, except that the restaurant week is um, being planned maybe in July, that's what says on the list. And I still hope that council could come up with this serve on request policy urgently. This is pro-business, it's um, cost effective for the city's trash work. It's ocean friendly. And I'm all, I always think that council is not shy to lead, lead in Orange County. And so if I'm wrong, please tell me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? Or we'll bring it back. Um, yeah, same comments. So would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to Approve the staff recommendation on resolution number 2020-65. I'll take it. Uh, okay, let's uh, go ahead and vote. With Mayor O'Neill voting no, the motion carries 6-1. Okay. Um, Ah, uh, shoot. Okay, I have to make a motion. We literally missed it by 30 seconds. I have to make a motion to uh, approve, uh, considering our last item, by waiving A1 so we can uh, consider it after 11 p.m. Do I have a second on that? Second. All right, second by Mr. Muldoon. Any discussion? Any public comments on that? Okay, let's vote real quick. Wait, are we... We're voting to allow to consider the, the last item by waiving A1 because oh. it's technically 11 o'clock and 30 seconds. Oh. I thought I had it. The motion carries unanimously. Seven All right, thanks. Zero. All right, last item, item number 23. Um, I don't think we need a staff report on this. Uh, let me just say real quick. Mayor, I have to recuse myself. Uh, okay. The centrist. <clears throat> yeah, non conforming sign, eh? All right, so <laughs> um, I'm sure we won't have a lot of public comment on this given the lateness, but I'm, I'd be kind of curious just to go into public comment. Does anyone think we should be doing anything other than um, removing the, uh, the abatement and basically following what the Planning Commission just did, always recommending? May I ask a question? Yeah. I, th I think, don't we have to extend the period or else we have to go through a general plan amendment change? 
Yeah, so I was going to have um, Mr. Harp describe that process, but it's actually, we would have to go through Coastal Commission either direction, and there's no, there's no change in the amount of time it will take us to do either of them. I know that's funny, but if we want to go 10 years, still have to introduce and go through Coastal. If we want to do a general plan amendment, still have to introduce and go through Coastal. But it has to go, that goes to a vote, though, when we No. Have, no? I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'll All defer right. to Mr. Harp on that. Yes, because it's specifically referenced in Title 21. Uh, no matter what you do this evening, whether you decide to eliminate it or extend it for 10 years, you're still going to have to go through Coastal. But you would not have to go to a vote of the people under the uh, general plan provisions. Under, Either way, it doesn't under make the any charter. difference. Well, what well, makes a difference as far as what, what you ultimately want to do as far as a regulation, if you want to have them baited in 10 years or, or whatever period of time you decide, or if you want to just eliminate the provision, um, you know, that's a fairly significant difference to the community. But as far as process, it's going to take the same amount of time. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion on that before we go out to public? Well, I, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Yes, I, I personally, I, I like what Commissioner Wagon, uh, Wagon did, and I would like to um, initiate an amendment to allow the elimination of the deadline. So essentially, this will never be um, heard again for those non-conforming signs. I think adds so much character to our community. So I'll make that motion and see if there's support on it. That may, maybe change the discussion we hear from the... I'll second. All right, Mr. Avery. Uh, I'm in just full support of Corker Liquor and Nagisa. <laughs> Epic signs. Could I? Can I make yeah, Miss. Uh, uh, well, could I make an amendment? Could we do something? I think there's something significant to the architectural character of the community. Can we call? Can we put these non-conforming but legal signs in a category called heritage signs, so that they're just recognized as heritage, so that we don't have to go through this again? Is it, didn't we do that for the crab cooker? So, so ultimately, you're going to be. Adopting what, you're, what the motion is to basically move forward with the resolution, and um, so that'll go down to the planning commission, and then they'll come back to the city council, and I think they'll figure out a way to make sure that this uh, that those signs aren't eliminated. Okay. Ms. Brenner, do we really want to make a decision eliminating all these years of work at eleven oh five to just? eliminate it should do you think maybe we should just consider giving it five years or something and then considering it again because I know staff has put a lot of work into this and and a lot of people have brought their signs up to code so it seems like for us to just drop it entirely is not exactly fair so it's, it's not dropped entirely if we if we Take the abatement uh, time out. It doesn't. There, it only applies to the signs that already exist. Any signs going forward still have to meet the code requirements. Um, if you want to revise your sign, you have to maintain it basically the, in the same shape it's already in because you can't take it down and then put up a new sign and and you know and try to backfill into this. And so it's it, this is an issue that came up to council. When did it come to council last? It was. We were, October. We were, yeah, October. We, we've, yeah we, we had talked about this and pretty much all agreed, eh, like keep moving forward. And, and then it got sent back to Planning Commission. Planning Commission's recommendation is the one that Mr. Muldoon just made a motion on. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think it's the lateness. I think, this, I think we'd be reaching the exact same conclusion no matter what meeting it came to at this point. Because, I mean, this, this is a good staff report. It's, a, it's been vetted out twice now. Through the planning, through the council, through the planning commission, it's um, it's okay. uh, yeah, and and yeah, and I'm just saying, I it's not like we're just going to it's it's not like the standards that staff created a decade ago are gone now. So it the, and we saw how many what did it, over well over a hundred of those signs have either been brought up to code or eliminated completely. So it, the process is playing itself out, and it'll continue to at some point. Buildings come down, but the signs go away. I mean. Seems like the frog house will never go away, but that's. that's well, and, and yeah. the ordinance will remain, the sign ordinance will remain in effect. That's and right. So organically, it will continue to. Right. What, so what would happen if there were a sign that were um, rusted or during this time? I mean, is there still a, a way for, because 
I mean, I love the corker, and I don't want that to go away either, but there might be some that really are <laughs> need to disappear. Um, I mean, that can always be that can always be handled, I guess, directly. But the but it, I mean, a, a good example is probably a crab cooker, right? So the crab cooker sign had to come down because they needed to take it down for the for their building repairs. But that's the kind of sign you'd like to see come back up, right? right? And so that's that's a one off decision that can be made. So if if a sign has to come back down and you don't particularly want it to go back up, it doesn't go back up without a special dispensation, right? So, yeah. Um, any other discussion on this? All right, uh, we'll go out to public comment on this one. My name is Craig Batley, and I'm, I'm in favor of the Planning Commission recommendation to uh, eliminate the abatement altogether. Uh, to kick it down the road would be, I think, a mistake. It's, the same discussion is going to occur um, five years from now, ten years from now, as, as we're having right now. So I think the uh, accretion of signs over the period of time, a lot of these will, will go away, and I think the Planning Commission made an excellent uh, recommendation just to eliminate the abatement altogether. I'm in favor of the motion. Uh, this is Jim Mosier. I also support the Planning Commission recommendation. If you're going to seriously debate this, because there was a large volume of correspondence that you received, I would suggest you continue the item to, uh, to your next meeting. As to Councilwoman Brenner's point, I did myself this this afternoon wonder where the 2005 code came from. I went back and looked at the minutes from that year. Uh, the code which I recommend repealing was at that time claimed to be the culmination of two years of unprecedented public outreach coordinated by our two chambers of commerce and our uh, business improvement districts. It went through several planning commission meetings, several council meetings. But the thing that struck me about those minutes, despite the claim of all the outreach, there was no public comment whatsoever at the planning commission meetings. There were two public comments at the three council meetings. And those two public comments did not come from owners of signs. So the people who were being affected by this in 2005, 2005 I don't think we're well informed yeah, of this supposedly thoroughly outreached decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Any calls? We have a call. All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah, this is just J.C. Clow, the, the uh, owner of the winery restaurant, 3131 West Coast Highway. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. And I am in favor of the Planning Commission's uh, unanimous approval to uh, eliminate the abatement period. And there was a significant amount of time that was spent, along with public comments, at the hearing last month. And I know for myself, uh, spending uh, an upwards of $20,000 on our signage and coming off having 200 employees on furlough, that in these pressing times, that uh, this is just a huge inconvenience for business owners when we're struggling to stay afloat and to bring individuals back to work. This is an unnecessary cost that's imposed on the businesses. And I think Jim Campbell of the Planning Commission did an outstanding job presenting the information the motion in front of the planning commission was either to initiate a five-year abatement or a 10-year 
And at this meeting, it was actually a unanimous, a unanimous vote to eliminate the abatement altogether. And I would urge the council to please take the recommendation of the Planning Commission and their unanimous vote. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Any other calls? All right, we'll bring it back. So we have a motion on the table with a second. Any discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. All right, let's vote again. The motion carries 6-0 with Council Member Duffield recusing himself. All right, Madam Clerk. Motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council Members who voted with the prevailing side. Council, any votes? Any motions? All right, seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.